The Ideal Aesthete, Oakland Daily Evening Tribune, 28th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ideal Aesthete, Arrival of Oscar Wilde at the Terminal Depot, How He Crossed the Bay, His Receptions Along the Line, His Appearance, and How He Travelled Across the Country, Observations and Incidents, his lecture and reception this evening at the cavalry armoury. Under the regular head, the record of the overland train for Sunday morning would naturally be arrived, Oscar Wilde, and ninety-one emigrants. Somehow or other, quite a crowd gathered at the Oakland Pier, in which were noticed several county officers and a sprinkling of the legal fraternity san francisco sent over delegations prominent among which were two distinguished representatives of the young men's hebrew association the whole numbering about sixty aesthetic souls anxious to catch a first glimpse of the apostle of beauty as the train rolled in and the engine in its fury shivered the guard timbers at the end of the track the crowd broke into two solid lines and in a few minutes Oscar appeared, walking patiently under the mosquito-like buzz of a San Francisco reporter, and closely followed by several others who had gone to San Pablo as a self-constituted committee of reception. Oscar is a heavy man with very light extremities, and can hardly be considered evenly balanced. His style of dress was not unfamiliar to the average Oaklander, as it has been seen once before. He wore the Buffalo Bill hat with wide brim, but of a soft sand shade instead of black. His coat was a short velvet cutaway, with vest of the same material, and a pair of tight pants cut regardless of the latest styles. He had a little delicate flower in his buttonhole, wore a pair of brown dogskin gloves, and twirled a light frivolous cane. His long hair of soft-hued colour rolling raggedly down his back, his face was boyish, and looked as if it had never felt a razor. His accent, for an Irishman, was, to say the least, a well-copied cockneyism, and his style pleasantly nonchalant and imposing. His reception must have been very flattering to his vanity, as he was closely followed into the waiting-room, and intensely gazed upon by scores of interested spectators. As the crowd pressed upon him en route for the boat, one enthusiastic maiden, not over prepossessing, moved near and pressed her chin upon the soft velvet of his coat, after which she looked up with a perfectly self-satisfied smile. On the boat he was posed at the front and centre of the utter deck, where he could take in the beauty and grandeur of the approach to the city of the Sandhills. His intense attention was directed to Goat Island, and he was told that the classical and botanical name was Yerba Buena. He was charmed with the sweet Spanish accent of his reportorial informant, and asked if there was any legend connected with the island. His curiosity was immediately gratified by having his attention called to the lightkeeper's house, where the informant located the old Biawawa story, with the addition of losing the emigrant's child over the bluff, and the erection of a lonely cross over the nameless grave, and Oscar thought it was truly touching. As the steamer neared the wharf, the distinguished guest was wafted down the stairs, and allowed to stand, with his attendants, where the mail truck usually reposes, at the bow of the boat, in front of the checking rope, where he calmly reposed upon his cane, with his easy fourteens crossed over his dun-brown unmentionables, and easily and pleasantly took the city. 
it was a calm and serene scene san francisco resting in sunday repose unconscious of the approach of the wonder of the age and that great and good person just crushing the metropolis of the pacific with his sad soft gaze it was a picture for a painter but the tin-foil artist was out at shell mound with the san francisco cadets the charm was broken however when a large irish woman with a strong sandlot accent shouted that's the way the aristocracy is favoured in this country here is a long-haired foreigner who pays no taxes and is a barnacle himself permitted to ride in the favoured place on the boat and we honest people who pay full fare are huddled here like sheep in a pen with a rope around us a laugh followed but oscar stood calm and unmoved and when the boat touched the apron he was hurried into a carriage ahead of the oi polloi and driven to the palace an occupant of the same sleeping car informed the tribune representative concerning his trip from ogden to oakland the first eventful circumstance was a brilliant ovation at corinne utah where he was received by forty improvised aesthetes with sunflower accompaniment and a ding-dong brass band at the humboldt wells elko winnemucca and reno crowds swarmed at the depots and he was hailed with cheers after passing the region of sagebrush where anything goes for an excitement the interest in the curiosity waned at truckee and colfax but a few persons gathered and at sacramento there was no reception at all except by the record union man who came down on the train with the aesthete keen observers on the train kept an eye on the brilliant youth and by means of an acquaintance with the valet de chambre it was discovered that he uses five hairbrushes of different styles and patterns from the steel scraper to the ordinary hog bristle and four combs of metal and bone his suspenders are of light yellow woven in flower and vine and his soaps and perfumes are brilliant in variety his valet is a gentleman of african descent and was in constant attendance upon him while making his toilette mr wilde shaves himself regularly every morning on the train his career was marked with a quiet though somewhat forced simplicity he was averse to conversation and devoted his attention principally to the members of the comely barton troop who were on the train he has made a decided impression on the coast and his lecture in san francisco last evening was well attended by a fashionable audience Today he comes to Oakland, and will lecture at the armory of the Oakland Light Cavalry, corner of Twelfth and Washington Streets, and will receive at the hands of the refined and cultivated as polite and gratifying a reception as he received last evening. It has been suggested by the members of the Light Cavalry, having charge of the arrangements, that to prevent a blockade at the door those wishing to avail themselves of the opportunity of attending the lectures this evening and on thursday should procure tickets beforehand and go early for good seats mr wilde will hold an informal reception after each lecture in the company's parlour giving oaklanders the opportunity of personal interviews both lectures should be patronised for they depend on each other for practicality and utility in application members of the company and messrs kelsey and flint will supply tickets on demand and from the many applications already made for them indicate that there will be a large attendance end of section Oscar Wilde in Chinatown, The Daily Examiner, San Francisco, 30th of March, 1882.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde in Chinatown Last night, after the close of his lecture, Oscar Wilde, accompanied by Charles E. Locke, Mr. Vale, his business manager, Thomas Keogh, and an examiner reporter, and guided by special officers James Hamilton and Edward McLaughlin, made a thorough inspection of the Chinese quarter of the city, Mr. Wilde having expressed a wish to see all the finer secrets of Chinatown, no matter at what cost to his olfactory and optical nerves. The two experienced guides fulfilled his desire to the utmost extent of their ability. Joss houses, Chinese hospitals in Elik Alley, theatres, lodging houses, underground burrows, murderers' alley, the haunts of the high binders, the holes of the rag pickers, opium dens, gambling houses, places of the most questionable character, restaurants, slaughter houses, offal depositories, merchants' residences, pawnbroker's stores, junk stores, fish and hog markets, and all the thousand and one queer haunts of the celestial people were thoroughly explored. This is just like a chapter from the Arabian Nights, said Mr. Wilde on leaving the principal Joss house, and I feel exactly like Harun al-Rashid on an anonymous tour in the streets of Baghdad. What a picture for Burne Jones, or Val Priusa, he exclaimed, when a lamp was procured and light shed upon about a dozen heathens stowed away in a cellar. Mr. Wilde was particularly pleased with the barbaric decorations of a large restaurant on Jackson Street, and stopped there to feast his appetite on tea and preserves. It was nearly half-past one o'clock when the party separated, and Mr. Wilde thanked his guides for their attention. End of section. Oscar Wilde, San Jose Daily Herald, 4th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, A Conversation with a Herald Representative. The Lecture. The high priest of the Eastheats lectured last night to an audience which filled the dress circle of the California theatre. All the most fashionable and cultured people of San Jose were there, and the attention they paid to every word of the lecture showed how deeply they were interested in the lecturer and his subject. Mr. Wilde was dressed in the usual velvet coat, knee breeches and silk stockings, ruffled shirt front and lace ruffs. He is a tall, well-proportioned man, with a very boyish face, smooth as a woman's, and made to look more effeminate by the hair, which is long and hangs down round the face. His eyes are beautiful, shaded with long lashes and full of expression, which varies as the subject changes, though their ordinary expression is that of gentle kindness. The face in repose is rather dull, but the moment he opens his mouth to converse, the whole face lights up and is positively beautiful. His voice is mellifluous, and his lecture was a beautiful word-painting in the most perfect English. In a conversation with a representative of the Herald, Mr. Wilde said that when he first thought of coming to America, he did not know that the people were so full of deep-seated prejudice as he found them, he said that he had expected a certain amount of ridicule to be thrown on his school and himself, thinking that would be the natural result of their having read the ridiculous things which had been published on the other side of the water. But he did not think that when he had an opportunity of delivering his lectures and explaining the object he and his school had in view, that an appreciative and practical people like the Americans would have understood him. But the great mass of them did not seem to, although there were many of the most cultured people here who fully appreciate the benefit which would accrue from raising the standard of men's morals 
by teaching them to love the beautiful and good and discard the evil and ugly in speaking of the country itself he said he had never seen anything so grand and beautiful as the scenery on this coast and in fact all over america nature had been most lavish in her gifts but art had done nothing art was dead speaking of poetry he said that there were really no great poets in america that the only one who approached to greatness was joaquin miller and that he was not appreciated by his fellow countrymen that longfellow was more a beautiful poem himself than a poet that he was not original but more a copy after english poets that oliver wendell holmes did not deserve the name of poet that the man who puts his tongue in his cheek meaning those who descend to writing funny poetry do not deserve the name of poets he considered walt whitman as the finest poet america has ever produced and he is surprised to see how little he is thought of among literary people in the united states he thought that if edgar allan poe lived he would have been the greatest of all the american poets for what little he had done was much finer than any one else has done since in this country he says that no country can produce poets or artists of any kind until it discards the work of other countries and turns to its own mountains and rivers for inspiration and build up a school of its own peculiar to itself that all american art should treat of american subjects and copy from nature as seen in america he said there never would be any art in the united states until the decorative art is better understood and people were surrounded by more beautiful things speaking of his dress which he said many had stigmatized as effeminate he said that people forgot when they said that the fact that the men who won the independence of this country won it in just such cloaks as he wore that he thought it would be very inconsistent of him to preach art and beauty dressed in an ugly costume that he wears the clothes to be consistent and that he believes ere long that it will be adopted by every one only a bare synopsis of the lecture can be given hardly enough indeed to give a fair idea of the subject end of section rare oscar wilde the stockton daily evening mail fourth of april eighteen eighty two this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rare Oscar Wilde The Arrival of the Naughty Irish Poet What he thinks of California and its people His compliment to American elocution and Joaquin Miller Oscar Wilde has gazed upon the Stockton Courthouse He rested his lily-white cheek upon his strong hand The hand that penned Charmides and hefted five thousand dollars in twenty-dollar gold pieces for his six lectures on this coast this statement is however a little bit of poetic license he has not hefted it yet except in his mind's eye it is now under lock and key but this is an aesthetic digression the poet's eye swiftly took in the noble proportions of the massive pile before him the poet groaned i have stood in the mighty Colosseum," he said my soul has drank in the harmony of st peter's dome i have leaned against the pyramids i have stumbled over the marble ruins of ancient greece and i have angled for catfish in the hellespont but this sight has been reserved for me until this day henceforth let no man say see naples and die i have smelled naples and still live but oh 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 here the poet broke down he was aroused by a tap on the shoulder and a rich sweet voice suggestive of the groves of blarney rang cheerily upon his ear tigan to gaelic enola poth emon egenato replied the poet quickly Hanaman Dool, vous parlez très bien comme un Irlandais, shouted his interrogator in joyful accents. 
Didn't I tell you, boys, he was Irish to the core? Yes, and orange Irish at that, replied a distrustful man. What does he pack that yellow sunflower round with him for? Sure, it's emblematic of the sunburst. He's a Fenian. Yes, and his father an Irish lord. Hooray for wild Oscar! Hup, hup! The poet modestly received these expressions of popularity with a pleased smile. Turning his eyes towards the courthouse, he repeated the following impromptu verses. My soul is filled with subtle joy when viewing thee, thou ancient mine of memories sweet without alloy, of those who toiled in forty-nine. And when their day of life is past, upon their tombs inscribe this line, they died, their noblest deed the last since drifting here in forty-nine. Then a window of the old building opened and spake, Jay-Z Gamble, Jay-Z Gamble, Jay-Z Gamble, come into court. Waving his hand gracefully to the crowd, the poet walked sorrowfully back to his conservatory in the Yosemite Hotel. A small crowd assembled at the railroad depot to catch a peep at the Apostle of Aestheticism, and when the good-looking six-footer stepped into John Finnan's hack, a murmur of admiration was heard from some of the ladies who had gathered for a glimpse of the author of naughty but nice, artistically speaking, Charmides. He wore a profusion of long brown hair, as fine as any woman's. Indeed, his countenance exhibits more of the female than of the male type, and this likewise is heightened by a pair of large blue eyes and full red lips. He wore a heavy cloak, a greyish-brown velvet coat, and a white soft felt hat. He cast a look of disgust at the big black heating stove in the office, and surveyed the plain hat-rack in the hall with a withering look. He was escorted by J. S. Vale, his manager, and a coloured servant. His lunch, which was served in his room, was more of a substantial than aesthetic character, and consisted of fried potatoes, cold roast beef, a bottle of English ale, and bread and butter and coffee. A male representative was accorded an interview this afternoon with the poet. He was seated before a small marble-topped table in room 21, with a cup of coffee before him, the plates and potatoes, skins and all, having mysteriously disappeared, being out of keeping with the aesthetic nature of the surroundings. When asked for his impressions of California, he said, "'It is by far the most beautiful part of America I have seen yet. Eastern America is so colourless at this time, nothing but great brown plains and leafless woodlands. And when I arrived in California, and saw the green fields for the first time since I left England, it seemed to be one of the most beautiful things I ever saw in my life. Such purple mountains, and such a wealth of wild flowers. It delighted me far beyond anything I ever thought I should see in America. Referring to the lack of decoration on the houses of America, he said, I have been disappointed that your wooden houses show no carving at all on them, because wood carving is one of the simplest of the decorative arts, and is so very easy to teach. Every shepherd's house in Switzerland is covered with beautiful carvings done by the lads of the family. What a Swiss boy can do well, an American boy ought to do better. Wood carving should be taught in the schools here. It is not only a beautiful but a useful art. I have been told that you Western people have not the time to devote to art, that you are engrossed in the pursuit of wealth. I think that is a sad thing. A country that definitely devotes itself solely to the accumulation of wealth has a terrible fate in store for it. Mr. Wilde said further, in speaking of the climate and scenery of California, that it reminded him very much of Italy in spring, with its orange trees in blossom, and its vines in full leaf. The best American poet you have, he said, comes from California. Who is that? Dan O'Connell? inquired the reporter. I am surprised, responded the poet, that you can be ignorant of the one I mean. 
i regard joaquin miller as the successor to the laurels of longfellow some short time ago when longfellow died there were articles in all the american newspapers discussing as to which of the american poets would be most likely to take his place they mentioned every writer of poetry in america that ever scribbled a volume of poems but the real man the california man they never mentioned at all joaquin miller possesses the true warmth of imagination and that refinement which constitute the poet the san francisco newspapers had been very appreciative and courteous toward him he said this lecturing tour was his first essay in public life since he graduated with the highest honours of his class in oxford two and a half years ago the first time he ever addressed a public audience was in new york on the fourteenth of january last i am very sorry he added that it was my first experience because public speaking is an art and i who lay such stress on the technical side of art i know that i am offending myself that i am dealing in the art of eloquence without ever having been taught to speak in england we are never taught how to speak in public the eloquence of american speakers has been a matter of constant wonder to me at the bohemian club in san francisco last saturday night general barnes a well-known lawyer proposed my health in a speech which for beauty of sentiment and for wealth of metaphor i have never heard excelled in england a literary man in england writes what he wishes to say and prints it but it is an uncommon thing for him to lecture when i go back to england i shall certainly write about the necessity of teaching our young men the art of elocution mr wilde regretted that he would be unable to visit yosemite and the big trees as his lecture engagements made his stay in this state a brief one to-morrow evening he will lecture on the irish poets in san francisco after which he will leave for salt lake city and denver to fill his engagements there End of section. Wild on Poetry, the Stockton Daily Evening Mail, 5th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wild on Poetry, some sensible advice for Stockton Spring Poets. In reply to a question as to what he considered the coming style of poetry, Oscar Wilde in an interview yesterday said, The imagination, upon which poetry depends, is something so untrammeled that you can never attempt to limit it to any school at all. I should be very sorry if you wanted to clip the imagination, like the wings of an eagle, and confine it within a cage all over the world in ordinary magazines and provincial newspapers a constant amount of poetry is published of which the sentiments are irreproachable and the writers of which express the proper admiration for the right things against these sentiments and against the sincerity of the people who write them nothing can be said as much sincerity is wasted in filling the poet's corner in some small provincial paper as ought to inspire a play of shakespeare or a poem of dante and this amount of poetry is utterly worthless that is very sad indeed when we consider the deep feelings under which it is produced the reason is this the young men and young women who contribute such poetry forget that poetry is an art the highest and the most difficult of all the arts dependent no doubt on nobility of imagination and on a nature sensitive to beauty but dependent also on its technical side its rhythm its music its melody and all the technical part of the art of poetry which is quite as necessary as the theory of harmony is to the musician 
or a scheme of colour to the painter. Most provincial poets never learn their art. They trust entirely to their own feelings. Whereas, if any one wishes to write poetry, he or she should study the great masters of style to begin with, just as we set students of painting to study a great picture, or student sculptors some masterpiece of the artist's chisel. In this modern school of poetry of ours, we should first study style and the music of words. We should absorb all the work of the great masters that have gone before us, and we should not forget the technical side of art. The charm of poetry comes principally to us through its wonderful music. Every word in the English language has a certain definite musical value, quite as definite as a note on the piano or a chord on the strings of a violin. It is approaching poetry on its artistic side where it is really an art. That is what we insist on in England, so that, at any rate, the poetry that is now published in England has all the qualities of beautiful style about it. End of section Oscar Wilde at Home The Daily Examiner, San Francisco, 9th of April, 1882 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde at Home How the Apostle of the Beautiful Looks and Acts in His Room Interviewed by a Lady Reporter The Young Aesthete's Conversation His Poetry and His Views The New Book Dedicated to Himself The English language is popularly supposed to be a vehicle of expression that was perfected long ago, it is intended not to conceal but to express thought, and only persons who labour after originality, like Robert Browning, for instance, give themselves the trouble to twist its words into new meanings. Yet, strange to say, there are two words in the English language which of late are employed as frequently as any other two that could be named, if we make due exception of charming and awful, and they are aesthetic and utter, about the signification of which there seem to be no general agreement. Yet all concede that they apply to an unknown quantity in artistic niceness, and at once the more complex form of intensified aestheticism in the shape of utter presents itself. The most agreeable and perhaps the most effective solution of the much-used word outside of dictionarial definition would be to get the meaning from the fountainhead, that is, from the apostoletic source of aestheticism, Oscar Wilde himself. I saw the lion in his lair, saw him stirred up, poetically speaking, and an interesting process it was. It took place at the Palace Hotel, where the young poet resided during his stay here. Without further preliminaries, I will endeavour to picture Oscar Wilde's at-home manner, and how he exists in so unaesthetic a caravansary as the Palace Hotel. Fortunately, there was plenty of time to get a good look at the room and peer about, without transgressing any social rules, for, when I arrived, as per appointment, there was no one but his servant at home, and the opportunity was afforded to get an uninterrupted few moments, and jot down whatever there was remarkable. Between the fear of not seeing everything, and of his sudden arrival, I could only get cursory glimpses of all the peculiarities the room offered, and had little time to think of what I was to ask him when he did make his appearance. At any rate, all the questions that I had in my mind in reference to Mr. Wilde flew from me when he entered a few moments after I did. His Lazy Manner 
and my hard effort to explain in a depressed sort of way occasioned by my feeling of strangeness soon made matters rather one-sided he talked and talked well and soon i regained my ordinary frame of mind but with still a misgiving as to how to broach my subject but his action in throwing off his circular cloak the quick and well-rehearsed movement of the servant who reached the centre of the room just at the right moment to catch the outside wraps of the poet and his subsequent position on the sofa partaking rather of an easy posture half reclining half sitting set me quite at ease and the poet whom i had expected to lead me in the empyrean ways of poetic fancy for which i was half prepared made me believe so utterly in the mere commonplace that i felt a sense of disappointment for it is so awful to believe in a man's superiority and then find him out the rooms were of the usual hotel order with the walls as innocent of cheerfulness as the sunless light which filtered in from the window it suggested a question and i haphazarded it how do you manage to live in these rooms without any surrounding signs of the beautiful quoth he with an accompaniment of a rather comfortable shudder don't mention it since the request of not mentioning it was so vigorously put to me i dropped the question of the beautiful in art or whatever else was in my mind pertaining to the subject and naturally did what ninety-nine people out of every hundred when a lack of material for conversation occurred would do i spoke of myself is not this something new for you mr wilde you have never met a lady reporter no replied he smilingly i have not we do not have them in our country i looked toward the bay window wherein was placed a table and on it a vase with a large bouquet of white flowers beautifully arranged and to give it effect a silk handkerchief had been thrown carelessly across the two lower branches and the air coming from the window swayed the ends in graceful movements glancing from the top of the table to the floor the pile of newspapers met my gaze and naturally suggested the next question are you pleased at the newspaper reports of yourself and the reporters interviews evidently this had struck a rich vein for he looked up with a peculiar and hearty smile but evidently remembering that his questioner was of the same genus as the subject spoken about he seemed to restrain himself but replied with a laugh frankly then i read them all and not only here but all over america i have been quite amused at the struggle each of the gentlemen have had to write what i did not say but i have the most sympathy with the writers of the articles which strive to be what is called here in the united states funny their hard work has been so apparent from this on the conversation was quite easy and mr wilde displayed a fund of shrewd common sense hardly to be expected from an art enthusiast and a poet the conversation on his part which followed gave me full opportunity to memorise the disposition of every article in the room and that a certain eccentric individuality of the man was displayed in every phase of the furniture could not be gainsaid there were three tables in the room the one mentioned in the embrasure of the bay window one inside the room and one about the centre and all in a row the sofa on which the poet was reclining was on the left hand and the mantel on the right on the table where the striking posy of white flowers was placed were also strewn in confusion scraps of paper letters books etc and at the foot the newspapers which fortunately suggested the opening of a conversation which by this time was flowing along smoothly enough 
on the table in the centre of the room were also a lot of papers and cards from various business houses evidently intended to convey to the much advertised aesthete the pleasure every merchant would have in showing him his wares to be used in the future as an advertisement no doubt on the table near the window and about four feet from the other was a large silver fruit dish filled with oranges two plates and a knife and placed there innocently enough as a living example of an effective and suggestive picture of still life on the sofa was carelessly thrown a dark brown rug with a pillow over which was thrown a crepe shawl of the same colour with long fringe to match during our conversation several cards were handed in and among other things the servant brought in an autographic album with someone's compliments and a request for mr wilde's little contribution to the general collection he arose seated himself at the table with the open book before him and in a posture which excellently expressed thought he tried to evolve something for the inevitable autograph hunter and great american nuisance the inspirational mood was not on him then he arose gracefully spread his arm over an almost impossible distance and with an admirable breadth of reach got hold of a copy of his own poems sat down again and said to me one sometimes forgets one's own lines the struggle was short and had to be given up so he bade the servant tell the messenger to leave the album as i am too much engaged just now this with a glance at me a few moments after another autograph album was sent in and the message repeated without the glance however he then wheeled the sofa in front of me and threw himself upon it not of course lying down but in a careless posture with his arm thrown carelessly over the pillow i got a good glance at his necktie and i noticed that the handkerchief in his coat pocket and the scarf were of exactly the same tint of satin a peculiar shade of olive bronze his inspiration among the other questions and they were a legion i asked him at what hour of the day do you find it most convenient to write at no particular hour in writing a verse i sometimes wait for the exact mood and it takes weeks at times before i get the right word to express my thought in the completion of a sentence or a line sometimes a subject is presented to me when i least expect it perhaps in the company of friends perhaps travelling or in a crowded street in an animated conversation and especially about himself mr wilde in a youthful sort of way becomes quite enthusiastic from the conversation which followed i gathered that he was born at number one marion square dublin and that his mother of whom he seems very proud inspired him with a desire to become a poet he showed me her picture and from her portrait she seems to be a handsome woman of about forty-seven with a clear sunny expression of face and not at all like a woman who is given to writing poetry mr wilde does not resemble his mother a particle although there seems to be a deep bond of sympathy between them he assured me that until the age of eighteen he never thought of writing a line and in proof that others have the same enthusiasm and entertain the same views of poetry art and literature as himself he pointed out the fact that a young classmate of his has written a volume on the same subject and dedicated it to mr wilde himself mr wilde is now having it published and it will be out shortly he showed me a bit of manuscript which he declared he appreciated and valued above anything which had ever been given him it was the original manuscript of an ode to blue written by keats in a handwriting peculiarly dainty and small 
the manuscript, old and yellow, was presented to Mr. Wilde on his recent visit to Louisville. While there, he received a note from a young lady asking him to call, signed simply Miss Keats. It was from this lady, to whom the poet was a relative, that the young disciple received his treasured ode. That Mr. Wilde is not sure of his ground, nor has he a fixed idea, is best illustrated by his reply to a question relative to his new book. He said, My other book may be a perfect contradiction of the first. And, on being asked about his return to England, he said, I don't know. I never make plans, but go whither my feelings prompt. I wish, however, to be back in time for the salons. Mr. Wilde regrets exceedingly that he entered into a contract with Sarony, the New York photographer, not to have anyone else take his pictures while in this country. He admires the pictures produced by some of our local photographers, and, in an art sense, apparently believes in the superiority of San Francisco workmanship to that of New York. He had some fine specimens from the principal photographers of the city. On being asked as to the age expressed in the last words of his poem, which interests all women, I have made my choice, have lived my poems, and though youth is gone in wasted days, I have found the lover's crown of myrtle better than the poet's crown of bays. He replied, Sometimes one feels older at twenty than he will at forty. During his conversation about his poems, he certainly evidenced a belief in them, and gave way to his enthusiasm by frequent gestures. His voice, in ordinary conversation, does not partake of the same tone as that used on the rostrum, nor are the same unpleasant monotones employed with all their faulty intonations. Youthful fervour carries with it a sense of truth, and if the word utter, as expressed by this aesthete, means ardour, coupled with a sense of art and what is beautiful in the world, it is a good word, and ought to be a welcome one in our vocabulary, which, after all, is not replete with adjectives expressive of things that are beautiful, as a lady reporter can testify. Mary Watson End of section The Apostle Again From the Reno Evening Gazette 10th of April, 1882 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Apostle again. Mr. Wilde goes east on Easter. He is a lover of Joaquin Miller. A Gazette reporter rode a ways on the train yesterday morning, and, a good opportunity offering, applied the screws to Oscar Wilde, who was a passenger, and found that he was highly pleased with his visit to the coast. He said the people were charming, but they were in danger of deifying money instead of allowing the love of beauty and the enjoyment of art to share their affections. He says that California audiences are delightful ones, both to talk to and to look at. His greatest complaint, however, is that people here do not appreciate Joaquin Miller, whom he ranks as America's greatest poet and as the coming playwright. His poem on Walker is the finest of his works. Mr. Wilde thinks the man's private life has nothing whatever to do with our estimate of his work. If it is strong, good, and beautiful, as he claims it is, the poet should be honoured and enriched. The estimation in which great men are held is the standard by which he judges a community, and in that respect the coast is behind the east, and the east far behind the old country. Speaking of the press of America, Mr. Wilde said it was full of rubbish. He saw the New York papers, and it seemed that if people read them, and were satisfied with them, that this must be a nation of lunatics. But he found that an enormous gap lay between the papers and the people, 
who were bright, intellectual, and imaginative. He was even more favourably impressed with the papers of the Pacific Coast. He says, The East is ugly, but California is very pretty, and Nevada by no means uninteresting. He begged of the Gazette man to refrain from painting the rocks with advertisements, which he held to be a high crime against the beauty of any country. End of section. Oscar Wilde, Salt Lake Daily Herald, 12th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, A Pleasant Chat with the Aesthete, His Impression of America and Her People and Poets, The Courtesy of His Audiences, His Peculiar Dress, The Coming Thing in the Fashionable World. Our reporter called upon Mr. Oscar Wilde on Monday, and was received by the distinguished aesthete with characteristic courtesy, Mr. Wilde speaking of his American experiences with the utmost candour. No part of America, it appears, has struck Mr. Wilde so favourably as California, but, as he said, I have still to see Colorado. Whatever may be the effect of Denver and Leadville, it is at present certain that San Francisco and the West Coast have captivated the poet, for Mr. Wilde intends to return there next year with a party of friends, in the capacity, as he described it, of a private gentleman travelling for his own amusement, and not as a public lecturer condemned to go on the platform at every place he stops. Of the results of his tour, financially, the Apostle of Art Decoration spoke very contentedly, and proposes devoting a portion of the proceeds to a lengthened visit to Venice, and a leisurely study of Italy. But it was when he came to speak of his reception by the American public that Mr. Wilde was most interesting. "'I am,' he said, "'more and more astonished and pleased,' every time I lecture, at the courtesy with which I am received by my audiences. Everybody, they say, laughs at me, and says I am a fraud. Yet not only do they fill any place I choose to lecture in, but they sit out all I have to say with surprising good humour and patience. I am quite conscious that much of what I say may be annoying." But, after all, I came to America to say it, and so long as audiences with such forbearance and good breeding allow me to strut my brief hour upon the stage, I should be singularly stupid not to take advantage of the opportunities given me of trotting out my hobbies. I have no doubt that to-night there will be many people present— perhaps even most of them, who, after they have seen me and satisfied their curiosity as to my costume and my long hair, would be glad to go away again without sitting through a lecture on a subject that does not interest them. But at the same time, I have no doubt whatever that they will, out of pure courtesy, sit it out to the bitter end." Sometimes I am inclined to laugh at this kindness, knowing that my audiences often laugh at me, but I really consider my opportunity so splendid a one for saying what I wish to say, that I only wish my delivery and my language were better than they are. Yes, you are right, my delivery has often been criticised very severely, and I confess it is abominable. But I cannot help it. I have never studied elocution. But I shall when I return to England, probably under Vizine. As for my costume, I have several reasons for it, but the more important are these, that the present evening dress of gentlemen is the most objectionable possible, 
and then i should be glad to do something towards introducing a better as it is the prince of wales and some of his friends have already pronounced in favour of the velvet coat ruffles knee breeches and silk hose and it is quite possible that in another year or so all young england may be dressed as i am indeed in new york one very charming lady has ordered knee breeches as de rigueur at her receptions and new york has cheerfully submitted to her delightful tyranny but another reason for my wearing this costume is based on a principle for live poets have principles and that is one should do as one preaches now morris the author of that exquisite earthly paradise is prophetically proclaiming the doctrine of artistic dress as a preliminary to a revival of true art but he goes about himself in the very shabbiest and ugliest of nineteenth-century clothes i do not agree with this so that when you call upon me as you do now you find me dressed in aesthetic colours my coat is a pearl-grey velvet my necktie venetian green and you see that i spread a fur robe over this hideous sofa before i sit down on it to-night for the same reason if you come to the theatre you will find me in black velvet lined with purple and wearing the ruffles and seals of the regency mr wilde then went on to speak of the american poets expressing that special preference for joaquin miller and walter whitman which he has so often tried to vindicate in opposition to other opinions for longfellow he did not entertain so much reverence for the poet as love for the man longfellow he said was himself a beautiful poem more beautiful than anything he ever wrote emerson's prose he considered poetry the poetry of certain others he considered prose but as he said we rhymesters are without number the real poet has not come once in a century mr wilde then quoted favourite sketches from aldrich holmes lowell and others showing an intimate acquaintance with american literature that justified his undertaking to criticise it of our novelists he places howells and james easily first indeed he said they are your only two much more that mr wilde said might be of interest to our readers but our space compels us to be brief to run up he appears to be thoroughly satisfied with the financial results of his tour and more than satisfied with the good taste and courtesy of the audiences that have listened to him and among the personal friends he has made in america there are many who have exacted the promise that he will return to the country next year and so i will said mr wilde when i have got more to say and learnt a better style of saying it end of section art decoration the salt lake daily tribune eleventh of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain art decoration oscar wilde enlightens a large audience on the subject at noon yesterday there was a large crowd of curious people on the steps of the walker house waiting to see oscar wilde presently a hack drove up to the door with a tall man swathed in a cloak followed by a small man and a coloured servant he crossed the walk in a couple of steps and disappeared by way of the ladies entrance the enterprising hotel keeper was ready for his guest and the boy who showed the poet to his room had a sunflower in his buttonhole the boy looked quite ill at ease and embarrassed the barkeeper hoisted a sunflower behind the bar and at the dinner table a few ladies put lilies in their hair the poet however took his mails in his room 
a tribune reporter found him in late in the evening and he gave an interesting description of his trip over america and his impressions of the country his opinions were given quite freely and will appear in tomorrow's issue end of section oscar wilde the cheyenne daily leader thirteenth of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde he passes through cheyenne once again oscar wilde of whom we have all heard so much passed through cheyenne yesterday for denver where he is booked for a lecture our reporter had considerable difficulty in rounding him up but finally found him in the car we shall not undertake to give the interview as it took place verbatim but only the substance thereof mr wilde looks and appears like any other respectable gentleman who travels through the country either on business or for amusement he puts on no style and would scarcely be noticed among the ordinary run of travellers that pass back and forth over the u p he said he saw no reason why the papers should assail him as they had done for he had not in his life that he knew of undertaken to say anything unjust or uncomplimentary to anybody else and he hoped that the time would come when people would be considerate toward him and not take it for granted that he was a crank or an idiot he had his views and ideas and had never sought to intrude them upon others except in a reasonable way and then only as any other person seeking to make an honest living would have done his reception and treatment on the pacific coast he said was cordial and friendly and all that he could expect he was going to denver to lecture but was undetermined where he should go next when asked as to his opinion in regard to poetry he said that he believed the only true poetry ever written was based on some actual incident or occurrence and cited as an example robert burns farewell the bonny banks of air written by him just before he expected to leave his own country and sail for the west indies probably never to return mr wilde is a far different man from what most people who have read of him would expect to see in appearance he is just as practicable and sensible about the ordinary affairs of life as a cheyenne banker would be and as the train started to roll out on the dp for denver our reporter jumped off with the full belief that wilde has been maligned and abused by the press unjustly and without reason end of section oscar wilde rocky mountain news denver thirteenth of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde the able-bodied aesthete dawns upon denver he falls a prey to a keen news reporter and discourses glibly on many and various topics his views of art architecture dress and america art decoration discussed at the opera house an interesting lecture and a fine audience what oscar has to say for himself the aesthete has come the man whose life and talents are devoted to the study and cultivation of the beautiful and the business of making money has arrived in this prosaic city where dollars and cents rank high and where beauty is valued only for its money value last evening's train over the cheyenne division was delayed about half an hour and seated in the drawing-room car of that train was the much-talked-of oscar wilde who manifested some regret and annoyance at the unexpected delay the aesthete is not handsome and yet he is remarkably fine-looking about his person there is an air of refinement culture and grace that makes a striking contrast to the typical american man oscar wilde is tall and elegantly proportioned his head is not large and yet it is good sized his hair a dark brown is parted nearly in the middle and is worn long giving him a somewhat peculiar appearance his face is long and oval in shape he wears no beard or moustache 
his mouth is rather large and the lips are full and as bright-coloured as a girl's his teeth are large and not particularly handsome his forehead is low his eyes are extremely beautiful they are blue and very large his nose is long and thin and if breeding and blood are indicated by the nose mr wilde can lay claim to a large quantity of the genuine blue his complexion is so clear and beautiful that the maidens may well grow green with envy for no balm or powder can give to their cheeks the peculiar beauty of the aesthete's complexion his hands are well shaped his fingers long and tapering as if made to handle beautiful objects or wield the pen while the poetic mind dictates words of fire his feet are large and well proportioned to his body taken all in all mr wilde can be truly called an elegant-looking gentleman his looks would indicate that he was the descendant of a well-bred fine old english family and his conversation marks him as a man of sense strength and sympathy during repose his face might be called plain but when conversing his eyes grow bright the colour rises to his cheeks his gestures are free and easy and he is the picture of animation on the train last evening he wore a pair of dark brown trousers well cut and neat fitting and a black velvet coat rather after the fashion of a sack it was cut high in the neck leaving visible only the necktie which was a cream-coloured silk scarf tied in a large bow his collar was of fine white linen and was not noticeably large he wore a long heavy overcoat of gendarme blue cloth lined throughout with fur a broad fur collar and deep cuffs finishing the outside of the handsome garment around his neck a gold-coloured embroidered scarf hung untied the ends were fringed upon leaving the car the scarf was carelessly drawn close about the neck under the overcoat upon his head mr wilde wore a large black or deep blue slouch hat upon the third finger of his right hand he wore a large handsomely carved intaglio ring which was his only ornament after shaking hands with the news representative mr wilde at once entered into conversation with an ease that is not ordinary even among public speakers his voice is pleasant to listen to and gives one the impression of much power yet he always talks in a monotone which must grow tedious he talks rapidly uses beautiful language and pronounces his words in a way which americans will be very apt to call affected his gestures during conversation are graceful and yet very emphatic sinking back into the seat and assuming a comfortable position mr wilde said yes i am very sorry about this delay i fear i shall be obliged to keep the audience waiting upon being asked how he was impressed with the country through which he had recently passed he said oh everything looks so brown bare and disconsolate you know i have just come back from california which is a garden of beauty oh it is so lovely the cities of the atlantic coast look bare and dreary at this time of the year you know at home in england it is always green we have only the little island and it is well tilled every inch of it it is always beautiful for five months i have been longing for that garden spot and california was such a delight to me the green was such a rest to my weary eyes it is the most restful of all colours the california people are delightful i disliked to leave san francisco and i should love to visit it again 
mr wilde then asked a question which is only natural considering what the ride from denver to cheyenne is he inquired what is there beautiful in colorado being desirous of obtaining the aesthetes views of the cities he had visited the reporter said mr wilde if it is not impertinent to ask which city of those you have visited have you found the most aesthetic mr wilde smiling a little sarcastically replied you cannot ask an impertinent question of me but really i cannot specify any one city new york being so near europe has many of the characteristics of a foreign city boston and philadelphia both are paying considerable attention to art but what especially pleased and interested me were the cities further removed from the atlantic coast cincinnati has an art school and a good one a school of wood carving chicago people are very enthusiastic over art i had large audiences in that city i talked to about three thousand three hundred people who listened with the closest attention to all i had to say st louis too is full of people who are interested in art and san francisco here mr wilde was interrupted but it is safe to infer all he had to say was in hearty praise of the aesthetic movement among the dwellers in the city of the golden gate you would bring art into the humblest houses would you not you would have art among the multitude is that your doctrine queried the reporter it is art but not poor amateur art here mr wilde shook his head in a disgusted manner and said we had better have no art than bad art we can live without art but we cannot live with bad art let our architects build good substantial houses and let them be beautiful if they can let our chairs and tables be made first for use and second for beauty aestheticism should begin with the handicraftsman and when it does we will have more beautiful homes than we have at present what about aestheticism in dress women's dress at present is too sombre more bright colours should be worn in england these ideas are being adopted rapidly the milliner is being done away with and the draper is taking her place what is prettier than drapery stately folds for the matron and becoming curves for the maiden the milliner does away with graceful folds and gives us awkward bows instead speaking of places of amusement he said there should only be two things consulted in building a theatre first the audience then the actor the trouble with too many theatres is we have blue skies red seats green hangings a great display of gilding and then what is the actor to do his costumes fall flat instead of this the house the scenery and the stage should be only a setting let the woods used be dark and rich looking let the hangings be of oriental materials for they are the best example of correct tone in colouring i was delighted with the chinese quarters in san francisco their theatre was plain and the stage was devoid of ornamentation those chinese quarters fascinated me i wish those people had a quarter in london i should take pleasure in visiting it often common things should be made beautiful when i was in san francisco at the hotel i was obliged to drink my chocolate or coffee out of a cup an inch thick 
and i enjoyed going down into the chinese quarter and sitting in a pretty latticed balcony and drinking my tea out of a cup so dainty and delicate that a lady would handle it with care yet this was not an expensive place for wealthy people to go to it was for the common people the labourers on the railroad came here with pick and shovel and drank their refreshing beverage out of a pretty cup of the two beautiful colours blue and white while i was thought unworthy of anything better than a cup so thick that it suggested the idea that it was intended as a weapon to be hurled at the heads of those seated at the next table beautiful things for everyday use are what we want the child is not taught by books and lessons alone we know how we used to throw our books aside and rush out into the air and sunshine the child must be taught by constant association with beautiful things beauty should be as free as the air and water and then it cannot fail to leave its impress on all minds talking of beauty in men's dress mr wilde said we dress without the slightest regard to beauty or even comfort when a man is going to walk or row or perform feats which require a display of strength and muscle the trousers are done away with and knee breeches are worn then again black broadcloth is chosen for dress suits and no material can be more devoid of beauty than broadcloth velvet should be chosen instead for it is a material which is always becoming mr wilde believes that there will be a complete revolution in gentlemen's wearing apparel within the next few years but for the sake of those gentlemen who are not of stately build it is to be hoped that knee breeches will not become fashionable mr wilde speaking of the press said when i read the papers and see what they say about me it gives me a peculiar sensation i feel as if i was travelling about in a country of barbarians the aesthete spoke enthusiastically of the cordial way in which he had been received being asked how long he would remain in america he shrugged his shoulders and said if i survive i shall remain until june so it is evident that mr wilde has not fallen desperately in love with america of american women he said in this country i see any quantity of beautiful young girls girls whose faces are charming with the flush of youth whose eyes are radiant and whose forms are full of beauty but there are few handsome matrons in this country speaking of his first appearance in this country mr wilde said with the exception of speaking at an occasional wine supper at oxford i had never spoken in public until i lectured in new york i then found out what a difficult task i had undertaken americans are natural orators i never heard a spontaneous burst of oratory until i came to america and listened to an american End of section. Art and Aesthetics, Denver Tribune, 13th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Art and Aesthetics. Arrival of Oscar Wilde. A Tribune reporter escorts him to the Opera House. His lecture on decorative art. Description of his appearance. An agreeable disappointment. Interesting interview with the poet. The train which brought Oscar Wilde over the Denver Pacific Railroad last night was thirty minutes late, on account of delayed connection at Cheyenne, and for this reason alone he was exactly thirty minutes behind the usual time for raising the curtain at Tabor Grand Opera House. 
he arrived in the midst of a spell of weather that is not specially palatable to aesthetic taste and for that reason only there was not an overflowing audience but the parquet and dress circle were filled the train arrived just five minutes ahead of the time announced by telegraph and baffled the designs of a large crowd of unaesthetics whose curiosity caused them to gather about the platforms or take refuge from the snowstorm in the sitting rooms of the union depot even the enterprising advance agent mr locke was thrown off his guard by the premature movement of the train and was two minutes late while mr j s vale the manager of the athletic-looking aesthetic was out prowling around in unknown places for the agent a reporter for the tribune had taken precaution against the uncertainties of telegraphic reports or railroad time and having waited beside the track for half an hour boarded the train the instant it landed while the passengers of the palace car were hurrying to and fro with their baggage in the usual unaccountable haste of the railroad passenger to be first out of the narrow door the reporter was elbowing his way through eagerly scanning the face of every man for a recognition of oscar wilde at the rear end of the little smoking-room the distinguished poet was found all alone standing and waiting for somebody to receive him the reporter feeling that this duty devolved upon him in behalf of the city introduced himself to mr wilde welcomed him to denver and relieved his uneasiness by the information that his carriage was waiting at the front of the depot mr wilde was dressed for the evening's entertainment but covered with a pair of loose trousers and a large heavy overcoat with a broad fur collar a muffler was wrapped about his neck and he wore a broad-brimmed felt hat he was conspicuous for his splendid physique his long hair and singular cast of features which in repose would be that half of man and half of woman in every movement of the man it was easy to detect a something which gave an effeminate shade to his masculinity bearing a striking resemblance to the scribner portrait of george eliot but behind and beyond all that was unusual or eccentric to a man of observation the strength of manhood and the character of genius when the reporter introduced himself mr wilde received him cordially and began to say a great many pleasant things which he ended by declaring that his trip had been very tiresome just then mr vale and mr locke entered the car and conducted the poet to the carriage which was waiting for the party a large crowd had gathered on the platform and there were many young men who have not the slightest conception of the poetry that lives in the sunflower or the beauties that grow in the lily followed in the footsteps and almost trod upon the heels of the aesthetic apostle in still greater numbers they blockaded his way and surrounded his carriage till the pressure of the crowd became disagreeable and even an annoyance some of them said such things as hello oscar let us see you oscar old boy put your head out the window oscar for we know you're in there and this they continued till the carriage drove away one fellow was so anxious to see the famous poet that he pressed his nose against the glass window till he got the full benefit of a peep into the carriage i suppose this scene is familiar to you mr wilde remarked the tribune reporter as the horses were turned and started off in a brisk toward the opera house yes it is so everywhere answered the poet artist with a happy smile which at once revealed a happy philosophic disposition and a handsomely formed and well kept but somewhat irregular set of teeth in such a smile there is less of the spiritual in the eye and a gentility of expression which makes the nose and the mouth a part of the index to a brain 
that is as practical as it is sentimental yes such scenes are familiar said mr wilde this is simply curiosity you know it is the evidence of an unfinished civilization. but do you not find such curiosity universal oh yes curiosity i find a universal characteristic but in europe the people are less curious about public characters and they are not rude mr wilde was evidently pained by the familiarity of the young men who called oscar did you have many such experiences on your california trip oh my ejaculated the young man as he threw up his hands with a half languishing smile in daytime at almost every station they crowded the platforms besieged the car windows and would become actually angry if i did not make an appearance but said mr wilde this was only a manifestation of idle curiosity he mentioned a few exceptions among those he met en route one was that of an old gentleman who wrote him one of the most beautiful letters he had ever read and then met him on the train there were some evidences among the men he met of deserved culture among the people of the west but he had not had the time to cultivate them the carriage stopped at the stage entrance of the opera house at ten minutes after eight o'clock his audience had already gathered he was ushered into the private dressing-room where a special preparations had been made for his reception while making his toilette he ordered a small bottle of piper hydesick which he touched quite temperately leaving fully one half till after the lecture at the opera house despite the unfavourable conditions of weather the opera house in the lower departments and tiers were well filled long before eight o'clock carriages commenced to arrive having for occupants the culture and fashion of the city until fifteen minutes past eight there was an unbroken line of the closed vehicles discharging their burdens at the entrance a noticeable feature of the audience was the painful absences of anything that suggested the accepted ornamentation of aestheticism in the costumes of the ladies and gentlemen in truth everybody was attired in ultra-conventional plainness only one solitary sunflower was noticed in the parquet it was on the back of a lady's hat in the lower portion of the house a few weird paper sunflowers found circulation and afforded amusement until the curtain arose it was not until half past eight o'clock that the audience was made acquainted with the arrival of the lecturing poet and aesthete then the curtain went up without the accompaniment of music or sound save the few murmurs of satisfaction which escaped the lips of those who had grown weary in waiting revealing a charming drawing-room scene tastefully set with articles of adornment of the heavy order of colours on the centre table was a single lily and beneath on a shelf nestled a huge basket of flowers ample time to admire the setting was afforded the aesthete not appearing for several minutes after the curtain had ascended an hundred lorgnettes were levelled upon him when he walked through the arched entrance to the scene and a merry decorous laughter went up from the parquet it was short-lived however the sudden monotone opening of the lecturer bringing it to an end throughout the entire lecture the most respectful silence the most deferential quiet was maintained and deservingly so for although neither eloquent nor startling in any particular the lecture was instructive and intensely interesting mr wilde was attired in a black velvet court suit long cutaway coat and knee breeches on his shirt front was a large pearl he wore a rich lace tie and from each coat sleeve peeped a lace band 
when most radical in his argumentation he gracefully played with the watch fob which dangled from his right vest pocket at the end of a silk cord it was also when most prosily discoursing that he would stop in the middle of a sentence to patronise the water-glass he had hardly gotten well under way in his introductory remarks before he took from a pocket a handkerchief illustrative of the subject upon which he spoke decorative art he probably did not intend the aesthetic wipe as an illustration that decorative art is ennobling even when applied to pocket wear that is destined to pass at intervals through the democratic wash-tub it was a very handsome article however and its artistic application to the parched lips of the poet served to excite the murmured admiration of the ladies as seen through the glass the handkerchief was lace embroidered heavily in colours the aesthetic green predominating when he touched his lips it was with the delicacy that a lady puts the finishing touch upon a face cosmetic wilde's hands are rather plebeian they are very large on a finger of the right hand he wears a large plain set stone ring decorative art the lecture was particularly applied to the american people and was based on the argument that art is the result of soul inspiration and art design is only the fruit of imagination mr wilde thinks the american people have the ability and the natural recourses for study to make their nation one conservatory of art there is no reason why art cannot be applied in a decorative way he spoke about the absurdities of decoration and illustratively cited an instance where he had seen a young lady decorating two plates with a moonlight and sunset scene respectively it was not quite the consistent thing to eat your canvas back duck off of moonlight or your terrapin off of sunset such decoration should be done not in perspective design but with figures consistent with the uses of the articles he referred to the use of plain cast iron in america for railings and house ornamentation told how they were broken into bits by boys and always look cheap and shabby and then strikingly compared the old iron ornaments of verona that were worked by hand out of the noble metal into beautiful figures and had remained intact in their loveliness for hundreds of years he described how the little swiss boy who spends his days in the mountains attending to his herds and after returning home at night weary learning to carve wooden figures under a father's tuition it was a national study there the consequence was that the swiss cottages were always attractive to the weary traveller who stopped to rest on the porch the houses were finished with simple figures of art and if this study was introduced in america he thought the american could do twice as well as the swiss youth some one in the vicinity of the writer was unkind enough to whisper taffy he said the absence of decorative art in american house building was tragic mr wilde dwelt with considerable emphasis and not a little poetical criticism upon the coarseness of gold jewellery in this relation he referred with upturned eyes to the threads of gold which might be woven into the beautiful as tangled sunbeams he also attributed the lack of art in the manufacture of jewellery to fashion or folly which he thought meant much the same thing he advised the american fashion idea to stand over the maker and direct him in his work in describing the object of art he said that it was to be democratic not to be rough roughness did not give strength harshness did not give power but it was to produce an effect that would please the masses at the same time as a deliverer of speech the aesthetic is fluent but monotonous in his enunciation 
he speaks with signal stations of commas and semicolons and is everlastingly reaching after a period on a pole he played upon the words noble and rational and the expression i need not tell you until they seemed set in stereotype but withal there is something oddly fascinating about the manner of his lecture delivery it may be its uniqueness the lecture was interspersed with logical truths poetical sayings and the most entertaining of comparative arguments mr wilde paid a glowing tribute to american scenery and the resources here for art study his lecture which occupied more than an hour was rounded off by a poetical flight when he turned to depart from the stage all retained their seats and were rewarded in seeing the mild aesthetic walk which distorted gave bunthorne his character supper and an interview at the close of his lecture mr wilde accompanied by the tribune reporter walked into his dressing-room remarking as he came off the stage well this is somewhat jolly to travel in the close atmosphere of those coaches six hundred miles on a stretch and then give a lecture before resting i suppose it must be very tiresome oh no not the lecture but the miserable travel and mr wilde emptied the remaining half bottle of piper heidsick into a goblet after refreshing himself he talked away to the reporter about art and poetry art schools in europe and the lack of them in america and said many pleasant things as chirrupy as though he had just awakened from a refreshing sleep upon a bed of posies then the carriage was ready and mr wilde and his attendants were whirled off to the windsor hotel where all things were prepared for his quiet reception taking the elevator to the second floor he was escorted straightway to his room succeeding in escaping the crowd which had awaited all evening to see him only three gentlemen and three ladies who were promenading the hall caught a glance of the stalwart aesthete as he passed on to his room there everything was prepared for his comfort and convenience first of all was his supper which was spread upon a small table it was not by any means an extravagant bill of fare there was a plate of fish a dish of potatoes an omelette a pair of mutton chops relishes bread butter and a cup of tea throwing off his overcoat mr wilde sat down at once to the table take away this tea and bring me a bottle of this wine said he pointing to the wine list with two glasses he added the servant quickly returned with a bottle of grave bordeaux mr wilde took one bite of the broiled fish and then ordered the plate removed just as he cut the first morsel from a mutton chop after a glass of wine and tasted the bread and butter very sparingly there commenced a series of raps on the door mr wilde abandoned his meal for the time though he was almost famished and gave himself to the duty of entertaining governor tabor was among his visitors and in the course of his interview among other things arranged to treat the poet to a visit to the matchless mine at leadville after his lecture to-night mr wilde expressed himself delighted for he said of all things that which he desired most was to see a mine when his visitors had ceased calling mr wilde resumed his meal and the tribune interviewer again unfolded his notebook his new poems when will your new book of poems appear asked the reporter not until after i return to europe i hardly think it practicable to write it here there are so many things which i had intended which are impracticable you know 
mr wilde then related that in leaving europe he left his preface to the work with a friend he said he could not write in america his subjects would form a new departure and he could not find either the time or the surroundings in america suitable to his themes besides there were so many new experiences crowding upon him in his travels that he could only take notes when i return to venice said he i will begin to write and whatever i have seen to impress me in america whether of the beauties of nature or of men and women i will write and give america credit for it as to his drama which has been prepared for two years past he had little to say except that it would soon be produced upon the stage how were you impressed by your trip to california how can i tell you i could talk to you all night about it california is an italy without its art there are subjects for the artist but it is universally true that the only scenery which inspires utterance is that which man feels himself the master of the mountains of california are so gigantic that they are not favourable to art or poetry the scenery for definite utterance is that which man is lord of there are good poets in england but none in switzerland there the mountains are too high art cannot add to nature there is no imitative art mr wilde continued to illustrate by showing that the only landscape schools of art in the world were situated in countries where the scenery was less attractive and vice versa where the beauties and grandeurs of nature existed the schools were devoted to faces and figures what class of people do you think are the most susceptible to the impressions that inspire poetry and art that depends upon the nationality all classes of the celtic race are the most susceptible to these finer touches of nature with these people it matters little about their station in life they are naturally sympathetic and their impressions are manifest in art and poetry here mr wilde finished one mutton chop and the omelette pushed the dishes aside and took another glass of wine the mormons the conversation was just beginning to assume a delightful form and mr wilde though weary had become enthused with his favourite theme and his words were pouring forth in a fluent stream of poetic beauties when he was abruptly arrested by a question as to the mormons of salt lake and his impression of them oh i could tell you a great many things i was entertained by the president mr taylor i found him a courteous kindly and charming gentleman the house had a good deal of feeling in it in the way of pleasing works of art and good furniture but the tabernacle has the shape of a soup kettle and the decorations are suitable to a jail it was the most purely dreadful building i ever saw there was not even the honesty to tell the truth because they painted sham pillars there are no pillars in the building in the house of god i think no lies should be told the city interested me because it was the first city that ever gave a chance to ugly women and so with feelings of philanthropy he looked with kindly eye upon it it is a city of execrable architecture and yet i felt that it also robbed life of a great deal of its romance for the romance of life is that one can love so many people and only marry one the people as a body of humanity have the most ignoble forms i ever saw and the women are commonplace in every sense of the word 
Mr. Wilde was asked what he thought of the American people in comparison with the Europeans. He answered, I come with only one idea about this country, and that was that it was free from prejudice. To us in Europe, America is looked upon as a nation simple and grand, and I thought that the moment they heard what I had to say, they would understand me and realise what I meant by life and art. I find that I was wrong. Mr. Wilde spoke further of the prejudices of those who criticised, from ignorant views of the position he maintained, but he always felt that in every audience there were some intelligent listeners. He had found audiences in the West which listened with more simplicity, more real interest and desire to know what he had to say, than in many audiences of the eastern cities, showing that the West has kept itself free and independent, while the East has caught and spoiled itself with many of the flirting follies of Europe. Mr. Wilde, at the conclusion of the interview, referred to the many foolish and unjust things which have been said of him by the newspapers, and then turned himself to a great pile of letters, which he glanced over, and many of them he threw away, saying, "'If only I should read all of these, I would not rest much to-night.' and if you were to read all the letters you receive, you would become pretty well acquainted with the people in America? Well, and Mr. Wilde significantly shrugged his shoulders for a reply, when the reporter extended his hand and bade the gifted young gentleman an affectionate adieu. End of section Oscar Deer, Leadville Daily Herald, 14th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Deer. Wilde wrestles wildly with the art decorative in this mountain wilderness. He falls an unwilling victim to light air upon his arrival here. The wonderful aesthetic demonstration postponed on account of the weather. The much-talked-of disciple of aesthetics comes and goes without any fuss. A whole house full of curiosity-seekers at the table last evening. Last evening's South Park train brought Oscar Wilde to Leadville, and as soon as his arrival at the Clarendon became known, the lobby filled up with a crowd of men anxious to have a look at the famous Eastheat whose name has been heralded all over the country. All were doomed to disappointment, however, for Oscar left his carriage and was shown to his apartments by the lady's entrance to the hotel. Immediately he sent for a physician, for his breath was short, you know, and his weariness increased with every exertion to breathe. When the man of medicine heard the complaints, he at once decided it was a case of light air, and prescribed accordingly. A herald representative then sent in his card, and was soon ushered into the presence of the redoubtable Oscar. As the quill driver entered, Mr. Wilde arose from the bed on which he had thrown himself in utter exhaustion. After extending a cordial reception to the scribe, he excused himself and again sought repose on the couch. While giving him a chance to catch his breath, the visitor took an inventory of the man who is setting the American people wild, and what was seen in a glance or two was an individual some six feet tall, with long hair reaching to the shoulders, a languid, far-away look in the eyes, and a mouth that vied with saldines for size. His attire was that of any ordinary travelling man, and was by no means peculiar. He stated that he was extremely tired and had passed a most wearisome day. After a week in Kansas, he goes to Canada, New England, and New York, where he will lecture for the second time, 
and returned to the old world about the first of june his style of speaking is such that not to see the speaker but simply hear the languishing words uttered one might suppose that they emanated from some la di da whose whole being depended upon seeing how much of his portion he could squander frivolously this is not characteristic of the man however for he says he is ambitious and really when he is fired by his love of art he does exercise some symptoms of genuine manhood this is his first visit to america and he remarks very evenly of the culture of some parts and the lack of civilization in other sections mr wilde is an irishman by birth but bears more the imprint of his foster country england than of his native emerald isle he still cherishes kindly feelings for the latter it would seem for he said in coming up to-day i went out on the engine and found an irishman was the engine driver and we had a good old talk i saw blue birds and oh they were so beautiful almost as beautiful as kingfishers in speaking of his love for the beautiful he remarked i long to go back to sunny italy there to lie in my gondola smoke cigarettes and write poems when the subject of art was mentioned mr wilde became almost rapturous and said he loved to tell the people of the beautiful things in life and nature i love to travel and meet the best of men and look at the best and most beautiful of women so that when i die i will leave behind me a name that will be handed down to posterity as a lover of the beautiful he recommended more beautiful art in america and sighed for the lack of it his reception mr wilde must have appreciated most peculiarly the lack of art as he calls it in the leadville people for instead of receiving a grand ovation at the depot or hotel his agent quietly escorted him to a carriage and he was driven like any other arrival to the clarendon this exercise of common sense may be what mr wilde calls a lack of art the few who were curious had to remain so for they didn't catch a glimpse of the stranger as he did not pass through the hotel end of section oscar's oddities the pueblo daily chieftain fifteenth of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar's oddities as noticed by the aesthetic reporter of the chieftain a man of sense a brilliant conversationalist but not of tasteful attire the noon train from leadville yesterday carried through our city the far-famed aesthetic apostle mr oscar wilde who was returning from a lecturing visit to the great carbonet camp and en route to colorado springs where he entertained the curious of that city with a delivery of one of his intellectual dissertations last evening mr wilde alighted from the train and was met by the chieftain Eastheat, who accompanied him to a room in the depot hotel he expressed himself as being somewhat wearied by the tedium of travel and was burdened with a hopeful feeling that a slight ablutionary indulgence would remove to a telling degree the provoking lassitude and restore his temperament to its usual equipoise after the wash act was neatly and tastily performed mr wilde freed himself of a deep sigh of relief and the reporter knew that tranquillity reigned supreme within his bosom during the time occupied by mr wilde in refreshing himself the reporter noted the many peculiar and unique characteristics of the aesthete's dress and style which have made him renowned in the two hemispheres he is tall and were it not for a preponderance of native grace 
would incline to a slight awkwardness. He is extremely youthful in appearance, and his large intellectual face is as smooth and fair as a woman's. His hair does not know the touch of cold steel, and is profuse and reaches below his collar. He wore a large black felt hat, brown velveteen coat, fastened before with embroidered clasps and silken cords, light pantaloons, gaiters of patent leather and light-coloured cloth tops. Thrown over his entire body, from his shoulders to his feet, he wore a black and richly trimmed mantle that greatly added to his singular and attractive appearance. After noting his personal perfections and defections, the Faberonian fiend then applied the interviewing pump and drew forth the following flow. Yes, I have been to Leadville and was favourably impressed with that wonderful city. Just think of it, that great large city was built up within the lapse of time necessarily required for the erection of one house in England. I lectured to a splendid audience last night, who listened to me with rapt attention, and I have none but pleasant recollections of Leadville and its people. At the conclusion of my labour I visited the matchless mine, as I had promised Mr. Tabor I would while in Denver recently, and passed several hours underground, being most deeply interested by the intricate and skilful work found there. I am extremely sorry that a limitation of time compels me to hurry through the mountains and canyons of Colorado, as I would, I know, be much profited both in beholding their grandeur and noting the comparisons with mountains abroad. From the few and hurried glimpses I have had of your rugged peaks and deep canyons, however, I am free to say that they are so sublimely grand that the brush of the artist cannot do them justice. With these few kindly and well-delivered remarks, Mr. Wilde was spared by the reporter while a repast in the dining-room was partaken of. The young foreigner was the cynosure of all eyes while he ate his dinner, to which was added a bottle of Piper Heidsick. After dinner Mr. Wilde returned to his seat in the coach and re-engaged in a pleasant conversation with the reporter. He seemed slightly perturbed by the staring of the crowd that had by this time gathered about the car, and mildly requested the porter to draw the curtains at the windows. Two ladies, more bold than the rest, entered the coach and begged the favour of an autograph from Mr. Wilde, who graciously and most happily complied. About this time, a behooded woman with her arms full of books and her face full of seductive smiles elbowed her way through the aisle and, sidling up to Mr. Wilde, exclaimed, "'Why, don't you know me? I am the lady whom the state press says should be the one to take the nonsense out of you. I am Mrs. Churchill, editress of the Antelope.' Mr. Wilde lost none of his complacency, but quietly replied, "'You have, then, a prodigious task before you, madam, indeed, one that would take you until the end of the century to accomplish.' The train beginning to move caused the reporter to withdraw, after bidding Mr. Wilde a hearty good-bye. Mr. Wilde impressed the reporter as having more than the usual culture, and his conversation, carried on in a low monotone, showed that he is the possessor of a rich, musical voice, not at all effeminate, as might be supposed from his face. The massive head and graceful contour of his features are partially hidden by his long hair, which, to a certain degree, conceals his forehead. His hands, from their appearance, receive much attention at the toilet, but are large, though as white as any lady's. There is nothing aesthetic or beautiful about his autograph. Indeed, as a chirographist, he is not a success. His name, in large scrawl, resembles a rail fence after an encounter with an enraged bull, more than anything else within the imagination of the reporter. Altogether, Mr. Wilde is a pleasing gentleman to meet, and always commands respect from those with whom he converses. 
he is accompanied by mr locke his business manager who is without a doubt reaping a harvest from the lectures given by his latest novelty mr wilde will not lecture in pueblo as has been reported on the streets end of section quite two two the kansas city evening star seventeenth of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain quite two two arrival of the apostle of the utterly but an evening star aesthete meets him at the depot and listens to his sentimental nonsense the long-haired divinity as he looked and acted his vague ideas about kansas city and his endorsement of the sun a very transparent humbug the alleged apostle of the beautiful just escaped the charge of stealing into the city like a thief in the night as he arrived on the u p train at the hour of five thirty this morning an evening star reporter was at the union depot earlier than that and not being certain as to what road he would honour with his precious person conductor smith of the santa fe was accosted as soon as the train had pulled in and the all-important question put have you got oscar wilde on board no at least if i have i don't know it and it's a good thing for him too why because if i had him and knew it i would have drowned the d blank fool in the core river before he got here this was not comforting as the reporter had left his bed at an unearthly hour for the express purpose of seeing the apollo who he supposed everyone worshipped as a god and he hurried off down the track to meet the union pacific train and boarded it at hickory street propounded the question of the hour to the coloured porter of the sleeping coach the coloured man was in a different frame of mind from conductor smith and replied with a static that opened up his yellow face like one of oscar's pet sunflowers yes sir we's got him he's down there in middle berth see dat man wid de long hair and de big cloak and de piles a little sacks and bags dat's him sir the evening star envoy passed down the car and found the famous celtic poet contentedly reading a copy of a morning paper his much talked of legs calmly reaching across the cushion of the opposite seat beside him stood his secretary a dapper little man with the snap and brusqueness of a professional show manager and a coloured servant wilde was dressed in the civilised costume of the nineteenth century with the exception of the large cloak which is made and worn in imitation of tennyson he had on a black slouch hat a coat and vest of dark cloth light trousers of scotch goods and a pair of shoes with extremely pointed toes a la the regulation english snob the tennysonian cloak was thrown over one shoulder and under the opposite arm and a large silk scarf of the shade of old gold was folded about his neck completely hiding the aesthetic collar which probably occupied its proper place on his person upon introducing himself the reporter was pleasantly met with the extremely aesthetic remark ah indeed drawled out with the soft insinuating cadence upon which the distinguished scion of the house of fitzgerald has made his reputation have a seat it is a beautiful morning is it not how lovely the sun looks as it rises in its grandeur through the azure blue of your lovely sky as he delivered this sample of the aesthetically poetical language upon which he is travelling the languid effeminate too utterly too smile which the crazed damsels of new york and boston went crazy over made its appearance 
and gradually spread over his classic features until it rested in the lower corners of his triangular mouth at this juncture the secretary who by the way is much more of the all firedly practical than he is of the utterly too style remarked have you a copy of the evening star with you the reporter replied that he hadn't but one could be procured at the office or from the newsboys price two cents it was plain that the secretary as well as his master had a decided weakness for the newspapers as a pile of them covered the seat adjoining and all had evidently been carefully perused and clipped for scrapbook purposes when the secretary had subsided wilde who seemed impressed with the necessity of giving the reporter another sample of aestheticism and poetry mixed in equal parts after his own formula opened up with a description of colorado and california most of which is already familiar to the public through the medium of a myriad of reporters who have listened to the same thing under the same circumstances and have filled columns of valuable space with the repetition he then began to question the reporter as to matters local and was greatly surprised or seemed to be when told that kansas city was in missouri and not in kansas and that its population numbered eighty thousand souls exclusive of the festive chinaman whose colour makes him aesthetic whether he will or no he desired to know the origin and significance of the word kansas and was informed that it was indian in origin but its significance was beyond the knowledge of the reporter the state capital however he was given some points upon it was also an indian name and signified small potatoes this seemed to please him and he went into a dreamy reverie in which some scene in his native land where the potatoes are always large and the pigs fat notwithstanding the eviction laws was probably the central figure when the train pulled into the union depot the secretary and servant hustled out to make preparations for the transit to the coat's house and when all things were ready the poet stepped gently across the platform still descanting upon the beauties of california to the reporter and passed into his carriage which had been drawn up in the space between the depot and express offices and when the valet had arrived with a truck full of travelling bags and robes which were stowed away about the vehicle the party was driven to its destination arrived at the coats the distinguished clown passed directly to his room leaving his secretary to make all arrangements and as he closed his door a group of lady boarders and housemaids who had taken up a position in the hall were heard to whisper isn't he too utterly beautiful too awfully too end of section the only oscar the kansas city daily times eighteenth of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain the only oscar the eminent aesthete arrives in the city from colorado and lectures at the opera house he drives around in quest of the poet warder and praises the bold bard of the corps a small discussion on the merits of the renaissance why the people failed to turn out what mr wilde wore on the street and before the footlights his ability as a lecturer the lecture in brief the necessities of americans as art promoters our national weaknesses oscar wilde arrived in the city yesterday morning and was at once driven to his rooms at the coats house the journey from colorado was a tedious and wearisome one and the eminent aesthete poet and lecturer professed himself glad enough to arrive once more within the confines of a metropolis 
he passed the greater part of the day quietly at the hotel receiving a few of the callers who partly as anxious pupils and partly as a means of gratifying curiosity sent up their cards later in the afternoon he engaged the services of peanut joe and drove off on an errand of inquiry downtown he was met and accosted by a representative of the times who placed his knowledge of men and localities at the poet's disposal i am looking said mr wilde for colonel warder your poet i believe i read some verses welcoming me in your paper colonel warder writes excellent poetry the first and sixth stanzas showed deep thought this tribute to the bard of kansas city was delivered with great heartiness and demonstrated the fact that colonel warder's maiden effort in an aesthetic vein has secured the prompt approval of the master in his street attire oscar wilde appeared simply a robust affable and ingenious young man he wears clothes of the english cut speaks with a decided english accent and has not a little of the most pronounced english cordiality he spoke pleasantly of his trip across the continent and the various people with whom he had been thrown all of which interesting facts have been duly detailed in exchanges and republished in the times the renaissance explained owing doubtless to the fact that oscar wilde has fluttered in the cities immediately around kansas city for some weeks popular excitement had more or less died away there was also some question as to the comprehensibility of the lecturer's subject as the following conversation in a barber shop by two prominent citizens will explain are you going to wilde's lecture to-night what's his subject the english renaissance what's renaissance statuary neither prominent citizen was present at the discourse in and around the opera house at eight o'clock the cause of aestheticism wore a bilious look a large proportion of local aesthetes had gone over on the east side to see zazel fired out of a cannon and to dally about the cages of the peripatetic south kensington at eight fifteen the little cluster in the centre of the house began to grow impatient and five minutes later the number began to swell the audience was in no way a representative opera house assemblage it was noted chiefly for courtesy and good behaviour with a few glaring exceptions on the part of those who subsequently left the house before the completion of the lecture to the annoyance of the speaker and his listeners alike as each lady came in with some slight suggestion of the sunflower in her hat she was welcomed with a respectful rapping of canes when just before the curtain went up the poet warder walked gracefully down the aisle a murmur of pleasure and approbation was heard at eight thirty o'clock the curtain rose and after a brief interval of suspense mr wilde stepped forward to the table and without any formality plunged into his address he wore a suit of very elegant dark velvet which includes a cutaway coat cut in circular form knee breeches low shoes and black stockings at his neck was a byron collar and a flossy white neck handkerchief while from his snow-white shirt front glittered a single cluster of diamonds his hair was very straight and very long falling in dark brown mass over his shoulders and parted in the middle he began in a hesitating voice but soon became reassured by the respectful attention of his audience mr wilde has all the peculiarities of english speech the long drawl and monotone the rising inflection which is no respecter of punctuation and which is painful to the ear until it can accustom itself to the sound 
he is anything than a pleasant speaker and all his little bursts of satire or outflows of humour are completely thrown away on an american audience through reason of his monotonous delivery what mr wilde said the lecture was a repetition of that which was published in the times earlier in the season it was a forcible exposition of the decorative in art the advantages enjoyed in former centuries and in older countries in the keener appreciation of the combination of utility and beauty and the necessity of an american awakening to the development of a purer and better taste in art matters it satirised the american principle of subserving everything to business interests and demonstrated the practicability of cultivating a taste for the beautiful in rearing the structure of prosperity the pith of the lecturer's remarks is summed up as follows wherever in your field you find men driving cattle or women drawing water there you will find models of beauty gods and goddesses kings and queens were carved and painted by greeks and romans but i think that in america you do not care much for gods and goddesses and still less for kings and queens what you have dearly before you what you love most dearly and believe in the most fondly that is where your art lies all around you lie the conditions of art no country can compare with america for resources of usefulness and beauty if you build in marble you must remember that it is a precious stone a man has no right to build in marble unless he can use it nobly one should either carve it in joyous decorations or decorate it in colours or tints of real beauty or else we should inlay it in the way that the people of pisa did their palaces otherwise we had better build in red brick which is not without some beauty then there is no reason why you should not build in wood i think however you paint your houses in the most terrible colours here in america in no single house from new york to san francisco did i see a single piece of wood carving that was worth the name in switzerland the little barefoot boy will produce carving that will make his father's house wonderfully beautiful i know nothing more ugly than modern jewellery i don't see why anybody wears it i think people do not sufficiently remember that the time may come when the simple work of the handy craftsman will be all to tell our history gold has always been a rare thing in europe but for you gold is given in exhaustless measure gold is not given us i think for mere speculation don't leave your workman in gold in the background go to him and tell him what you like best in decoration and watch him as he draws it out in those magic threads of sunlight that are called gold wire in this way you will encourage your workmen i would wish to see you have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or think to be beautiful whatever art we are to have in the future must be democratic art i do not mean by this that it must be rough art must no longer be the luxury of the rich or the amusement of the idle it must enter into the everyday life of the hard-working masses of the people let it be for you to create an art by the hands of the people that will please the world there is nothing in the world around you that art cannot ennoble there is not an animal not a bird not a plant that cannot be of use to the faithful artist as there is nothing in life there is nothing in mere lifelessness that will not be of use to you at the conclusion of mr wilde's lecture he was much applauded and the sentiment of the audience 
as it dispersed, was eulogistic of the plain, practical utterances of the speaker. The poet will lecture during the week on the Kansas circuit. End of section. Ah, Oscar. The Topeka Daily Capital. 21st of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ah, Oscar. Beauty's great exponent. A short talk with the Prince of Eastites. What he says and how he says it. His lecture. His looks. His manner in general. Oscar Wilde, who lectured at the Opera House last night, arrived yesterday afternoon from Leavenworth, and was the guest, while in the city, of the Windsor. The capital reporter called on him during the afternoon at his room at the hotel, and had a pleasant conversation with him. Mr. Wilde was reclining on a sofa, drinking his tea from a blue-flowered china cup. His dinner, some strawberries and some cigars, lay on the marble tabletop before him, he arose as the reporter entered, and greeted him with a pleasant smile. Mr. Wilde has a handsome, soft, womanish face, around which his long wavy hair fell in the finest decorative art. He is a very pleasant conversationalist, has a wonderful command of words, and expresses himself in a very clear, lucid manner, much contrasted with the soulful utterances of his burlesques. He said that when he landed in New York, and read what the newspapers had to say about him, he thought that he was about to travel in an extensive lunatic asylum, composed of the whole country, but that when he went out in society there, he found the most charming cosmopolitan people he ever had the pleasure of meeting. He thought the newspapers of this country were far from representing the true public opinion of the American people on art questions. He had met as intelligent, appreciative, sympathetic people in his travels in this country as in the highest art and social centres of England. In England all society and all art is centred in one city, London, and in a very small part of that city and to him the society of a large provincial city like Manchester was simply unbearable. In this country there is no similar centre, but all over the country he found an element appreciative and intellectual. Rough was an unfortunate adjective for Americans to apply to themselves. The conflict which some shallow writers on art found between utility and beauty was a mistake. There cannot be anything useful which was not beautiful, and if ugly, it might be put down as of imperfect usefulness. He thought that the present generation was a most impractical one. By impractical, he explained to mean that they lived without making life worth living for, without any cultivation of the sense of pleasure, the beautiful, to him, the life of the businessman who ate his breakfast early in the morning, caught a train for the city, there stayed in the dingy, dusty atmosphere of the commercial world, and went back to his house in the evening, and after supper to sleep, was worse than that of the galley slave. His chains were golden instead of iron. He said that he had been annoyed less by the curiosity of unappreciative listeners than he expected. The rule was, the most charming audiences quick to grasp and understand each point. At Rochester, New York, he had a very noisy audience who behaved very rudely, but these demonstrations interested him as all phases of nature, and especially human nature, interested him. At Sioux City he had a large audience composed of common people, farmers, mechanics, and others of a simple grade of life, and he said in all his lecture tour he had none more apparently interested and sympathetic. He did not know how long he would remain in this country. He was without plans, 
and in fact hated plans. He thought of going to Japan, whom he regarded as the highest race of decorative artists in existence. While there was considerable aestheticism in his conversation, there was much less of that affected soulfulness about the talented young Englishman than one would suppose. The Lecture while it cannot be said the audience which greeted Mr. Wilde last night was a large one, there is no doubt that it was an appreciative one. Upon the stage was simply a marble-topped stand, upon its undecorated and unobtrusive bosom resting a glass of clear water. To the rear of the stand was an armchair, the one in which kings usually sit in the mimic plays, which every now and then are put upon the boards at Crawford's. The lecturer was not early, but rather late, in fact, it being nearly half-past eight when the apostle entered. The entrance was not inspiring, neither as to its manner nor the surrounding effects. A door was swung open, exposing to view a most unsympathetic expanse of rough and whitewashed wall, a broken board standing out in bold relief, or, more properly speaking, resting prominently athwart it. So, when the gentle Oscar came in, it appeared to his auditors as though he was emerging to view from a garret. Acknowledging by a most thoroughly ungraceful bow the faint attempt at rapturous applause, he threw himself into a half-despairing attitude of Ajax defying the lightning style, and spoke a prologue, its main feature being its brevity. This, however, is more than can be said of the lecture. Oscar is not good-looking. He is narrower by a good deal at the top than the sides of his head, and his cranium, surrounded by a heavy shock or mane, parted in the middle, is indeed a vivid sight. He has, evidently, too many teeth altogether, and this becomes apparent the very moment he opens his mouth. His face is a broad expanse of anything save alert intellectuality. In fact, it expresses inert consciousness of having a fat thing in the lecture business more than anything else. There is nothing strong about the features, except the mouth, as has been said before, the forehead is narrow, the eyes neither bright nor particularly expressive, the chin is long and inclined to taper, which is no evidence of strength of any kind, being simply the way that part of the face happened to be formed. Oscar was dressed in the black plush suit, now so familiar and famous. A white silk handkerchief was knotted, perhaps not knotted exactly, about his throat, and tied in a careless sort of a way, after the fashion of the seventeenth century, probably. There was the lustrous incandescence of the famous diamond, so often spoken of in the newspapers, and there were lace ruffles at the sleeves. He wore knee-breeches, and while his leg is small, he has a foot like a deckhand on a Mississippi steamboat, and a hand like a blacksmith. Upon the fourth finger of the right hand was a seal ring, and from his watch fob also dangled a couple of seals. Outside of the knee breeches, it cannot be said Oscar was aesthetically dressed, and an unprejudiced man might set up the claim that he was too loud for ordinary and everyday wear. Ever and anon he wiped his lips with a silk handkerchief, in a sort of an ecstatically subdued sort of a way, and twice helped himself from the glass of water on the stand. His gestures were confined to an extension of the right arm. His posturing was Florentine, or, more properly speaking, perhaps, early English. One of his favourite attitudes was the placing of either the right or left hand just abaft the small of the back, as Anna Dickinson does when she goes through the soliloquy in Hamlet. He first rests on one foot, and then on the other, but never works himself into any sort of a perspiration or excitement. 
in mr wilde's list of punctuation marks there are evidently no periods whatever everything runs to semicolons he makes no full stops the inflection of his voice is never not even when he gets through flatly downward it is this peculiarity of his inability to momentarily quit and give his auditors a rest which renders his lectures so insufferably and physically tiresome when oscar starts in at eight fifteen and ceases about nine twenty five there is no relief it is a dreary monotony of unbroken waves of sound like the rising and falling of the pendulum in an eight-day clock oscar has evidently never studied elocution this not being according to his idea a branch of art he has completely and entirely neglected it the lecture is an unrelieved waste of words 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 like a great desert of sand with the edges all around touching the sky and no green thing in sight what he talks about the lecturer began by saying that art was no accident we are to live or we ought to live as nature intended us to live the great fault in this country said mr wilde was not that we do not love art but that we have no respect for the workmen who produce that art we should not despise the workers in art for by doing so we forget and neglect to pay to the art itself the respect due it in his gentle irish way a sort of a cross between a provincial accent and a national brogue the whole incorporated into or over slanged by a stage tone acquired probably since he took the lecture platform the aesthete told how they did things in england and the objects aimed at there of a necessity he said art was not confined to poetry and sculpture it existed in science and invention the telephone was a noble thing if we used it nobly and did not put it to ignoble uses there was only one thing worse than no art at all and that was bad art he criticised mercilessly the city architecture of america and said it was simply horrible he did not say anything however about the new government building being erected in topeka and nobody had the temerity to ask him about it for they were afraid of the effect it might have upon his nerves he spoke of dishonoured marble in the sense that men wrenched this precious species of stone from its parent bed to build houses that were simply cold and unsightly piles he referred to tragic carving oppressive painting the latter as applied to the way we daub our houses and the fearful and wonderful colours we daub them with oscar was in a measure dissatisfied with everything he saw in this country yet he said we had in us the making of a great nation he deprecated in his mild and benign way the criminal calendar of europe which was given to our children to study under the name of history we try to teach a child before he has grown enough to have a mind we try to save his soul before he has a soul to save he spoke of the incongruities of art and the crude ideas he had seen among the art enthusiasts of this country still oscar thought we would grow at this point and in fact at two or three other points he acted as though he would have liked to become enthusiastic but evidently enthusiasm as an art among the aesthetes is either a lost one or one yet to be acquired for oscar positively refused to enthuse when the lecture at last was over oscar bowed in an half earnest semi deprecatory way and ambled off the stage while the audience half doubting as to whether or not the entertainment was over hesitatingly arose and wended its way out end of section
A Stranger Within Our Gates, The Aitchison Globe, 24th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Stranger Within Our Gates Oscar Wilde lectured in Corinthian Hall Saturday night to an audience of 43 people, including the door tenders, ushers, janitor, etc., and the cash receipts did not exceed $25. This is an exact statement of fact, and Aitchison had the honour of snubbing Mr. Wilde more effectually than any other city in the United States. The lecture was exceedingly short, and did not occupy to exceed 30 minutes. After it was over, W. G. Ellett, Archie Wells, Edward Burke and Charlie Howe, the last two connected with this office, asked the manager for an introduction to Mr. Wilde, which was granted. They found him posing in a dressing room, before his valet had relieved him of the absurd toggery which he wears on the stage, and, on being introduced to the gentlemen, cordially shook hands with them, very much as a Kansas lecturer would have done, and talked with them quite freely. The first thing they noticed was his resemblance to an unsophisticated boy who had been encouraged in a hobby, and he seemed to feel that all the absurd things he said were quite new and startling. He is very tall, has a very large head with bushy hair, and long and thin legs, which were encased in velvet knee breeches and black silk stockings and when he talks he rests his elbow on a shelf or against the wall in a very gawky manner after he had shaken each of his visitors by the hand he said ah how kind of you to come i did not expect any one the night is so terribly dreadful how did you like my lecture the young men answered in a chorus that it was perfectly splendid although they thought it was perfectly vile. "'It is so difficult to lecture to empty benches,' Mr. Wilde continued. "'When I was in New York I had an audience of five thousand, and it was perfectly joyous. Chicago gave me an equally good audience. I was very much interested in that city, in a young sculptor I met in an out-of-the-way place, who was really and truly an artist.' and in my lecture I scolded the people for not encouraging him. I was afraid at first that they would not like it, but they took their scolding real well. I think it was so nice and good-natured of them, and I have learned since that the young artist was greatly benefited by what I said. In speaking of his lecture, he said, "'We do not lecture in England as you do here,' We men of letters express our views by writing, and we have a great number of splendid magazines and reviews. You have more orators in America than we have in England, however, and a greater number of young men of capacity in responsible positions. Turning to one of the young men connected with this office, Mr. Wilde inquired, In what business are you engaged? Remembering that the poet had no occasion to feel friendly to the paper, he replied, Me? Oh, <laughs> I am in the Queen's wear trade. This statement at once made Mr. Wilde enthusiastic, and he spoke of the splendid Cincinnati pottery, which was so artistic that he had visited the works and lectured on the subject. Do the people in the West, Mr. Wilde inquired, appreciate the beautiful in your line the fact is the young man replied that i keep the books i don't know much about the sales someone inquired if mr wilde admired wendell phillips and he answered that he admired every enthusiast no matter what he did or who he was mr wilde said he had thought seriously of going to australia in june but he didn't know whether he would or not, as an English colony was the most barren thing in the world, and decidedly base. But he will certainly visit Canada and the South before his return to England. Mr. Wilde said nothing about 
too too or utterly utter but his odd expressions are quoted exactly as they were used end of section pike's peak the manchester weekly times manchester uk twenty seventh of may eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain pike's peak mountain climbing is not a subject of general interest and some of my readers may be glad to turn from pike's peak to hear a word about oscar wilde the great i met mr wilde a few days ago in kansas and had a long conversation with him i had previously had a strong impression that the apostle of the beautiful had not received justice at the hands of the newspapers and my impression was confirmed by what he told me it might be a mere coincidence that all the newspapers in america have taken up a sneering attitude but i do not think it is making all due allowances and exceptions there is no doubt that oscar wilde has made a great sensation in america he has received great social attention and in many places he has had very large audiences in boston the harvard students tried to turn his lecture into a burlesque and this was duly telegraphed to england but we were not informed at least not by wire that mr wilde completely turned the laugh against these young men and emerged triumphantly from the ordeal at a time when we were told that boston society had turned its back upon the young poet he was being entertained by Longfellow and Dr. Holmes. In the eastern cities his photograph was most conspicuous. I saw it in a Washington shop window between those of Garfield and Arthur, and Mr. Wilde told me that the demand for it far exceeded any possible supply. He was enthusiastic about the kindness he had received in many of the western towns, particularly Cincinnati, Chicago and San Francisco and spoke most highly of the culture and intelligence of the leading people he'd met in those cities. In New York he had a reception given to him such as in England is rarely given to a prince, and he has a promise that on his return an evening party shall be given in his honour when all the gentlemen shall discard the odious trousers of dull respectability and assume the more becoming substitute of the aesthetic future mr wilde told me that in the west people had travelled long distances and waited weary hours at railway stations to see him pass he was compelled even when fatigued to show himself on the platforms and i presume the farmers went back to work cheered and refreshed by the phantom of delight on which they had feasted their hungering eyes what the american press appears to resent is that oscar wilde should have achieved such a position in their country without his being generally looked up to at home the idea that he is fooling their public seems to irritate them extremely but in my opinion this is the most erroneous opinion oscar wilde's message is one which is really wanted in the united states and without some grotesqueness and exaggeration he would not have secured a hearing he gave me a remarkable illustration of the Californian's detestation of the unforgivable crime of horse-stealing. Where murder is looked on rather as a fine art, a horse-thief is regarded with universal loathing, and Mr. Wilde had dined with a gentleman in California who owned to having fired eleven shots at a predatory poet, and who could not be convinced that he had been guilty of want of respect for literature in so doing when mr wilde was lecturing in chicago he received a present of a beautiful little bas-relief quite precious in its delicacy from a struggling sculptor upon which the lecturer rebuked his chicago audience for allowing such artistic merit to be unrecognized and instead of being offended said mr wilde they sent the young man more commissions than he could execute in two years i only relate a very small part of what mr wilde told me in order to show that his success in america has been much greater than has been reported he said that he had had no more attentive audience than the miners at leadville his intentions for the future are to lecture in australia and new zealand and above all to visit japan and remain for two months at least in that wonderful country contemplating its artistic treasures while attired if possible in that grand old national japanese costume 
which the natives themselves are so foolishly casting aside. End of section. Oscar's Return, Omaha Daily Republican, 25th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar's Return, the great champion of the sunflower, again visits Omaha. Oscar Wilde spent an hour or two in Omaha on Sunday. He came up from Aitchison and went to Lincoln where he lectured last evening. For the last two weeks he's been lecturing in Colorado, Kansas and Missouri. He spoke of Denver in enthusiastic terms of admiration, saying it was a magnificent city of marvellously rapid growth. While at Leadville he received quite an ovation and inspected one of the leading mines. He lectured once at Leadville and twice at Denver. During his visit on the Pacific coast, he lectured four times in San Francisco, twice in Oakland, once in Stockton, once in San Jose, and once in Sacramento. He was delighted with San Francisco and California, and he thinks San Francisco the most picturesque city in America, affording the artist a fine field. He visited the Chinese quarters, which he found full of the most artistic effects, which would have delighted the hearts of the old masters. When informed that the legislature at Lincoln, at its last session, had passed a law ordering all sunflowers to be cut down, he exclaimed, Is it possible? How unesthetic the Nebraska legislators must be! Had I known this a little sooner, I would never have gone to Lincoln. Mr. Wilde goes east from Lincoln, and will make a tour of Canada, he will then return to the United States and deliver farewell lectures in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. He sails for England the last June, and after a short rest he proposes to visit Japan to study Japanese art. He considers Japan the finest field in the world for artistic studies, and it has been the dream of his life to go there. End of section The Poet in Lincoln, the Omaha Daily Herald, 26th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Poet in Lincoln. Oscar Wilde visits the university, the penitentiary, and insane hospital. His address before the students, comments upon the convicts, sympathy with a murderer. Dante in a cell. The lunatics look at him, his remedy for blues. Staff Correspondence of the Herald Lincoln, April 25, 1882 On one of the front benches in the university chapel yesterday morning sat none other than Oscar Wilde, dressed as he usually dresses, and the students were so anxious to have him speak that he finally consented, though knowing that his manager would strongly object to any free lectures of that kind. For fifteen minutes he discoursed in a most entertaining manner on topics pertinent to the college and its work. He told the story, which those who have heard his lecture will remember, of Ruskin's humanitarian labours near Oxford, and how great in his influence there. Mr. Wilde said that they in England looked to the universities of America to carry on and support the new art movement, and applying it practically here. He would wish that everyone might learn some one of the decorative arts, so great a source of valuable pleasure are they. Mr. Wilde did not hesitate to criticise the miserably poor architecture of the university building, and hoped that as the students grew up they would strive to improve this, as well as establish a gymnasium, where might be seen models of the old Greek athletes, such splendid examples of physical beauty. He would have all strive to live up to the Greek ideal, a sound mind in sound body. 
the whole spirit of mr wilde's remarks was to show that it was quite as easy to build beautifully as badly oscar was quite taken with some of the pretty faces on the right side of chapel and expressed surprise as any englishman would at our co-educational system why if we fellows at oxford had young ladies there we well we'd never study can you study under such attractions we assured him that we could and that the young ladies were excellent students also in conversation with some of the professors he expressed a regret that he had never studied elocution and acknowledged that they made a rule not to learn extempore speaking so he was told of our literary societies and how much they had done in this direction and do the ladies make speeches too well well in the afternoon some friends took mr wilde out to see the penitentiary he had never visited a prison and his horror at the bareness of the place and complete sympathy for the convicts was that of a child going out those in the carriage were treated to a perfect flood of poetry to a dissertation in which one british or american author was taken up after another and criticised in short brief sentences which showed perfect familiarity with their writings longfellow said mr wilde was not a great poet he was a great poem oh a fine old man a fine old man he was rapturous over walt whitman but said most stinging things of poor joaquin miller emerson he said had been and was still a master for him carlyle had ceased to interest him he was surprised to learn that emerson had lost his influence on our youth of his own countrymen he seems to be passionately devoted to keats and quotes from him constantly in fact as to quotations mr wilde has an abundant supply at the prison warden nobes showed the visitors the rogues gallery a large collection of convicts photographs and it was very amusing to hear oscar's comments upon each oh what a dreadful face what a dreadful face and what did he do nobes did not hesitate to tell of the crimes in the most terrible way calculated to shock sensitive poets oh here's a beast an animal exclaimed wilde over one picture nothing of the man left it was a negro's picture but it had not done the man justice as we saw afterwards mr wilde was very anxious to see all the prison had to show and while in the cell room conversed with ayers of grand island who is under sentence to be hung the twentieth of june do you read my man asked the poet yes sir and what novels part of the time i am now reading the air of redcliffe wilde said that his heart had been turned by the eyes of the doomed man but if he read the air of redcliffe it was perhaps just as well to let the law take its course further on they came to the dark cell where refractory prisoners are placed at nobes invitation mr wilde and one of the university professors stepped in whereupon nobes slammed the solid door to with a terrible bang and gave them a very distinct impression of what black darkness is wilde went into another cell where he had caught sight of two neat rows of books which one of the convicts had arranged quite a little library he ran over the titles rapidly until he struck dante when he came out exclaiming oh dear who would have thought of finding dante here after the penitentiary had been done mr wilde was asked if he would like to ride over to the insane asylum 
he at first protested against additional horrors but concluded that he would go as he was in for it now so over to the hospital they went the scenes just left were being forgotten in another literary discussion in which principal sharp was rather roughly handled dr mathewson showed mr wilde around the asylum the first he had ever visited the sad scenes here would move any heart and it is no wonder that the aesthetic poets was troubled to the extreme he burst out in indignation against the whitewashed walls and sticky floor as he called it saying that citizens would go insane with such surroundings with not even a bench to oneself and one's neighbours muttering i would have the gayest colours possible in those wards would furnish them with fantastic dresses music boxes means of enjoyment Pooh! how dreary how dreadful mr wilde seemed glad to get away and the visits to these two abodes of crime and insanity seemed to affect the rest of his afternoon i have greater respect than ever before for virtue and sanity he said he was thoughtful for a while and then remarked that whenever he had the blues or was disgusted with the world he took up endymion and burying himself in that divine poem forgot the world and its cares he said he had always been melancholy when a boy though surrounded by every pleasure until he went to italy and learned the new life he expects to return to america some time merely to lecture to universities on art giving a fortnight's course at each college and refusing all public engagements he will go again to california in july with which place and whose people he is fascinated his lecture here was well attended but lincoln people do not like him and the criticisms upon him have been very severe but mr wilde is one thing above all he is a perfect gentleman End of section. Argus and the Ass, the Omaha Daily Bee, twenty sixth of April, eighteen eighty two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Argus and the Ass, the Aesthetic Oscar converting the Capitolines. Special correspondence of the Bee, Lincoln april twenty five oscar wilde lectures here to-night under the auspices of the presbyterian ladies of this city and a full attendance of the all but two twos is guaranteed the languid disciple of ruskin arrived on the afternoon train yesterday and was domiciled at the arlington your correspondent went around in the evening to make the gentleman's acquaintance and although he started out with the expectation of having a burlesque interview with the eccentric foreigner he wholly abandoned the idea before he left if your correspondent is entitled to an opinion on this subject he considers oscar wilde as brilliant a man intellectually as he has lately met the man's appearance as he greeted the reporter pleasantly by name was striking he was stretched out lazily upon the bed, with a large bearskin robe drawn over his legs. His dress was neat, and not especially outré. The long dark hair, oval face, and small mouth gave him a decidedly effeminate appearance, though there was not the slightest visible trace of the sensuality so much alluded to by Eastern correspondents he talked rapidly and with excellent choice of language proving himself a most excellent conversationalist and an entertaining host during the interview he puffed away vigorously at a strong cigar in which he seemed to find much relish i have come here from aitchison 
he stated in response to a question, having lectured at Topeka, Denver, and several other points in Kansas and Colorado. My trip to the Pacific coast has been one of supreme gratification to me. I should be contented to take up my residence there permanently. San Francisco I consider the most interesting and most beautiful of all American cities. Its location could not be surpassed. I lectured in that city four times, and at Oakland twice, having large and enthusiastic audiences. I also delivered lectures at San Jose, Stockton, and Sacramento. I lectured twice at Denver, and once at Leadville, at the latter place, addressing an immense crowd of miners. The theme of my lecture there was handicraft, and I appealed to their sympathies, and won their entire goodwill. In regard to my future plans, I expect to deliver a number of lectures between here and Chicago, reaching that city about next Sunday. Then I intend to go to Canada for a season, after which I will lecture for the second time in Boston and Philadelphia, and about the end of June will give a final lecture at New York, sailing thence to England, and after a little recreation I expect to go to Japan. There is a glorious feast of artistic treasures awaiting me there. Mr. Wilde then started off on a long and enthusiastic description of Japanese art. In taking his departure, the reporter said, Mr. Wilde, do you think that you could instill some of your artistic principles into the members of the Nebraska legislature? At the last session they passed a bill providing that all the sunflowers along our highways should be cut down, "'Is that a fact?' asked the aesthetic in astonishment. "'If I had known that, I think I should either have cancelled my engagement here, "'or else engaged to lecture half a dozen times. "'The impression which your correspondent took away with him "'after an hour's chat with the gentleman "'was that he was a man of great intellectual strength.' in spite of numerous drawbacks in appearance and manner. However much opinions may differ on this point, he is certainly brainy enough to tell Nebraskans a great many things worth knowing in the special province to which he has so long applied himself. End of section The World Wonder Wild Iowa Daily Register Des Moines, 27th of April, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The World Wonder Wild. A chat with the Irish Apostle of Aestheticism and a look at his makeup. A broadside at American crockery about the practicality of art in nations. His lecture last night. The Irish Apostle of Aestheticism visited this aesthetic city yesterday, and lectured last evening at the Opera House. Further than this mere announcement, there should be no especial cause for wonder, but it is peculiarly the fact that this will not suffice, and, believing that the aesthetic conception of this city needed food, the register aesthetic visited the British peculiarity at his room in the Aborn house, and passed an hour with him in conversation on topics congenial to them both. As he entered, Mr. Wilde was seated on a sofa, smoking a very large cigar, with his idle hand lying across his lap. He arose at the chronicler's entrance and came forward, appearing a well-developed man, perhaps five feet and a half high, straight and full in bust. His hair, a dark brown, is combed back carelessly from his forehead, and is allowed to grow long and untrimmed. 
his complexion is not dark nor exceptionally fair but as soft and smooth as a lady's his eyes are truly feminine and in talking an expression of kindness plays in them which gives the eyebrows the proverbial arch of good nature and serves as an index to the true tenderness of his temperament to begin where we should in telling of his clothes let it be said that his trousers are long and cover a pair of patent leather shoes cut low and pointed in the toe in sitting down the crook of the knee in slightly elevating the pants serves to display a rich red pair of silk stockings clocked in a lighter shade of the same colour and fitting closely over the instep when the chronicler took his seat mr wilde immediately asked as to the size of the metropolis and desired to know if it was not the busiest and alike the largest city in the state the question was of course answered in the affirmative and in reply to his question as to the derivation of the name des moines the chronicler said that it formerly served to designate the first inhabitants the monks from which the name was taken here he approached the aesthetic subject so near to his heart and pocket-book and desired to know if there were any ruins left here of these first inhabitants and if there were any ruins here of any kind the answer was not acceptable for every citizen of des moines knows there are no ruins here over thirty years of age but the thought did come to the reporter's mind that if mr wilde would visit almost any saloon in the city he might find ruins thirty yes forty sixty eighty years of age it would never have done to have told mr wilde this however no said he there are no ruins in this country and it is a pity for by the existing monument of other times of an age when art was better and existed in fact the present would be better educated the reporter spoke of art as it existed in england oh yes he replied art attained to a more perfect degree in england in the seventeenth century than it ever has in italy they build for beauty there and a thing of beauty is not only a joy for ever but exists almost for ever ugly houses do not withstand the destroying power which man's conception impels him to but a beautiful house a house built with an eye to art appeals to the better nature of humanity and it is permitted existence because the original conception of its erection and design was an artistic one in that age of art in england they builded artistically well and that age is now displayed in england by practical results an artistic nation is a practical one in fact history shows this but the reporter ventured to ask if italy with its history past and present gave evidence to this statement and he replied that it was a wide question no i cannot say that in this case my statement holds good victor emmanuel within the last fifty years has while destroying the first principles of republican government and instituting new ones also destroyed italy's national sense of art and in the late wars what stood as art's monuments have been for the most part destroyed why sir italian art is suffering to-day because america was discovered and this is proved by the fact that your steam engines are introduced there they are doing away with gondolas in venice which certainly furnished delightful means of conveyance more rapid than a horse more comfortable and more delicious in their place they are using the grimy dirty steamers 
which go puffing about and are extremely horrid this allow us to add is partial proof of the growth of practical ideas in italy which mr wilde did not intend to assert and which he unfortunately did do but that it is testimony to the fact is somewhat doubted however it was not our purpose to interrupt him and we will proceed with him to california where he says nature has done what art has not and in reality has made it an italy without its art i was deeply pleased with my sojourn on the slope it is really the loveliest spot on earth there are the peach blossoms covering the orchards in their snow-white purity the apple buds blossoming on the hills resembling veritable red cheeks of nature and the purple-tipped mountains all this comprising a picture with the blue pacific as the background oh tis grand of course the reporter was pleased if mr oscar wilde had seen anything in this worry hurry workaday country that was satisfactory and took the liberty to ask us to art out there there is art in america but it is not common to any locality i found that in san francisco they have old established schools of design and in all work save that of handicraft i find they are doing well but the american people do not appreciate art as they should the modern upholstery of to-day has destroyed the old beauty and true art displayed in that which took its style from the household furniture of the puritans in new england i was permitted to see some of the old furniture of the puritan style and i was deeply pleased with it there are reasons for an immediate change in the style of your articles of use in this country in the hotels of new york philadelphia chicago san francisco in all of the hotels i have been so unfortunate to visit i have seen this demonstrated in new york city the waiter brought me my chocolate at ten o'clock in the morning served in a cup of crockery ware at least three quarters of an inch thick and i thought as i lifted the unwieldy thing to my mouth if the man who made it was born of a barbarous conception do you use these great thick ugly things for weapons or are they used for drinking purposes in all times of peace i was obliged to use them at my hotel in san francisco but while there i was permitted to visit the chinese quarters and to attend the chinese theatre and to sup at the chinese restaurant this is a nice and a cool resort there is a cosy little latticed portico lighted with chinese lanterns and there i was served with tea in dainty little cups which were no thicker than the thin tender petal of a white rose so dainty that a lady would exercise care in using them yet the chinamen who use them every day are capable of doing and do more coarse rough work in san francisco than any other class of labourers but they are that nice and proper in their mode of living as to use these dainty and beautiful articles of table furniture and with a grace becoming the french court there is one thing which mr wilde is pronounced in and to speak of it would be to appeal to a very important issue of the people of the north he does not like our stoves nearly every house he has entered nearly every hotel room he has occupied in the west is heated with a cast iron stove which according to his aesthetic conception is neither handsome nor shapely why says he don't you do away with those horrid iron stoves a porcelain stove is more elegant and gives out more heat 
I do not like the mechanical art displayed in their ornamentation, and the apparent custom with the designer of these stoves is to cap the climax of his crime on art by surmounting them with a funereal urn, a cup of Jove, or with the poor suggestion of the octagon of Thespis. This was a warm reminder, and the other newspaper man who was listening with the register chronicler, having the vision of a hotter futurity, changed the subject as to what time he would leave America. I wish to go to Japan, for I know there is art there, and I would like to remain there three long months, study their handicraft, improve upon the element of delicacy which pervades their artistic achievements, and teach my newly learned art axioms to the Americans and the English. He stated that he longed to sail for Japan while in San Francisco, and probably it was only the anticipation of a visit to this city which contented him to remain. After an hour's interesting presence with the peculiar aesthete, the chronicler took his leave, and with a full realisation of a quotation from Horace Greeley, who once said, in effect, that the fools are not all dead yet. End of section. Aesthetic. Dayton Daily Democrat. 3rd of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Aesthetic. An interesting interview with Oscar Wilde. On art, decorative art, American and European art. Sightseeing about Dayton and the Soldiers' Home. His lecture on decorative art at Music Hall last night. Our fair city was visited yesterday, as most of our readers know, by perhaps the greatest living art critic, one who at least is among the very highest, and still on the ascendancy, while the lustre of him, who has ruled supreme in the kingdom of art criticism hitherto, during the present generation, is rapidly waving and losing its power. The ignorant laugh at Oscar Wilde's eccentricities, but that matters naught, in view of the fact that he is recognised by artists and connoisseurs of art as a man of almost unequalled taste and aesthetic judgment. He arrived in this city last Monday night, and at once retired to his rooms at the Beckel House, where he remained during the morning. A representative of the Democrat paid Mr. Wilde a visit, in his room at the Beckel House just after he had finished his dinner yesterday. A more opportune moment for an interview could not have been chosen, for the old truth, well known, that a man's sociability and talkativeness are at their best when the inner man has been supplied with all that nature demands, or culinary skill can supply, was here simply proven, and promptly in answer to the reporter's card sent up from the office came the invitation to walk in. There sat the great Oscar Wilde, half reclining on a sofa, a small table before him bearing writing materials in the use of which he had evidently been interrupted by the entrance of his visitor. Papers were strewn about his feet in profusion. The remains of his dinner stood on another table beside him, and the whole character of the room presented an air more of comfortable utility rather than orthodox neatness. Mr. Wilde himself was in perfect keeping with the surroundings as he sat there, whiffing a fine cigar. His face is well known to our readers through the thousands of pictures that have been scattered over the country since his arrival upon American soil. He looks exactly like these pictures, with his long scraggy brown hair, wiry and oilless, falling over his ears and neck, about his shoulders. His mild blue-grey eyes, his graceful nose but large lips, his soft effeminate flesh, but withal his very large massive head, 
and graceful form he is odd and eccentric in his dress and style but it is an eccentricity which loses its conspicuousness in the charm of his conversation the depth of thought and brilliancy of expression eccentric it is true but it is the eccentricity of a great man and not the eccentricity of affectation or else he could not have won for himself the commendation of the greatest artists and literati of this continent and the old world as it undoubtedly has done ere he has reached the age of three decades his dress was peculiar although he did not wear his much talked of knee breeches he had on a mouse-coloured corduroy blouse with grey worsted pantaloons about his neck was tied an old silk tie of a warm green hue while from the left breast pocket of his coat protruded a silk handkerchief of the same colour how do america and american institutions impress you mr wilde asked the reporter by way of opening conversation after self-introduction and cordial greeting had passed oh, what is the use to generalities this country is much like other countries we do not find much difference i think the west is grand i was far more interested in that part of america than in the east the east is much more like the countries of europe but in california i was perfectly delighted everything is so new and novel and interesting i was charmed with california and the west but what a dreadful barrier of desert separates you of the east from the west it seems as though nature had exhausted her resources on the west and had nothing left for those prairies oh, it is so dreary so desolate with those miles and miles of level plain sweeping across the country with not a tree not a flower not even an animal i presume however that you do not find as much art in the west as in the east no but still there are some good artists out there we do not want to teach the people how to become great artists we do not want to take a fine italian masterpiece and put it in the workman's shanty he would not appreciate it he could not be made to appreciate it it would give him no pleasure what we want to do is to teach the people that they can have beauty in everything teach them to open their eyes and look at nature teach them to see the glorious panorama of colour that is going on every day in the skies above their heads and in all nature about them we want to get them to quit using these horrid forms of furniture and household utensils and make them understand that there can be beauty in the meanest vessel we want to educate them to despise these dreadful combinations in colour in their wallpapers either they are now ignorant and insensible to these outrages to taste or else they are existing in utter misery now look at that chair can anything be more horrid in form where it curves in it should curve out and where it curves out it ought to curve in it will not last either it is badly put up all over the country in all the hotels i stop at they give me cups like this to drink my coffee or chocolate from see how thick and clumsy it is it is at least half an inch thick and so barbaric in form that one would think it was made in a barbarous savage age and intended to be used to high at the head of an enemy as a weapon of defence it disgusts me to drink from it 
such rude things make men rude who use them we ought to have things of beauty in everything about our house let children when quite young be accustomed to see and handle delicate things and they will become refined i was impressed while out west in going among the chinese to see these navvies who work hard all day on the railroad shoveling dirt go home at night and drink their tea out of cups of fine porcelain as thin and delicate as the petals of a white rose so delicate indeed that our ladies even are afraid to handle them for fear of breaking them that is what we should have for ourselves here i would place things of beauty things of delicacy in the houses of all our mechanics as well as of the wealthy this is the first hotel that i have been in for two or three weeks where my room did not have that horrid dreadful thing called a stove in it i think the way people make stoves now is an outrage if we must have them in our houses with their black iron bodies and ugly coiling pipe let us have them plain and unornamented but no they insist on decorating them and so they put a garland of roses around the bottom black grimy horrid machine-made cast-iron roses what a desecration and then on top they put a something that so much resembles a funeral urn that we think we are living in a cemetery or sepulchre all the time why not make them plain then they can be accepted simply as a disagreeable necessity mr wilde do you think that this present so-called aesthetic craze oh, do not call it a craze it is no craze you americans have such a way of treating serious things as a joke and yet you are not a joyous people in society there is all brilliancy and apparent joyousness but on the railway trains i do not see happy men and women everybody has a troubled anxious look and everybody is pushing forward in some business project but the people do not appreciate art and so they call it a craze but it will live and spread its influences and be continuing in its good and it is no craze you have answered just the question i was going to ask i should rather have used the term revival do you think the present great revival of interest in art will pass away after a time or will its benefits be lasting art and true beauty can never die there may be a wave of barbarism sweep over europe by an asiatic invasion but true art will not be lost pardon me for asking it mr wilde but i have a great curiosity as many other americans have to know why it is you have selected the lily and sunflower as the emblems of beauty you know it has been only since your arrival in america that those flowers have really been discovered by americans i love the lily and sunflower answered the great aesthete laughing because of their perfectness of form and adaptability for decorative purposes what is more beautiful than the gracefully flowing outlines of the lily and the symmetry of the sunflower with its large round disc of rich reddish brown surrounded by its beautiful rays of yellow then with the lily there is such purity of colour and it has so many beautiful legends associated with it 
and the sunflower's fidelity to the great source of warmth and light and truth it always looks to the sun never drooping its head towards the cold shadows of earth the lily is so beautiful for decorating rooms but the sunflower is too gorgeous for indoor decoration unless the room is full of richness and colour the rose is a beautiful piece of colour but it has no beauty of form and is not adapted for decoration do you think mr wilde that you pre-raphaelites of the present day while tending to wean art away from the old heroic style of michelangelo and introducing more of the realistic and more of nature as it is are bringing it more within the power of appreciation of the masses than it has been hitherto why what could be more realistic than michelangelo the truth is we are only beginning to appreciate the classic art the infinite beauty of greek art is only being discovered but it is a mistake which the americans so often make to confuse me with the pre-raphaelite while i owe much to mr ruskin and to pre-raphaelite teaching i do not class myself with that school but i belong to a very different school entirely whom do you consider the greatest living painter i think mr whistler is by far the greatest artist living and i am glad to be able to say he is an american although he lives in england have you found any artists in america whom you consider equal to your great painters of england it is hard to institute comparisons between artists and especially between men of genius because to be a genius a man must possess certain qualities which are exclusively his own and the value of these qualities cannot be compared with the value of qualities possessed by another i think mr duvenick of boston is the greatest painter in america he and mr whistler are the leaders in this new school which i champion are there any other great artists who have become allied with this new school you speak of no it is followed now only by the younger class of artists what are the characteristics of the school simplicity of treatment and the rendering of subjects taken from scenes of the present day in preference to the old subjects of history the pre-raphaelites estimate the worth of a picture by the story it tells we do not consider that it does not matter so much what you paint as how you paint it our school lays greatest weight on the importance of colour a picture badly coloured is no picture at all unless as you approach a picture from a distance the eye is pleased with the beautiful scheme of colour it is not a good picture no matter how good a story is told i believe that art has a province of its own without invading the provinces of literature if we want a poem let us go to a poet if we want a story let us go to a story-teller but if we want a picture a representation of the wonderful beauties around us then let us go to the artist whistler has adopted this idea of the importance of harmony of colour that he paints his pictures and names them solely with this in view he paints symphonies in colour you may laugh at the idea of a man painting a symphony but he does it and he names his pictures symphony in blue and white or symphony in white why 
the most beautiful picture i ever saw is whistler's symphony in white it is so simple and yet so lovely a grey sky lightly flecked with delicate white clouds a grey sea dotted with white waves and in the foreground is a white balcony with all the varying shades of white from the pearly white marble to the rich yellow white of ivory upon the balcony are three little girls oh so beautiful all dressed in white and one is reaching over and tearing the petals of white blossoms from a tree and they are borne away upon gentle zephyrs like little white snowflakes could anything be more exquisitely lovely what purity what beauty and then would you turn from this to some dreadful picture of mary queen of scots about to be beheaded painted by some artist who ought to have been beheaded himself before he was ever allowed to paint such a picture this is the kind of art that is destined to win the day in this present age we are tired of these bloody ugly dreadful pictures we have had so long what do you think of america mr wilde viewed from an artist's standpoint it will never produce great landscape painters it will be greater in figure painting than in landscape but it will be greatest in sculpture the country is new people look upon the forests from a commercial point of view and do not appreciate them artistically men at hard labour in the mines or at agriculture form excellent subjects for figure painting while men who are confined in large cities become stooped and ungraceful but no country which has the clear atmosphere and the cloudless skies that america has or that switzerland or italy have can be good for the landscapist the great landscape painters of the world have been in holland france and england where the hazy damp atmosphere lend a charm to the view not seen in clearer air well i must express my thanks to you mr wilde for this interview i presume you have found us newspaper men a great annoyance since you have been in america oh no not at all i never allow anything to annoy me if i don't want to see anybody i tell them so soon after this the carriage drove up which had been provided by professor isaac broom through whose efforts mr wilde was brought to dayton and by the courtesy of mr wilde and professor broom representatives of the democrat and journal accompanied these two gentlemen on a trip of sightseeing the new presbyterian church was first visited mr wilde admired its arrangement very much and thought the granite pillars in the interior were beautiful but would have been better if of different colours he did not compliment the stained glass windows nor the frescoing but said they were both barren and in bad taste he was struck with the elaborately fine jail exterior and afterwards in expressing his admiration of the general beauty of the city said he did not wonder we have so fine a jail for with a city so beautiful people could not be very wicked at the art pottery of the ladies decorative art society he was not sparing in his praise of the works of professor broom and of the students he was particularly complimentary to the underglaze decoration of some pieces of pottery the work of miss may broom pronouncing them exquisite and in wonderful taste and he was delighted when miss broom presented him a small piece of pottery which he had admired especially 
miss broom has a right to feel proud of his praises of her work for he is not accustomed to praise except when he means what he says at the soldiers home a visit was paid to governor patrick who assisted by chaplain earnshaw colonel thomas major watson and captain giddinger entertained their distinguished visitor to the very best of their ability he was shown the principal attractions of the home although time was limited and he freely praised the new theatre and particularly the handsome drop curtain indeed although he has travelled so much and seen so many sights he still has a keen interest in all he sees End of section. Oscar Wilde, Dayton Daily Journal, 3rd of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, Visit of the English Eastheat to Dayton. He inspects the art school, the soldier's home, and other objects of interest in the city. What he thought of it all his lecture oscar wilde and servant ireland and t a vale manager of new york were among the names registered at the beckel house yesterday morning the journal man having sent up his card was duly ushered into the presence of the english poet and art reformer he was seated on a sofa with a table and writing materials before him but rose to greet his visitor cordially, and requested him to be seated. The large athletic figure was attired in mouse-coloured velveteen coat, light pantaloons, low morocco shoes, and dark blue embroidered stockings. There was little in the face to be called handsome. The smooth, heavy, boyish features were surmounted by a broad forehead and a profusion of long auburn hair that was combed back without an attempt to part and fell back of the ears without a wave nearly reaching the shoulders there was a suggestion of western picturesqueness in the long hair but it was without the wavy ringlets of buffalo bill and more vividly recalled the mannerisms of joaquin miller the poet of the sierras the whole contour of the face was not unlike that of george eliot which appeared some months ago in scribner's magazine the lips are thick with a feminine expression about the mouth the eyes are small and have a frank hearty expression twinkling with amusement and brightening with enthusiasm when he dwelt on subjects that pleased him he proved an excellent conversationalist, with an easy manner that did not force itself on the listener, but interested, by an apparent earnestness, and made him a confidant when the speaker threw back with a toss his heavy head of hair and indulged in a hearty laugh. Professor Broom had arranged to conduct Mr. Wilde to such objects of interest as his time would permit during the afternoon and directly after dinner a carriage was taken at the hotel by those gentlemen accompanied by representatives from the democrat and the journal the first visit was to the presbyterian church on third street which mr broom desired to show to the guest as a specimen of the most advanced steps taken in decoration he appeared pleased and expressed admiration at the decoration of the interior it is really quite excellent said the poet i am surprised its dimensions are perfect and these polished granite columns are beautiful they should not have been both alike however one of them of red scotch granite would have afforded so charming a contrast in america you have such fine building stone i do not like those windows though why were they made with so transparent a design and such flaring colours mr broom explained that the use of cathedral glass was in its infancy in this part of the country figures would have been much prettier and in better taste 
the work in stained glass is a peculiar art and so great an artist as sir joshua reynolds has made in our country a flagrant error in it the drive from the city was through dayton view and the conversation turned upon the objects of interest that encountered the eye the comments these objects excited were not of affection but the expression of the school which he represented the caricature of oscar wilde in patience has no resemblance to the real the criticisms which the aesthetic sense prompted were not ridiculous they were always natural and with apparent truth suggesting errors or change in objects which have come to be regarded as unchangeable as a matter of course his eye quickly caught what was attractive or amusing and his appreciation was always hearty the jail with its ornamented front he found so amusing that he threw back his head and gave utterance to a hearty laugh and for the instant thought that it was only so called for a joke what is the name of your river here miami oh how lovely are those indian names there are so many of them beautiful but some of the eastern towns i have met have barbarous beastly names there was one greeksville that is simply horrible i would never lecture in such a town unless its name was changed that is a beautiful scene he exclaimed as the carriage passed over the river you should never let your manufacturers pollute the air with smoke in many towns in england they have ordinances requiring all smoke to be consumed ruskin would not go to manchester until they got rid of their smoke and they finally did it when i called at the residence of mr probesco in cincinnati and looked down on the filthy cloud that hung upon the city i was astounded how long can beauty exist among so much that is vile your visit to san francisco was pleasant asked mr broom oh i enjoyed it immensely it is a wonderful country a garden of the world when i passed over that vast space from the mountains to the mississippi where everything seemed a monotonous brown where even the animals and the indians have fled from the rattle of the train it seemed as if nature had exhausted herself in forming the delightful country of california and could do no more for these illimitable plains there is a flavour of bret hart over this country he is a charming artist his work is so finished and complete and then there is joaquin miller i love the west and its people i like to visit your universities there are so many of them distributed over the country they make it life-blood your universities reach into the people and affect a greater work than ours they ought to cultivate more the physical as well as the mental man a good gymnasium should be a part of every university there is only one thing i utterly dislike in america that is its cigarettes at home i rarely smoked cigars always cigarettes they were african tobacco rolled in egypt but i cannot smoke those i find here they are vile and i have given them quite up what a peculiar tint the brick has in so many of your houses there should be more colour in it they have a sickly look similar comments were called forth from time to time until the pottery was reached on summit street a number of carriages were drawn up before the building and quite a number of ladies including miss carrie brown the president of the society mrs 
Brenard Thresher, Miss Broom, and other members of the classes. Mr. Wilde was introduced to them, and he then passed a short time examining various articles of the work. Two vases by Miss Broom attracted his attention at once, and he complimented them highly for the simplicity. He was also particularly well pleased with the watercolours made by members of the classes. In speaking of the work, he said that the amount was smaller than what he saw in Cincinnati, but its quality was very much higher. Though the one young man there, a Mr. Brewer, he said showed the highest artistic talent. He deprecated too great a freedom of style, and urged the cultivation of the senses before the mind. He referred to the use of glaring, plain white dishes, and the increase of decorated pottery of all kinds, and urged it in the articles of daily use. At the best hotels in New York and San Francisco, he was daily served coffee in earthenware half an inch thick that might serve as valuable weapons of defence. In San Francisco, he saw Chinamen drinking from cups delicate as rose leaves, that ladies would have to handle tenderly. Proceeding to the soldiers' home, a visit was made to the conservatory and the grotto, which were much admired. The party then proceeded to Governor Patrick's headquarters, where Colonel Thomas, Chaplain Earnshaw, Major Wilson, Captain Giddinger were introduced, and after a short stay there and a pleasant chat with the officers, visited the memorial hall, the dining room, and the library, and then returned to the city. "'Have you a poet in Dayton?' he asked on the return drive. The newspaper man replied, "'Poets are numerous in the springtime, and there was the usual crop at present.' The aesthetic sighed, and, turning to the subject of actors, he said there were but two actors in the world, Bernhardt and Salvini. Bernhardt told me, he continued, musing, that there were two things worth seeing in this country, the acting of Clara Morris and the way they kill pigs in Chicago. I have seen Clara Morris, and I admire her. I have just come from Chicago, but I didn't care to see them kill pigs. What a beautiful flower this is! Scenting a flower he held in his hand. Single flowers are always the most beautiful. Double flowers always look to me like a woman with a pretty face, but no figure. And he threw his head back, laughing in his hearty manner. End of section. Oscar Wilde, Harrisburg Telegraph, 5th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, His Impressions of Harrisburg, Other Topics Discussed. A reporter of the Telegraph wended his way last evening to the Lockiel Hotel after Oscar Wilde's lecture, to interview the Apostle of the Sunflower and the Lily in regard to his general treatment by the American public, and to hear some opinions from him in regard to his impression of this country. Ascending the elevator to the third floor, and rapping at the door of the large, spacious room of the hotel fronting on Third Street, was but the work of a moment, after which the scribe was bade by a somewhat musical and rather feminine voice from within to enter the room. Accepting the proffered invitation, the man with the pencil found himself in the presence of the disciple of aestheticism. After glancing at Mr. Wilde's peculiar costume, the reporter started the conversation with, Mr. Wilde, what is your opinion of Harrisburg from the little you have seen of it? Well, one should not generalise about a place having seen as little as i have of your city i came here in the afternoon and was engaged in writing a letter the remainder of the day and consequently am unable to form any sort of opinion of the capital city how were you pleased with your audience this evening 
I had a very charming audience indeed, of perhaps one hundred and fifty or two hundred persons. They were quite attentive, and showed me the respect that the most sensitive lecturer would desire. Of course, I don't expect everyone to agree with what I say. What has been your treatment by the American press in general? was the next question propounded by the scribe. It would be foolish for me to generalize on such a subject. When I came over to America, at first it seemed as if there was a want of sanative criticism on the part of the newspapers. The New York World, however, had quite a good article on my lecture, and deserves special mention in this connection, for the soundness and vigour with which it expressed itself with regard to my subject. In almost every place I go, there is always one paper which writes in a becoming and serious manner on what I have to say, and the criticisms are, to say the least, quite good. In Denver, Colorado, the articles in some of the newspapers, the Tribune and one or two others, were excellent. In fact, nothing could have been better. Speaking about the West, how were you received as regards your audiences? I found not only the most charming audiences, but in every city I lectured I had always the people of the highest literary culture and intelligence. The conversation was here interrupted by the servant, who brought in an autograph album with the request that Mr. Wilde favour the owner with his signature, which he did, after which he returned the book to the owner. While writing, the reporter noticed a large black seal ring on the third finger of the aesthetic young man, which, however, was not graced by a sunflower or lily. Mr. Wilde's movements in writing are from the whole arm, giving him plenty of room to finish up with a sweeping curve line of beauty after having written his name. "'I see,' resumed the reporter, "'that Henry Ward Beecher has joined hands with you, as it were, in your endeavours for aesthetics. His last lecture was on the modern uses of luxury and beauty in our homes.' "'Yes, so I see by the papers.' Mr. Beecher is a man of great culture and intellect, and has that width of mind that enables him to comprehend people fairly. I have great admiration for him. He is one of those men whose broad humanity appears to understand everybody. When I was in Chicago, he was kind enough to call on me. I hope to see more of him before I leave this country. Mr. Wilde, do you ever have any hesitation or apparent tremor in going before the public? queried the reporter. Mr. Beecher, Mr. Burdett, Mr. Tilton, Mr. Goff, and many illustrious lecturers all testify to the fact that it is a terrible ordeal to pass through in coming before large audiences. No, sir, not in the least. I am not at all timid, replied the aesthetic Oscar. I know I have something to say, and I simply say it. That's all. I have confidence enough in American audiences, from what I have seen of them, having lectured for a long time, to know that they will treat me in the most courteous and polite manner. I find this to be a rule. The only exception was at Rochester, where some roughs in the gallery of the hall where I was lecturing made themselves conspicuous for their want of sense by annoying me as much as possible. Of course, such things are unavoidable. These facts impress me every day with the sense of fair play among the American people. Then you don't concur in Charles Dickens' view of the people of the United States as set forth in his Chuzzlewit. Oh, no, not in the least. I find them to be the most frank, ingenious, and generous people I have ever met. Why, in Leadville, which has the reputation of being the roughest city of any in America, I could not have been treated nicer. I spoke to them about the ancient workers in metal, how they made the various kinds of coins from different metals, and told them of the many beautiful things in art that were wrought through the skill of the artisans of long ago. They seemed to be interested in no ordinary degree in what I had to say, and the treatment I received at their hands could have been no better. 
this too after i had been warned by friends that i would receive some pretty rough usage why i went down in the silver mines there and spent whole nights in them i cannot but remember the graceful motions of one of the workmen his every movement would have been suitable for a bronze casting there appeared to be a rhythmic pulsation in the beats of the hammer mr wilde is it true that you really are wild over the sunflower and the lily continued the reporter if you ask whether i admire those two flowers i may say i love them for decoration because they both have such perfect form the flowers most essential to a young designer are those that are the most perfect the rose has a most beautiful colour but the form of it is very loose of all flowers the lily is the prettiest it has the exquisite outline and perfect curve that adapts itself for decoration it is the most constant flower in the paintings of italy in florence not only is it seen everywhere in the flower gardens but it is represented in marble fresco and art the sunflower although not so constant yet is especially adapted for decorative art as its proportions are so symmetrical and with its great brown disc and golden rays it forms no mean part in the designs in pottery painting etc mr wilde changing the subject do you always deliver the same lecture asked the scribe oh no i have some five or six different lectures i generally deliver the one that i think will suit the town in a manufacturing place like harrisburg i think it best to lecture on the handicraft on the calling of the man who works in wood and metal etc my renaissance is a lecture given in new york on my arrival there it referred more particularly to the theory of the art in its relation to life and the history of the rise of this movement in england i thought it best to show the people how it sprang up what its conditions were its birth and also because i wished to mention with honour and reverence all those who had worked so nobly for the art in england at this point mr wilde entered upon a eulogy of mr emerson saying he was a man friendly to every movement for the amelioration of mankind after which the reporter thanking the lecturer for his courtesy withdrew end of section oscar wilde's return the world new york ninth of may eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde's return finding the true american in the far west and sublime beauty at the golden gate mr oscar wilde arrived in new york early yesterday morning and went to the grand hotel where friday afternoon a world reporter found him after i left the east said mr wilde i found a people that struck me as more representatively american than those in the other states it was west of chicago that i found america here in the older country the people are very closely akin to the english i arrived at last in san francisco in the spring the peach trees were in bloom in the orchard the apple trees blossomed in the close the beautiful sky was bright and the warm ocean flooded with light was pouring in through the golden gate oh, it was most beautiful and for the first time i understood why nature had so clothed itself in green it is because it is the most restful of all colours and after yearning for it for three months i found it in san francisco moreover the place itself is most attractive the people are warm and generous and are cultivated i lectured four times there and twice in oakland a little place just across the bay an artistic side to the chinese question of course i have no desire to enter into a political discussion but i found the chinese quarter in san francisco most interesting 
and in my opinion the chinese have a decided artistic value which i think congress should consider in discussing the chinese question their quarter is full of artistic motives and they have a constant eye to the value of colour we do not value colour sufficiently we do not recognise the element of joyousness that colour brings with life the chinese have two theatres in san francisco and every actor is most nobly and beautifully attired so that their plays are pageants as every play ought to be because the stage should be art in action i learned many things from the chinese the relation of physique to intelligence how did the rough manners of the west impress you there now i object to that word rough as applied to minors they are cordial and generous and not at all rough one of my best and most interested audiences was composed of leadville miners one reason i liked them was because of their magnificent physiques i spent a night in a silver mine and it was one of my most delightful experiences the most unintellectual audience i had was in salt lake the mormons are the most unintellectual people i have met in america because they have the worst physiques i have seen and a people must have good physiques in order even to comprehend art i found president taylor charming i went to his house and he and his three wives occupied a stage box at my lecture the mormon's tabernacle is the shape of a tea kettle and is decorated with the ornaments of a jail seed by the western wayside in chicago i had delightful audiences i was particularly struck with the courtesy of the western audiences which the tone of the press did not lead me to expect in every city where i have been i have either found an art school crude to be sure or if they had not one they started one on the occasion of my visit so that i cannot doubt that my coming to america has had an effect in the smaller cities most of the people have never seen any art whatever and the idea of design is bad the idea i had of america when i landed has been very strongly confirmed it is that what this country needs principally is not the higher imaginative art but the simple decorative art that can make beautiful for us the commonest vessel of the house if an article is beautiful it must have been made by a good workman because only a good workman can make a beautiful thing an experiment in medieval costume mr wilde said that his costumes described in the world on thursday were an experiment they were very beautiful so simple yet so artistic the age of francis i the era when the costumes such as he had ordered were worn was an era of simplicity he did not know whether he would wear them in public but he would if he wore them at all on thursday afternoon next he will deliver a lecture at wallach's theatre on the practical application of aesthetics in house decoration dress and morals he thinks it probable that he will go to australia as a strong pressure has been brought on him to do so if he concludes to go he will sail from san francisco on june thirty first after having first visited canada he will remain in and about new york until he leaves for canada end of section oscar wilde the chicago sunday tribune seventh of may eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde his surprise and his views special dispatch to the chicago tribune new york may sixth 
Oscar Wilde was met tonight sauntering down Broadway with a friend. What? Thomas Burke assassinated? The friend of my father, and who has often dined at our house? And Lord Cavendish, too? I do not see why they should wish to assassinate mediocrity, for he was just an easy-going, pleasant, mediocre gentleman, whom no one could have a grudge against. Such, too, was Mr. Burke. He had filled many official positions, but none that brought him in contact with the Irish people. The assassinations were undoubtedly the result of intoxication at what the Irish thought a complete victory. They turned liberty into license, but when liberty comes with hands dabbled in blood, it is hard to shake hands with her, eh? Hear, hear, said Mr. Wilde's friend. But then we forget how much England is to blame, said Mr. Wilde. She is merely reaping the fruit of seven centuries of injustice. There must be trouble ahead. I presume martial law will be proclaimed, and the Conservative Party must come into power again, though I do not care to see it there. Of course, we must not blame the whole Irish nation for the acts of a few men, but I am very sorry to hear the news, and hope it isn't true. End of section Oscar Wilde, The Montreal Daily Star, 15th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, The Arch Aesthete on Aestheticism. How the Movement Progresses in England. The Use of Fashion. Mr. Oscar Wilde arrived at the Windsor Hotel yesterday, where he very kindly received our reporter this morning. He was found amid the ruins of a substantial-looking breakfast, and there was nothing in his appearance to indicate that he had been sitting up all night with a lily, unless, indeed, the fact of his breakfasting late might suggest something of the sort. But then again, the fact of his breakfasting at all refutes such a supposition. Some of Mr. Wilde's critics, in addition to caricaturing his principles, have gone so far as to accuse him of affectation to an offensive degree, and as these statements have found their way into print, it is but the merest justice on the part of our representative to say that if affectation exists there, it is most artfully concealed, and therefore can scarcely be offensive. To the tap of the Ethiopian lily, who announced our representative, a remarkably musical voice replied, come in and as the door opened a tall well-built gentleman with a very pleasing countenance arose from the breakfast table and advanced with extended hand and a smile of welcome to receive his early visitor he was dressed in a delicate sage green velvet coat and light cloth continuations of the philistine order of architecture a red necktie blended well with his dark complexion which was thrown into striking relief by a profusion of long black hair surrounding it. The costume was decidedly indicative of good taste, and his movements, like his conversation, were easy and graceful. I am afraid, Mr. Wilde, that by this time you must look upon all newspaper men as a great nuisance, said our reporter apologetically. Not at all, was the hearty response. I am very pleased to see you. We have heard so much lately of asceticism, have seen it so abundantly caricatured, and really understand so little about it, that I am glad to have an opportunity of conversing with you on the subject. There is nothing I like talking about better. Do you think the aesthetic movement in England has arisen from a genuine appreciation of the principles you teach, or is the general adoption of aesthetic principles in decoration and dress a fashion in itself, one fashion being simply superseded by another? 
it is not a fashion at all it is a return to the right principles of art this movement has entirely altered the whole character of ordinary english decorations it would be impossible for any one now to furnish a house without reference to our principles of design and decoration not merely are the ordinary houses of london so embellished but when the government wanted to decorate st james's palace last year they at once gave the work to mr william morris one of the leaders of aestheticism you think then that this very general adoption of aesthetic principles has arisen entirely from a genuine appreciation i don't think any one adopts beauty out of consideration for fashion if a thing is beautiful one cannot help liking it people will adopt the bizarre for the sake of fashion but not the beautiful even if they did they would come to see it was beautiful after being with it for a time may i ask what is your conception of beauty in the last century people were fond of finding an abstract definition of beauty i am quite content to put that off for my old age if lovers of art have an old age do they die young then no but art is always youthful i am quite content if i am able to surround myself and others with beautiful things that is the difference between our aesthetics of this century and those of the last century the german philosophers of the last century were content to live in the midst of the most dreadful surroundings provided they could call beauty long names we want to produce beautiful things which is very much more practical it so happens that within the last two years fashion has been with us and as you suggested just now many people may have adopted our principles for fashion's sake but those principles will never leave them they educate the taste in colour for instance are english tastes improving in music the taste of the english people has enormously improved ten years ago the fashion happened to be for german music and consequently for good music now all the works of beethoven and the other great masters are loved and appreciated when you can bend fashion to the service of anything good or beautiful it is of immense importance what do you consider the principal element of beauty in music is it in association the charm of all art is founded entirely upon the senses one of the uses of art is to cultivate the senses the ears of people who do not often hear good music become very coarse they have not cultivated the sense of hearing a sense capable of infinite refinement one of the great faults of all the education of children is the trying to educate the mind when probably they haven't got one instead of trying to educate the senses which everybody has we all have eyes ears and hands but most people never use either eyes ears or hands any right theory of education it seems to me and by the way i want to write upon that subject must be founded on a principle of educating the mind not directly but through the means of the senses what universities have you here and what are they like i take great interest in universities everywhere our representative having briefly explained a few of the characteristics of the canadian universities and the educational system generally evoked several expressions of approval from mr wilde yes said he it is better for the country to have a good general standard of education than to have as we have in england a few desperately over-educated and the remainder ignorant one of the things which delighted me most in america was that the universities reached a class that we in oxford have never been able to touch the sons of the farmers and people of moderate means these are the people to whose wants the university should adapt its curriculum and expenses 
so that it should be able to reach them. Is not Gower Street, i.e. London University, a move in that direction? Yes, Gower Street and Owens College, Manchester, are a move in that direction. Really, half of any good that comes from university life comes from the indirect influences from fitting the boy to live by himself. It teaches him independence of mind, and common sense too. But under our system, it is possible for a young man to earn his living while obtaining his education. I do not think any university which does not require residence on the part of the undergraduates is anything more than a good day school. Mr. Wilde very much dislikes our bare walls, and called our reporter's attention to the white breakfast service, with the nearest approach to disgust he had yet exhibited. "'Do you recognise any primitive and intrinsic beauty in colour? asked our representative. "'Colour? It is the greatest enjoyment of my life, from the rising of the sun till the setting.' And this was the first and last time in the interview that he became enthusiastic or intense. His conversation was earnest, but practical and sensible. The arrival of a second visitor, many more being in the background, terminated a most agreeable interview. End of section Oscar Wilde in Montreal, Montreal Witness 15th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde in Montreal. The Apostle of Art in Our Midst. His Appearance. What He Has Done and Where He Has Been. Few men, at least of his age, have been so much talked about, and certainly none so much laughed at, as Oscar Wilde curiosity as to his personal appearance has been by no means abated by the many descriptions published for readers at once recognise the fact that in some cases the most vivid language is useless to convey a correct impression and oscar wilde has been considered a sufficiently unique personage to be one of those cases consequently when a witness reporter was ushered into the poet's room at the Windsor Hotel this morning, his personal as well as professional curiosity was somewhat disappointed to find no poet visible. He was there, however, and his apparent absence was only due to the tobacco smoke which hovered ethereally about his poetic form, and through which his countenance was presently revealed. Reclining in an armchair in the midst of anything but artistic, not to speak of aesthetic, surroundings, was the apostle of art and aestheticism. Mr. Wilde, as he rose and extended a large gentle hand to the visitor, showed to full advantage. Tall and well proportioned, his large figure was clad in graceful garments of soft homespun, the absence of knee-breeches and hose was at first a painful shock, but the effect was partly removed by a glance at the massive throat. The broad, turned-down collar was decidedly all but, while the aesthetic dull red necktie, baffling comprehension as to the manner of its putting on, can only be described as quite consummately too but attention could not remain long fixed on the attire. Mr. Wilde's face, surrounded and framed by a mass of long, untamed, tawny hair, is massive, almost colossal, and at the same time very pleasant in feature and expression, especially so far as the poetic eyes are concerned. But mere description, as was before hinted, is of necessity somewhat powerless. Mr. Wilde, who speaks with the accent generally credited to the higher class of London society, and by no means uncommon in the region of Pall Mall, showed no objection whatever to being interviewed, 
and kindly refrained from making any of those unpleasant remarks about journalists which his experience with them would seem to justify when asked what opinion he had formed of the probable results of his campaign he at once said that after all the nonsense written about him had been forgotten good and lasting results would remain in the cities where he had been decorative art societies had been started and old societies had been brought into more prominence his immense correspondence was entirely on this subject here said mr wilde is a letter only received this morning referring to the effect of my visit to philadelphia last week the letter was from charles leland the famous hans breitman and a member of the school thanking mr wilde for the good he had done in connection with the teaching of art principles to the young these results are being seen in the increase of orders given to the art societies mr wilde mentioned an incident which showed the way in which he was able to help on native art in chicago he came across a young american sculptor of really extraordinary power and genius but unknown he spoke about him and told the people that they could not really appreciate art if they neglected the native talent in their own city now that young sculptor has ever so many commissions the questioner asked how the british and americans compared in their reception of his teachings mr wilde could hardly give a definite answer in america you see i have for the first time been face to face with people who have never seen any good art as to their reception of what i say while no doubt many come to hear me just from curiosity yet afterwards i am continually getting letters from these people saying how they have been pleased with this or that point in my lectures the great thing is to get them to come for when they come they always see what i mean and said mr wilde what one really wants is not to be either blamed or praised but to be understood you have been all over the united states now have you not mr wilde i have been all over the states except in the south and i suppose though it is difficult to guess that i have spoken to some two hundred thousand people i have found the people very willing and ready to listen and appreciate mr wilde has been in california and is quite enthusiastic over it it is italy without art was his judgment of the hoodlum city only he objected to it being called the hoodlum city he said no it is the city of fine men and beautiful women san francisco has the most lovely surroundings of any city except naples i lectured there six times and had the most delightful and appreciative audiences people's appreciation of beauty depends so much on what they are accustomed to see around them it might be thought otherwise from those who live in beautiful places not speaking about beauty but they have no need to talk about it that is our object we want to see the homes of the people beautiful and where this is the case people will no longer talk of the beautiful at all we are forced to do so now because there are so many ugly things in the world in the ideal state of art there will be no art lecturer mr wilde went on to speak of the knowledge of art in the different countries england and america in england now we have the great advantage of models of art always with us in the cathedrals in the colleges of oxford and cambridge 
and in the many buildings of the finest architecture in america the great want is of absolute models of art the art which is learned from books is very worthless at best speaking of the aims of the movement with which he is identified mr wilde urged strongly that people should occupy a good deal more of their time with simple things it is all very well to devote time to little flower vases they do for ladies drawing-rooms but that is not touching the people it is the people we want to touch and this can only be done by beginning with simple things the least things every household article should be made beautiful and i had far rather that instead of designs for flower vases a good design should be produced for a simple jug and basin instead of the coarse pottery inartistic in colour and outline which is now common what do you think is the present position of the movement in england mr wilde well you may best understand that from the fact that mr morris has just received from government the contract for the decoration of st james's palace the movement is one that must be recognised we have already altered the condition of society in respect to art and no one will now furnish a house without having regard to art principles mr wilde said all this with a simplicity of language and manner and a hearty sincerity which were quite refreshing after the caricatures which we have sometimes been led to imagine were imitations of the arch aesthete during the whole conversation stained glass attitudes were conspicuously absent and languid lackadaisicality was also entirely wanting once indeed the lithe-limbed poet sank into a position recalling in a faint degree certain creations of de maurier's imagination and few could produce so aesthetic a yawn as once occurred in the intervals of puffing a cigarette but these were evidently too natural to suggest even the ghost of a smile to the most risible and when the visitor withdrew leaving oscar wilde to plunge again into the wisdom of mr shorthouse's sudden famed john inglesant he thought as he went that behind the closed door there reclined neither a postlethwaite a lambert strake nor a reginald bunthorne and that messrs de maurier bernand and gilbert had all done him a grave injustice End of section. a chat with oscar wilde canadian illustrated news twentieth of may eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain a chat with oscar wilde mr oscar wilde's lecture announced for tonight will unfortunately leave us insufficient time to notice it in this number mr wilde is however here and may deserve himself that recognition which must for the present at least be denied his lecture we have spoken before of mr wilde's antecedents and his objects it remains to say a few words about his personality with his appearance probably most of our readers are acquainted but what cannot be conveyed in a photograph is the manner of the man himself those who expect affectation and silliness of speech must be to judge from our own experience grievously disappointed in a man who acts and speaks simply as a gentleman of refined manners and accustomed to society moreover as a man to whom the study of mankind is man the man who is bored by others as mr wilde remarked must be a bore himself and the observation is a good gauge of his estimate of the interviewing with which during his american trip he has been largely favoured our own visit was made not exactly in an interviewing spirit but several hours spent in his company produced the impression recorded above 
of a courteous, clever Englishman, with distinct views of his own, but little spoilt by the flattery which might have turned a wiser man's head, but which he has been shrewd enough to use for what it is worth, and to lay aside its effects in the presence of men of the world. We talked but little of art, the subject in view of his lecture, perhaps a little of shop, certainly no extravagant ideas obtruded themselves upon a somewhat matter-of-fact conversation. Mr. Wilde expressed his delight with the States, as a country in which young men were so highly esteemed, a very true criticism, by the way, and especially noticeable to one who comes direct from the land par excellence of old fogeyism, where no man has a right, in the view of otherwise excellent people, to express any opinion at all before thirty. About the courtesy of all his audiences, Mr. Wilde is enthusiastic. He came to New York to speak and lecture for the first time in his life, and his audiences, with scarcely any exception, have treated him, he says, like an old friend. But the pleasantest feature of his tour seems to have been his visit to California. The country, the people, the climate are all, according to him, delightful, and certainly it is a fact not unworthy of record that in a city like San Francisco, Mr. Wilde should have been enabled to lecture ten times, at short intervals, and always to fair houses. A single lecture may attract many out of pure curiosity, but it says much for the San Franciscans, or for Mr. Wilde, or probably for both, that he should have been able to interest a people to whom art of any description is somewhat of a novelty, and that they should have been ready to go again and again to hear the great truths and principles of art by whomsoever expounded. Next week we trust to say something of the lecture itself, and the principles involved. For the present we can only wish Mr. Wilde a good audience, and his hearers a good lecture. End of section. From the Capital, the Globe, Toronto. 17th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From the Capital Ottawa, May 16th Oscar Wilde arrived in the city this morning and put up at the Russell House. This evening he delivered a lecture in the Opera House and afterwards paid a visit to the Parliament Buildings. Since arriving here he's been fairly besieged by autograph fiends and interviewers, but having become pretty well accustomed to this sort of thing, he treats it all in a business-like manner. He is easily approached, and apparently cultivates a listless, aesthetic sort of air, with a view to overawing the visitor. His most prominent exemplification of the aesthetic consisted in his long flowing hair, drab velvet coat, tie of red silk with flowing ends, and red stockings. Being asked how long he expected to remain in America, he said he contemplated visiting in July next that home of art, Japan. He will leave here tomorrow for Quebec, and will afterwards visit Montreal and Toronto. He thinks Montreal a glorious city, and was quite enthusiastic about it. Being asked his opinion of the frescoing in the French cathedral, he answered rather evasively, and said he did not admire the style. He apparently has not formed a very high idea of Canada from an artistic point of view, and wanted to know what we had been doing here all the time. He was somewhat surprised that the Princess Louise, who was such an admirer of art, had not accomplished greater results. He had found a very nice art gallery in Montreal, and had been particularly pleased with one painting which he named. He is evidently not deeply versed in Canadian politics. He had heard that there was a good deal of talk here about free trade and protection, and said the word illegible questions were exerting a good deal of attention in England. He asked who the leaders of the respective political parties were, and who were our best debaters, and felt rather disappointed at hearing that he had appeared rather too late on the scene to see Parliament to advantage. He imagined that the Canadian North-West must be a fine country. 
he had been much pleased with what he'd seen of the scenery about ottawa and fancied that it would be a nice place in summer time of all parts of the united states colorado and california had pleased him most being asked what he thought of art across the lines he said he had not expected much as america had contributed nothing to european art but a younger school was coming up which was valued not so much for what it had accomplished as for what it promised he had been pleased with the large audiences which greeted him in small towns in the united states and with the attentive manner in which his lectures had been listened to he found the masses on this continent better educated than in england and attributes the fact to our university systems which permitted farmers sons and other classes which english universities did not reach receiving a higher education he also thoroughly approved of the co-education of the sexes what he most disapproved in connection with america was the ignoring of art by the churches and he regarded it as utterly impossible for this reason that they should succeed they required something which would appeal to the emotions and imaginations of the people oscar was introduced to a large number of persons in the speakers rooms and afterwards occupied a seat on the floor of the house near the speaker's chair while the senate amendments to the redistribution bill were being discussed he was attired as at the lecture in a suit of black velvet knickerbocker trousers black silk stockings and lace cuffs and tie and was the subject of a good deal of attention End of section. Jottings from Ottawa, the Montreal Daily Star, 17th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jottings from Ottawa. Nearing the End, A Graceful Tribute, Niagara Falls, The Northwest, Manitoba Better Terms, The Readjustment Bill, oscar wilde special dispatch to the star ottawa may seventeenth in a short interview which i had with oscar wilde today the great east said he was going from america to japan i shall go said he by way of san francisco about the end of july japan is the most artistic country in the world the home of art i shall enjoy myself there so much and he smiled a supremely happy smile in anticipation i like montreal he said in answer to a question and later he remarked quite gushingly oh indeed it is a glorious city it was glorious to stand on the mountain and looking down over the city see that grand broad river flowing along to the horizon i found much that was beautiful there did you find much art there well yes with a shrug i was in the art gallery i saw one good picture one very fine picture were you in any of the churches i was in the french church he answered but he volunteered no opinion being pressed as to what he thought of it he said he thought its colours were healthy did you find as fine a class of art in the united states as you expected well i did not expect anything i make it a point he added never to expect anything and you were not disappointed in this case well no i don't know that i was they are progressing rapidly though they seem to take a wonderful interest in the beautiful the poet then went on making numerous inquiries concerning the politics and political men of canada he came down from the subject of the beautiful for a minute and talked of protection and free trade and made the assertion that the feeling for fair trade was growing fast in england he intended he said later on to visit rideau hall before he left ottawa End of section. oscar wilde on decorative art the daily news kingston 23rd of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde on Decorative Art Oscar Wilde interviewed. 
oscar wilde was visited at his room in the hotel this morning and was found smoking a cigarette after having completed a breakfast which was not composed of poppies and lilies in private conversation he displays an easy good-natured affability and a rich poetical vein of discourse which is quite charming on being asked whether he had been much bored in america by philistines in the semblance of newspaper men he replied that he had never been bored in his life and he thought that none but bores could be bored he took an interest in everything that he saw or heard and delighted to talk with all sorts of people upon topics concerning which they possessed any knowledge of which they appreciated he thought it would be an immeasurable advantage if people would not attempt to carry on general conversation for which few had a gift proceeding he said he regretted that the wet weather had left him such a small house although his audience had been appreciative wendell phillips once told him that any man could speak well to a crowd but it required a mighty effort to thrill empty benches and he had found this true in his own experience he could not say that he had been pleased in his american travels but he did not come to be pleased the eastern cities were immensely dreary and ugly in winter but the delicious atmosphere luxurious flowers and lovely scenery of california had captivated him greatly the st lawrence and ottawa rivers struck him as glorious tides and he meant all he said about their pollution the public he thought should compel manufacturers to consume their own smoke make use of their sawdust and discharge their effluvia somewhere else than into the beautiful rivers or the life-giving atmosphere ruskin had induced manchester to stop similar pollution if the worst came to the worst he would advise the people of any city to choose pure elements in preference to manufactures on a verse of keats being suggested as the creed of aestheticism mr wilde said that he did not bother himself about metaphysics but wished to interest people in the employment of honesty and beautiful ideas in handicrafts he thought that such a town as kingston should have a public library and night classes where drawing would be taught one man in every four who attended would be found to possess considerable artistic talent on being informed that there was a mechanics institute here he exhibited much interest and expressed a desire to visit the rooms he gave some interesting opinions of newspapers saying among other things that gossiping might be reduced to a fine art as had been done by madame de recamier and others and that if newspapers were conducted in the proper way they would be the garner houses from which future historians would draw their material end of section oscar wilde toronto evening news 25th of may 1882 this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde sir coming up from the capital yesterday when seated at breakfast in a far from aesthetic mood who should be seated next to me but the renowned apostle of the beautiful mr oscar wilde trusting to the freemasonry of sympathetic ideas i introduced myself as the friend of the late m blank one of the most gifted art critics of this generation and the joint author with him of certain sketches of the old masters we are at once en rapport and i found that i had by this allusion as the prophet in the wilderness by his rod made the waters to gush out touched a copious spring of highly cultured intelligence philosophical reflection and acute criticism both humorous and eloquent mr wilde is a brilliant conversationalist a happy one in all senses for he can listen as well as he can talk and he can talk so that listening to his tongue even to the garrulous becomes more pleasant than to listen to their own 
well, although I am not garrulous, I can prevent talk dropping into silence, and I listened yesterday morning to the only conversation worthy the name which I have had the privilege to share in since leaving England many years ago. For, unhappily here, we cannot find anything to chat over save the virtues of our party and the wickedness of the opposite one, which is not a sufficiently varied theme to monopolise all one's lingual social capacity or mental sympathies. To my mind, one of the greatest disadvantages of life in Canada is the blank, the utter blank, of the charm of intellectual gossip. My talk with Mr. Wilde took me out of the dust and smoke and clatter of a noisy, monotonous street, into the heart of the country, rich in woodland beauty, redolent of floral sweetness, and soothing to the tired brain as a mother's lullaby to her child. We talked of art, of its present aspects here and at home, of art culture, of art schools, and their work and failures and needs. I told Mr. Wilde that years ago I had ventured to lay down as the glaring defect of all Canadian pictures, that they showed an entire want of the power of drawing with exactitude any living forms, trees or animals. This he earnestly and almost passionately approved. Art, said he, is not looked upon as an exact science, as it should be. There can be no art without truth of form, and no beauty can exist where it is falsehood in drawing or colour. He then went on very suggestively, and with a delicacy of allusion to my own expressions which indicated the refinement of high breeding, for Mr. Wilde is a gentleman to the core, to insist that no appreciation of form or capacity to express it in any aspect, figure, drawing or architecture, can, unless there is in the draftsman a keen, clear, pure conception and vivid sense of the charm and value of colour. A position which, though it will be caviar to the general, and not acceptable to many artists and architects, is, I believe, demonstrable. He heartily sympathised with this, and pushed to a humorous conclusion my ridicule of the ordinary methods of teaching in so-called art schools, their uselessness, their chilling and repressing effect upon the young. We then struck off at a tangent into a discussion as to the relative merits of Thackeray and Dickens, in which Mr. Wilde displayed for so young a man, a remarkable familiarity with the whole field of fictional literature. He condemned freely the historical novels of Scott, as in the conversations of the characters, stilted and unnatural. He placed Bulwer's historical romances on a lower level still, and in doing so used a phrase which is worth quoting. Romance, said he, what is it but humanity in its nobler, finer phases? To be truly romantic, therefore, is not to be unnatural, for that is to be false to nature, but it is to take human life into a higher expression and mood. Back again to art, we discussed the prevailing bad work done by artisans, the craze for cheap work, and its results in degrading work and workers. His vehement condemnation of the preference given by young men for such occupations as clerks in stores, or any similar work, over handicrafts, was to me most refreshing, as sweet indeed to hear as the red-hot gospel of a revivalist's thunder is to the religious fanatic. Here we struck upon a vein of reflection which the so-called working classes, that is, handicraftsmen, will have to work before their social emancipation day dawns, their freedom from a ban which nowadays settles upon them, chiefly as the result of their own want of respect for their occupations. Mr. Wilde, 
with much fire and with graphic illustrations, touched upon the artistic aspect, and claims to our treatment of the ordinary artisan's work. To be done well, said he, work must be done truly, and done with truth, it becomes artistic. This element of faithfulness is the only power able to raise labour into honour. The thought is, of course, not original, but how few, how very few, see clearly wherein really consists the difference between work worthy of being respected, and which will bring respect to the worker, and work which is not respected, work of which the doer is made to feel that the very doing of it is, in a sense, a degradation. In a word, I found Mr. Oscar Wilde a man of high, useful capacity, wide reading and observation, clear-headed, practical in his views as to the relation of worthy ends to fitting means to attain them, with deep earnest sympathies with the socially depressed, and an almost passionate longing for the spread of refined tastes and habits among the humbler classes. An enthusiast, doubtless, but enthusiasm has done every good work yet done in this world, and one, in spite of some eccentricities, for all enthusiasts have been eccentric, is doing, and will yet do, I believe and hope, a thoroughly good work in that sphere to which he deems himself called, the sphere of art reformer and teacher. John Haig End of section Oscar Wilde, The Globe, Toronto, 25th of May, 1882 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde Arrival of the Apostle of Aestheticism in Toronto. What he thinks of La Crosse. His opinion of Toronto and Toronto ladies. Mr. Oscar Wilde arrived in the city yesterday morning on the Grand Trunk Express from the east. A deputation of gentlemen belonging to the city was at the station to receive him and escort him to the Queen's Hotel. By previous engagement, he attended the lacrosse match between the Torontos and St. Regis Indians in the afternoon. He arrived on the grounds a few minutes before the game commenced, and when the grandstand and other available seats were densely packed. As he passed through the gate, someone shouted, "'Here's Oscar Wilde!' The intelligence soon passed along the rows of seated spectators, and all eyes were at once strained to catch a glimpse of him. The juveniles were inclined to be boisterous at first, but they soon ceased their shouting, as Mr. Wilde appeared not even to notice their demonstrations. He was escorted to the space on the grandstand reserved for the lieutenant governor, where he was introduced to Miss Robinson and a lady friend. Without noticing the sensation his arrival had created, he reclined his head gracefully on his hand, assumed the aesthetic attitude, and gazed earnestly into the field where the teams were preparing for the fight. He was dressed in a grey tweed pair of trousers and cobweb-coloured velveteen coat and vest. His necktie was a dark green in colour, tied loosely around his neck and covering his shirt front. He wore a handkerchief to match. He had a flowing coat with a deep velvet collar and secured to his form by a tassellated cord which passed across his chest. He wore a black felt hat of unusual proportions. The earnest or intense expression of his almost feminine face, his long flowing hair, and his tall handsome figure and graceful movements gave him a striking appearance, producing immediately a favourable impression. When the game was started, he evinced the most lively interest, and as it progressed, his enthusiasm seemed to keep pace with the players, for he laughed heartily when any of them went unceremoniously to grass, or clapped his hands when a good piece of play was done. He left the field shortly before the match was completed. 
on being asked by a globe representative how he enjoyed the match mr wilde said oh i was delighted with it it is a charming game that was the first opportunity i ever had of witnessing your national game and i enjoyed it so much but can you tell me who that tall finely built man that played defence for the torontos is broke off mr wilde that's ross mackenzie one of the best lacrosse players in canada i admired his playing so very much said mr wilde he appeared so thoroughly at home in the game lacrosse is so far ahead of cricket for physical development and then every one seems to get an equal share of the play or hard work as i should term it but don't you think mr wilde asked that the indians or at least the indian umpire should have been dressed in a manner to impress one with the position he occupied i think he should have been dressed say in war costume with his face painted armed with a tomahawk and wearing a head-dress of feathers i was greatly amused at the gesticulations of the indians and i wondered what language they were speaking after asking some questions about the indians and the origin of the game mr wilde said he was much pleased with the appearance and dress of many persons he had seen on the ground and he continued i could not help admiring the dress of a little girl who sat in front of me it was charming such a beautiful blending of colour that corresponded so nicely with her rosy cheeks what is your opinion of toronto and toronto ladies mr wilde i have seen so little of the former that i have scarcely formed an opinion but i judge from the appearance of your principal business street that it is a bright little town and i have no doubt it is a commercial centre but i cannot help wondering why your citizens build their houses with that horrid white brick when red brick is the same price i think white brick such a shallow colour in fact it spoils the effect of the architecture i see the same fault here that i noticed in all canadian cities the colour of the stone and other building material completely spoils the effect of the good architecture which i could not help admiring in canadian cities as to the ladies i think some of them are very nice and dress exceedingly well but i will have a better opportunity of judging hereafter i am gratified sometimes to see the monotony of an audience relieved by the presence of at least one well-dressed lady End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Toronto World, 25th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. Arrival in town. Attends the lacrosse match. Besieged with invitations. Oscar Wilde arrived yesterday forenoon on the GTR from the east. He was dressed in a slate-coloured suit of corded goods, blue silk tie with silk handkerchief to match. He wore an immense slouched hat. There were lots of people down to meet him, among them Mr. Patrick Boyle, the genial editor of the Irish Canadian. Rushing up to his aesthetic countryman, Mr. Boyle said, Mr. Wilde, I welcome you to Toronto on behalf of our Irish citizens. Mr. Wilde thanked Mr. Boyle, and expressed a desire to see the Irish Canadian which contained his own portrait and that of his illustrious mother. Oscar put up at the Queen's, took a drive round the city, visited the lacrosse match, dined at the Toronto Club, received a crowd of invitations, allowed himself to be interviewed, and generally put in a busy day. At the lacrosse grounds he was received with cheers and viewed the match in the company of the Lieutenant Governor's family, speaking to a world reporter he said he enjoyed the lacrosse exhibition and considered it an interesting and exciting game 
he thought however the picturesqueness of the spectacle would be enhanced if the indians wore more of their natural dress oscar admired the dress of the toronto ladies and was especially struck on the array of a little girl in print trimmed with embroidery looking around toronto he said he was struck with its wide regular streets but you should not build with white brick it is not in good taste but if your bricks won't burn any colour but white what can you do he did not like montreal with its narrow streets he was half a day in finding a bookstore quebec he considered looked like a small english town the ladies of the ancient capital came in for high praise for their taste in dress oscar will look around the city further to-day and lecture in his knee-breeches at the grand to-night where a big house is sure to greet him speaking of newspapers he said the world was the most artistic in its typographical arrangement of any he had yet seen in canada End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Toronto Daily Mail, 25th of May, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. The Apostle of Aestheticism arrives in Toronto, and is forthwith interviewed. Mr. Wilde was enjoying with a friend what he termed an afternoon tea, when he received a representative of the mail. The reporter excused himself for appearing at so inopportune a time, but Mr. Wilde hastened to assure him that he was quite at leisure. "'Afternoon teas are a custom with me,' he said, "'and the tea in Canada is very fine.' The reporter hoped that he had found other very fine things in Canada beside the tea. "'Oh, yes,' was the reply, with a smile. "'The cigarettes.' as both the articles mentioned were imported the interviewer did not consider that any great compliment had been paid to canada and so he remarked well continued mr wilde your rivers are very beautiful and your cities are so finely situated quebec especially has a noble situation and i was sorry to see that there was so little life or spirit in it the reporter acknowledged that the Canadian rivers had all that was necessary in length, breadth, and depth, and, referring to the illegible word, statement, said he did not think Toronto had any particular reason to boast of its sight. "'The country is certainly rather flatter than what I have hitherto seen,' admitted the young poet. "'But with this beautiful lake in front, the city is not void of peculiar advantages.' After a few more words about the size and beauties of Lake Ontario, Mr. Wilde referred to his disappointment in not yet having the opportunity of passing through the Thousand Islands, a trip he was anxious to make. He next alluded to the lacrosse match in the afternoon, of which he had been a spectator. He thought it was full of graceful movements and hard knocks. He was pleased to learn that the Torontos had won the match, because, not having waited for the conclusion of the match, he thought the Indians were going to win. "'How did you drift into the movement of which you were the leader?' asked the reporter. "'No man can drift into a movement,' corrected Mr. Wilde. "'He makes the movement. A man cannot drift into anything unless it might be the Niagara. I will tell you how the movement originated.' He then went on to state that Oxford was the first really beautiful city he had ever visited, and he was as much impressed with the value of beauty to a city as to anything else. Ideas formed in connection with the subject led to the organisation of a society of young men in the interests of art. It was in art that the ancient nations of Greece and Rome still lived. Venice was still queen of the sea, although there was no longer a galley in her port, but the works of the great painters filled her galleries. Mr. Wilde then spoke of his plans for the immediate future. He intended, after concluding his lecture season in this country, to sail from San Francisco for Japan, as he desired to study Japanese art, and consequently the date of his return to England is not yet fixed. It is unnecessary to describe Mr. Wilde's personal appearance, as it is now well known to all readers of the daily press. 
it will suffice to say that in the generally accepted sense of the word he is about as unesthetic looking a man as it is possible for a six-footer of his proportions to be he is only twenty-six years of age end of section aestheticism's apostle toronto evening news twenty fifth of may eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain aestheticism's apostle what oscar is doing his visits about the city and his opinion of the ladies mr wilde kept pretty closely in his room at the queen's hotel to-day he takes his meals in his room shortly after noon on the invitation of the society of artists the apostle visited the exhibition of paintings in the society's rooms on king street the rooms were seldom so densely crowded since were opened as they were at the moment the aesthete stepped into the room he is certainly a striking figure but the fact that he wore a pair of light inexpressibles instead of the knee-breeches with which his name is so much associated seemed to prove rather a disappointment his hair is abundantly long his manner is dignified his voice is soft and his speech that of the english aristocrat he wore a garment over all which may be described as a toga slung across his shoulders with a cord in the manner of the cloak of a french marshal on arriving he was introduced by his agent to mr martin and the other artists who were present he has certainly a fine face of effeminate cast his smile is sweetness and light itself after the introductions he addressed himself to inspecting the pictures he was quite free in his criticisms singling out both beauties and defects mr martin who acted as cicerone had to stand by and hear praise lavished on more than one of his own pictures but mr h r watson's paintings took mr wilde's fancy most he expressed great surprise when he learned the artist's age and that he had never been to paris he has the exact manner of the modern french artists mr wilde afterwards went to the university in company with professor pike who is a college mate in conversation with the reporter oscar said that he approved of the outward designs of the canadian architects but in most instances the interior colouring was bad in reply to a question as to whether he did not think the toronto ladies the handsomest in the world he said that the ladies of every town he had been in were the handsomest in the world it may be mentioned incidentally that the sale of reserved seats warrants the belief that there will not be standing room at the grand tonight end of section oscar wilde again rochester democrat and chronicle first of june eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde again an interview with the aesthete on a car platform last night as the second atlantic express rolled into the station in this city a representative of this journal espied the gentleman aesthete oscar wilde upon the platform of a palace coach a bombardment of questions elicited the following facts in regard to his western tour i have said mr wilde been warmly entertained at every place in which i have lectured and all in all my trip through the western states of your country has been a success and a pleasure to myself i am now on my way to boston where i lecture on friday night from there i go to new orleans and thence again to california where i sail for japan there i intend to study japanese art my western trip has given me the first idea i ever had of the greatness of the united states california i love i regard it as a perfect facsimile of italy though of course it hasn't the art of the latter the rocky mountains and the snow-capped peaks of colorado are among the most beautiful pieces of scenic grandeur i have beheld 
they are most beautiful the rivers of canada are the finest of your country and i consider the situation of quebec finer than any city of america my visit to toronto was very pleasant i delivered two lectures in that city and enjoyed myself immensely during the interview the poet scholar asked good-naturedly after the students of the university he said he never allowed students nonsense to trouble him and after lighting a dainty cigarette added throughout my country and yours until i was insulted in rochester i was always treated as a gentleman but smilingly he added i presume when i deliver my next lecture in your city i will be treated as a gentleman and not as the butt of a powerless joke oh then you contemplate visiting us again asked the interviewer yes i shall return from japan to america and on my way through to san francisco i am thinking of delivering lectures upon japanese art and the artistic side of japanese life i shall then hope to visit you again in japan he said even the simplest utensil of the household is made beautiful and he wished it might be so all over the world after the reporter's questions and the poet's answers as well were well nigh run out and there was danger of a disagreeable lull in the conversation mr wilde kindly interested himself in rochester journalism and asked how many dailies the city afforded when told that we gloried in eight he was indeed surprised and asked after a copy of one he was supplied and soon the locomotive gave its double toot and the gentleman was whirled on towards boston the city of his delight end of section oscar wilde the boston herald second of june eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde the poet revisits boston after his western tour art in canada and some young american artists impressions of the west and the western people oscar wilde arrived at the vendome from canada yesterday morning when a herald representative called upon him later in the forenoon mr wilde was costumed in a pearl grey velvet jacket a flowing green tie canada grey trousers patent leather pumps and scarlet hose he was both picturesque and charming mr wilde had just returned from a lecture tour in canada and it was but natural that the conversation should turn upon the dominion and its people canada said the poet is distinctively a land of noble rivers away from the rivers the scenery is pastoral its cities are nobly situated quebec reminds me of athens with its high rock and purple hills ottawa the capital city is beautifully situated over a great rushing yellow river montreal is on a sheet of water and water and ships are always graceful i never saw an ugly ship i was particularly struck in canada as compared with the states with the want of any real rush of life the cities are wonderfully quiet the streets of quebec reminded me of a little village in brittany how did you like the parliament buildings at ottawa in proportion and in design they were extremely beautiful and most delicately proportioned where they fail and where all the public buildings in canada fail is in monotony of colour the only stone they have is a red granite now a building should please one by its colour as do the old buildings at venice where lines of coloured stone are used decoratively the university of toronto is one of the most beautiful buildings in canada has canada any distinctively national art i do not think that a country can have a national art until it feels two things perfect independence and absolute unity canada up to this time has not yet realized itself to begin with there are two nations the french and the english in many cases absolutely distinct then they have not developed the west of canada and consequently there has not come to them as there has to you 
the rush of fresh life. There has not been experienced that backward wave of newer, fresher life which you have had in America. But Canada must have individual artists of merit. Oh, yes. In Toronto I found a young landscape painter, Mr. Watson, a most remarkable man. He has never been to Europe, but he has wonderful mastery over tone and colour. His work in greys is exquisite. They have also a young sculptor, Mr. Dunbar, who has done one or two beautiful things. At Ottawa they have a very good school of art. I call it a good school because they have the absolute essential of a school, which is a life class. Unless a school has that, it will never bring out anything good in a pupil. As long as the pupils draw from castes, there will be the coldness of death in their work. If the Princess Louise had stayed in Canada, she would have had a very remarkable influence on Canadian art, but her stay was too short. But I must say that there is in Canada a great deal of growing feeling in art. I had there most interesting and intellectual audiences, in no city more than in Toronto, where I lectured twice. Mr. Wilde then passed on to pay a charming compliment to Mr. Howells. He said, There is one perfect guidebook to Canada. I know of nothing which can serve so well for Quebec as Mr. Howells' chance acquaintance. The whole account of Quebec and Canada is most exquisite. I thought on reading Mr. Howells' book how wrong it is to leave the writing of guidebooks to commonplace people. Most guidebooks are dreadful. You have been to California since you last visited Boston. Yes, I enjoyed myself greatly there. I think the future of America will lie in great measure with the West. Not merely is the country most noble, California being an Italy without its art, but the physique of the men and women is particularly splendid in California and in Colorado. They are the most courteous people, I lectured at a city which is supposed to be the roughest city in the United States, and that is Leadville, on the top of the Rocky Mountains. My audience was almost entirely composed of miners. I lectured to them on the workers in metal. I told them, as simply as I could, of all the wonderful things men had made out of gold and silver, brass and copper and the like, and nothing could have been more delightful than their courtesy, or more wonderful than their interest. They came around after my lecture and asked me to sup with them in one of their great silver mines, the mine called the Matchless Mine. I spent my whole night in the silver mine with them, and I rank it as one of the golden memories of my life. No one could have had more delightful companions. I saw that most of these miners were strong, simple, handsome fellows. In the whole West I had only one stupid audience, and that was at Salt Lake City, and I was not sorry that they were so, because so much depends upon our admiration of physical beauty in others. They had the most ignoble physique. They come, you know, from the ugliest peoples in Europe, the Welsh and the Swedes. The president of the Mormons, Mr. Taylor, was very charming, a man of a great deal of refinement. He came to my lecture and occupied a stage box with his five wives, but the faces of my audience were heavy, dull, and common. You visited Denver? Yes, Denver is a remarkable city. I went through Kansas to Missouri, where I had the opportunity of seeing a certain value placed on art. I was in the city of St. Joe when the effects of that picturesque brigand, Jesse James, were being sold at auction. A dustpan was knocked down to a millionaire, and the chromolithograph that he was in the act of nailing up when he was shot commanded a price which, in London or in Paris, only an authentic Titian could command. And did you go to Chicago? Yes, Chicago interested me very much, because I found there a young sculptor who has an artistic power and a sense of beauty which are unequalled by any young sculptor of his age in France or England. His name is Mr. Donoghue. 
when i arrived at chicago i found waiting for me at the hotel a package containing a little bas-relief in clay of a seated girl with a verse from my own poems graven on the side and a letter from the artist asking me to accept it the delicacy of the work was so great and the whole feeling for beauty so rare that early next morning i went to find the artist and in a little garret in the top of one of the great business blocks of chicago i found a young man working away modelling the artist of this bas-relief he had in his studio a little statuette of a boy dancing which has more of the real greek feeling in it than any work i have seen by any young man in europe i was so filled with wonder at finding in a great new commercial city this young sculptor whose sense of beauty was so exquisite as if he were the last of a long line of italian artists that i spoke about him in my lecture and to everybody whom i met in chicago society and since that they are i am glad to say taking much more notice of him giving him commissions which he wanted very badly on my return from california he came to dine with me and brought with him a large bronze bas-relief of two children which he had done for one of the rich chicago merchants of his splendid future i feel quite assured at cincinnati i found in the art school a young designer with a real mastery over design about whom i was able to speak in my lecture also at san francisco there is a whole colony of excellent painters among them a pupil of mr f duvenek indeed there was hardly a city of any size that i visited in which there was not at least one young man working finely in art how does provincial art in england compare with provincial art in the united states in england you know there is no such thing as england there is london we concentrate into one city all that is intellectual in men and all that is beautiful in women and we have changed england into this great city in america you have spread your artistic power over a whole continent so though it fails enormously in concentration it gains in width here the conversation turned upon the suppression of walt whitman's leaves of grass by the legal authorities of the state mr wilde a warm friend of the good grey poet chivalrously defended the persecuted bard i heard of that he said through the canadian papers i think it will be a lasting stain on america if this thing continues the man walt whitman is one of the noblest and purest men i ever met i know no man in america who touched me more through the dignity and self-sacrifice of his life and through the simplicity and wisdom of his mind i cannot believe that any one who reads the prose preface of his leaves of grass mr wilde must have had in mind an earlier edition than the one suppressed in massachusetts which had no preface although earlier editions did have could fail to reverence and to honour him for creed of life there is nothing more noble besides it should be remembered that the man is to be read as a whole you must isolate no line from his context no great book or no great poem could stand such a method of criticism one must realise him as a whole and one must really give up the modern habit of trying to measure giants with a foot rule the public don't see in general how that no artist neither desires praise nor will accept blame he merely wishes one thing and that is merely to be understood if one understands walt whitman one will reverence him if one does not understand him one should say nothing about him but in no case should one dare to praise or blame him in fifty years walt whitman will have taken his place as one of the greatest writers that america has ever produced in a letter which i had lately from mr swinburne he said with reference to walt whitman and i think it was a very just criticism whenever he writes on the noblest subjects he writes nobly some of whitman's finest and most modern lines have been inspired by machinery his description of a locomotive in action for instance true i have never seen any machinery that has not been graceful 
the most beautiful machinery i ever saw was at chicago i never was so struck by the contrast between the ugliness of bad art and the beauty and utility of strength till i visited the waterworks at chicago they have built an imitation gothic fortress stuck over with ridiculous pepper boxes that they call turrets the most foolish building that i ever saw a mere architectural monstrosity one of the many unpunished crimes of that great city but inside was this noble and wonderful machinery the stately orbit of the circling wheels the rhythmic rise and fall of the long rods of polished steel something to me as beautiful as anything undecorated i ever saw the line of strength must be the line of beauty a man hauling a rope hauls it straight if he does it gracefully if he does it clumsily he is hauling it crooked there was nothing particularly graceful about the politicians at ottawa but the raftmen who were bringing wood down the river were some of them as noble as if they had stepped off a frieze on the parthenon there was a miner at leadville who was driving a new gallery and at any moment this man could have become marble or bronze and have been noble for eternity after his lecture here this afternoon mr wilde goes to new york and thence to the south for a lecture tour to extend through june he is desirous of visiting new orleans where a deceased uncle formerly lived he anticipates much pleasure from meeting the warm-hearted southrons and in reply to the suggestion that on leaving the united states he would go home to old england he said with a laugh oh no i shall first visit japan the most artistic country in the world end of section the town tatler from the free trader and journal of progress seventeenth of june eighteen eighty two this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Town Tatler When Oscar Wilde first landed in America, he was one of the best advertised men on the continent. The New York Herald devoted several columns to the advertising of this new messiah. The Sun and World took up the strain, and in due course of the mails, all papers followed this is the secret of his wonderful monetary success as a lecturer not that he has no merit wilde is a shrewd man behind that simpering smile and affected manner of his is concealed a profound knowledge of human nature oscar wilde's mannerisms on the stage are exaggerated for a purpose he claims to be so young and proves that he is by his lack of training in lecturing his delivery is wretched he makes no pauses but rushes on to the end of his discourse without a period or even so much as a comma thrown between his sentences to relieve the monotonous liquid flow of syllables his gestures are limited to a wave of one hand he fails to emphasize any word and does not hesitate to elaborate an extensive parenthetical clause thus breaking the thread of his discourse and straining the attention of his hearers the present reputation of mr wilde as a lecturer is without doubt ephemeral but there is some body to the man's thoughts and in time we trust he will gain a permanent reputation akin to his master ruskin but this will require hard work he should put himself under an elocutionist should strive to conquer his awkwardness on the stage and drop that provincialism of speech which leads him to say vases for vases and to draw out all his a's however much i was disappointed with mr wilde as a lecturer as a conversationalist i was delighted in an interview at gaston's hotel i found him just after his eleven o'clock breakfast smoking long english cigarettes such as la Boucherre of the london truth was so fond of his room was in disorder photographs scattered all over the floor flowers laying on the table a lot of uncut french books and novels here and there one laying open on the bed and another at his feet on the floor mr wilde was dressed in a very becoming grey velvet jacket 
and a pair of fashionably cut light grey pants, not knee breeches. Low quartered shoes, very much pointed, and red silk hose. He wore a large light blue silk cravat, its folds drooping over his chest, hiding his shirt. He smoked cigarettes constantly, a half a dozen in the course of the interview. What feature of the South impressed you most favourably, Mr. Wilde? Ah, uh, I uh, think the trees and the negroes are the most striking points of the South. The forests are so grand and beautiful. Nature seems to be unlimited here. In England, the face of our land is moulded into a series of beautiful gardens, which unfold a picture from whatever point we may observe it. I think the negroes, with their swarthy complexions and crude countenances, lend a shade to the bright lines of the southern picture. Oh, I so much wish I had a pretty little darky, with his red lips and shining countenance, to sit in the corner of my room like one of those old curious Indian bronzes. Would the word pretty apply to a little darky? Oh, no, not in the sense you mean, but they are pretty in the sense that they are curious and quaint and charm the eye, just as my antique blockhouse from India. I wonder what the Negroes think of life. I have a mind to stop one on the street and ask him his impressions. Are they religious? The Negro, as far as I have observed, thinks more of cornbread and bacon than anything else. In summer time he is fond of cabbage and greens. Did you ever eat any greens, Mr. Wilde? Oh, uh, what are greens? Be so good as to explain. Greens? I sententiously replied, are a national dish. They belong to the natural order Cruciferi, and their cotyledons are conduplicate. They are generally boiled with hog meat and served up with vinegar. You are so kind, I thank you. I must taste some before I leave. But you have only answered part of my question. Have the Negroes faith? For this is a most faith-bearing age. We have faith in everything. The philosophers are faithful to their creeds. Ruskin and I have faith in art. Frederick Harrison and Spencer have faith in humanity. Tennyson has faith in the beautiful. Even Voltaire had faith in God. When one speaks like Schopenhauer of no faith, of perfect blankness, I cannot understand him. I know not what he means. That old landmark of the ages, the Catholic Church, is founded on faith, and grows today because of its wonderful faith. Are there many Negro Catholics? In New Orleans there are some. As a rule, they are inclined to that church which permits of a congregational worship. They are very emotional, and prefer the Baptist and Methodist churches, where they can join in singing, shout, and give their experience. Here the conversation was interrupted by a procession of negroes parading the streets, headed by a brass band. Ah, there is happiness for them, cried Mr. Wilde. Fond of music, show, and eating. It will take two centuries to bring them up to the realisation of the truly beautiful in this world. Are the English masses in any better condition? I can't say, but the English thinkers, divided into two great classes, are rapidly changing the habits and thoughts of the masses. There is the school of scientists, who study the utilitarian and decry the soul. How foolish! The scientist, in describing the Venus de Milos, will say that it is a block of marble composed of so many grains of silica, lime, water, and so forth, and that this is cut into certain curves making up the statue. But this is not the Venus. This is not explaining the thing which speaks to the soul and elevates the thought. Only the philosophy of the beautiful can do this. 
i belong to the other class small but growing which teaches that the beautiful springs from the soul in which class would you place carlyle spencer huxley harrison ruskin and buckle carlyle is a titan to himself an amorphous mess in literature hurling his bolts at every person and everything i have studied spencer's philosophy and really do not think much of it it tells me nothing about the finer perceptions of man's nature about his soul huxley is the same harrison's faith in humanity is optimistic he deals in persons and ignores things ruskin is a truer interpreter of nature he is a poet painter and understands the finer harmonies of the soul buckle is a great teacher of our philosophy decorative art is nothing more than a section of the philosophy of the environment taught so eloquently by buckle this man with an unparalleled industry collected many facts for his history of civilization in england and made it one of the seminal books of the century i teach that wherever the eye lights there should be an object of beauty to give impulse and joy to the soul buckle teaches that our history as individuals as a tribe and a nation is the result of the surroundings which impress themselves into the very innermost germs of our nature making the english and germans phlegmatic as a race the italians and spaniards frivolous and volatile noticing an uncut copy of the criticisms of saint beuve lying on the table covered with flowers perfumed notes and cigarette ashes i asked mr wilde if the english approached the french in critical ability saint beuve was the prince of critics he was a poet only poets can criticise they create they build and those who create are the only persons able to explain the manner of creation a man cannot criticise a painting unless he understands the art this is the secret of ruskin's success what a critic shakespeare would have made the only critics now living worthy of the title is swinburne of england and hugo of france while it is true that only a poet can be a critic not all poets are critics your own poe was a messiah in a barren land he came he taught america learned for the first time the essence of noble and lofty criticism can you give me the address of mr jefferson davis said mr wilde he is one man i wish to see before i leave for japan how i wished his book was not so long had he compressed an edition for england it would have done him far more good i read it with immense pleasure i never could understand why john stuart mill sympathised with the north in the war lord beaconsfield favoured the north because he always advocated empire but mill was for the people hence the strangeness of his conduct i sympathised with the south for i thought that if the colonies had a right to secede in seventeen seventy six the southern states had a similar right in eighteen sixty when lincoln emancipated the negroes the english who had spent many millions of pounds on freeing the slaves of a province of course lost sight of the great question of state rights and poured forth their sympathies for the oppressed as i arose to go i asked mr wilde if he believed in free trade in my own country i was a protectionist in a measure i believed at that time that tariff laws protected flesh and blood what do we care so much for a market if we can create a set of artisans and workers in the handicrafts who will supply all our national needs i thought that commerce should be as nothing in opposition to men but i have changed since coming to america what converted you so quickly the high prices what for instance gloves 
in new york the dealers charged me three and a half to four dollars for a pair of gloves which cost me a dollar in london you can get a very good pair for fifty cents then there is velvet which i am very fond of wearing i had a jacket made of that stuff in new york which cost me fifty dollars in london the same cost me only twenty dollars i find that tariffs do not protect flesh and blood there is free trade in labour in this country while the products of labour are supposed to be protected the result is that the manufacturers can import all the workmen they need to compete with americans while they manufacture their goods at enormous prices end of section oscar wilde the daily picayune new orleans sixteenth of june eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde a visit to the apostle of modern art the negro the indian and the sunflower his theme mr oscar wilde reached this city on friday morning and took rooms at the st charles hotel this gentleman is such a celebrity on account of the ingenious and peculiar manner in which he has been presented to the public everywhere that many persons were desirous of visiting him at the hotel and when a picayune reporter called and was shown into his presence he found several gentlemen already there mr wilde received his callers with much courtesy and sincerity and talked readily and pleasantly to all he complimented his visitors by remarking that he had encountered more that was agreeable and courteous in the manners of the southern people than at the north in chicago he found people pushing their way with a brusque sort of energy while in the south people were more quiet and polite it is always so in warm countries and may be a result of climatic effects said the apostle of modern art mr wilde said he had nothing to do with commerce and what was called progress he was a student of art he saw that in the rush and crush of business the native and characteristic and picturesqueness of people was being rapidly destroyed and he desired to do what he could to rescue from oblivion the truly artistic peculiarities that still survive one must go to asia and africa for picturesqueness in human costume and habits in america he had found it only in the indians and in the negro and he was surprised that painters and poets had paid so little attention to these matters and especially to the negro as an object of art he spoke of mr cable in terms of great praise and expressed admiration for some of his fine pictures of life and character in which the negro figures father ryan the poet also came in for favourable mention by mr wilde the poet expresses a desire to spend some time in new orleans as it has many picturesque points which he wishes to examine as mr wilde will present his peculiar views in his lecture nothing further need be said of them his personal appearance is perhaps the most striking thing about him he is very tall over six feet with a large frame his head is large features all large and fat rather than strong in expression but his face has an air of youthful almost infantile sweetness which perhaps is the real secret of mr wilde's power over the people who admire him his hair is long and straight not curling and hangs upon his shoulders in heavy masses he was dressed in a black velvet jacket grey tight-fitting pantaloons not knee breeches red silk stockings and slippers his shirt collar was loosely tied with a dark scarf his entire appearance if somewhat peculiar is not unpleasing and his manners are very agreeable and friendly scattered around him on the floor and on the sofa upon which he sat 
were a number of paper-bound yellow-covered novels in the french language from the prolific press of levy of paris while a bundle of cigarettes and a bottle of cologne water lay conveniently near mr wilde had but little to say about sunflowers save to express the hope that the crop of this artistic and aesthetic plant had not been entirely destroyed in the great inundation to which louisiana has been recently exposed other visitors coming in the reporter took his departure with pleasing recollections of the apostle of modern art end of section arrival of mr oscar wilde the times democrat new orleans seventeenth of june eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain arrival of mr oscar wilde a chat with the disciple of the aesthetic yesterday mr oscar wilde with his secretary mr j j vale and his valet arrived in the city and were at once driven to the st charles hotel where he was ushered to his apartments on the first floor in the forenoon a representative of the times democrat called upon him and was at once requested to walk up entering his little parlour the reporter found the poet enjoying the dolce far niente of a morning siesta blowing clouds of cigarette smoke in the air as he lolled on the sofa he arose and advancing in somewhat of a constrained manner welcomed his visitor in a pleasant cheery voice and after shaking hands resumed his easy position much taller than descriptions had led one to believe he appeared at first sight to be a well-framed and symmetrical large english boy good-natured frank but fonder of playing with his sisters than going into the ruder sports with the average boy at cricket or perhaps a village fight he was dressed in a neat-fitting velvet jacket a pair of tight tweed pants and above his low quarters were displayed scarlet half-hose a large crimson cravat was the most pronounced article of his dress and it caught the eye and held it perforce his hair hung down to his shoulders in heavy masses sometimes intruding on the face but a languid movement of the hand would brush it aside his face is not masculine although every feature is large the feminine seems to overshadow the coarser ruggedness and it leaves the impression that its owner could never have seen much of life's vicissitudes smooth and fair it wanted force and decision his eyes make one forget the face for there is a dreaminess and liquidity about them seldom seen in men's his manner is open frank and entirely free of affectation and as a conversationalist he is always interesting his sentences are well rounded clear and his language chaste there is little or no inflection in his voice and almost a total absence of vigour and what americans call vim during the conversation he pleasantly alluded to the fact that he had seen much more of the courtliness and grace of bearing in the south than in those places he had travelled north it was natural with the climate the manners here were better here is not so much of a battle for money as for instance say in chicago speaking of the weather he said he was delighted to be where he could enjoy these almost italian airs this was the atmosphere of art it was here that nature gave forth her most lively colours most beautiful verdure and the forests were filled with the sweetest song-birds it was nearer italy than the colder north he had felt an anxious desire to visit new orleans from what he had read of it its beautiful creoles gardens magnolias were all objects of beauty mr wilde disclaimed having anything to do with commerce or progress his mission was one purely of art 
trade and mechanics crushed out art genius and what otherwise might be naturally developed into the great was dwarfed speaking of dress he reiterated what had already been published that the only well-dressed men he had seen in america were the miners of california and the northwest their costumes were useful and at the same time picturesque but in our cities the dressing was simply dreadful he could not understand why some painter had not taken up the negro as a study there was a world of the artistic in his manners and curious habits and little negro children amused him much their little black eyes shine like the lizards and their movements while basking in the sun were curious and wondrous to the artistic eye he wanted to see our firemen in their ordinary fire dress as he thought it would be much like the miners among the things he most desired to see here was a voodoo dance he had read of them in mr cable's novel and wished he could be present at one the conversation drifted into other channels and the reporter then withdrew during the day mr wilde visited the rooms of the southern art union where he highly complimented some of the work exhibited he leaves for galveston on sunday and on his return will lecture at spanish fort he has been invited by president davis to spend a day or two with him at beauvoir on his way from here to mobile End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Daily Picayune, New Orleans, 18th of June, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, the guest of the clubs and private citizens. He restates some of his views and asks to have some mistakes in regard to them corrected on saturday afternoon a reporter called on mr oscar wilde at his apartments in the st charles hotel and was courteously received the poet was in dressing-gown and slippers he wore a dark red or claret coloured necktie tied in a loose knot and there was nothing noticeable in his costume or general appearance different from what has been before described in these columns he expressed himself much pleased with his reception in new orleans he had spent the morning with mr george w cable who had called on him and told him much of the interesting peculiarities of the traditional life and history of new orleans later in the day he had called at the residence of zarifa mrs mary ashley townsend of whose poems he spoke in praise and whose charming hospitality the poet enjoyed Mr. Wilde then accepted invitations from the Boston and Commercial Clubs, in which he had been elected to honorary membership, and where he had been treated to due hospitalities. He had likewise received a number of callers, and so his time was fully occupied. "'The Picayune has quoted me,' said Mr. Wilde, "'as taking no sort of interest in the advance and progress of civilization and commerce in contradistinction to art true i am engaged in lecturing on art while there are other persons who devote themselves to building railways and factories but there is no conflict between these pursuits on the contrary there is entire harmony between art and commercial and industrial progress the manufacturer strives to produce fabrics for human use in the various processes of life at such a rate that as many persons as possible shall have a cheap and good article we say to the manufacturer while you are making an article for the uses of men make it beautiful in doing so this need not add to the expense of the article why should not a man have the additional pleasure of drinking out of a beautiful cup or of eating from a beautiful dish or of sitting in a beautiful chair the simplest articles of use can be as well made beautiful as ugly but it is necessary that the taste of the artisan should be cultivated 
so as to enable him to work out beautiful forms. I am in full accord with the highest civilization. There is no need that civilization should make the world ugly, and true civilization does not. I spoke of a river in Canada which was defiled with sawdust from a mill. If the proprietor of the mill had been a good manager, he would have known enough to burn his sawdust for fuel, instead of polluting a river with it. In the same way, the manufacturers at Manchester, who formerly poured out the smoke from their thousands of chimneys, poisoning the atmosphere and darkening the sky, learned that they could save valuable fuel by burning their smoke, and thus a truer civilization has not only succeeded in adding to the profits of the manufacturer, or the cheapness of his fabrics, but also in purifying the atmosphere and rescuing the beauties of nature from the abominations that have polluted and disfigured them. This is my position as to art and civilization, and I would be glad if the Picayune will set me right on the subject. In America your young men are a fine, intelligent, manly set of fellows, and they have a great opportunity to work for their country, and for civilization, and for art, in a high class of handicraft and manufactures. This country affords the material for manufacturing everything the people consume. If you will attain excellence in the beauty of the products of your handwork, you will work in a sphere far more honourable and useful than to sell haberdashery wares in a dry goods shop. The Americans have too grand a destiny before them in manufacturing to neglect art, and they should have good schools of design everywhere, so that they may know how to make beautiful things, and to enjoy them after they are made. Mr. Wilde leaves for Texas this morning, and will lecture at Galveston, San Antonio, and other places. He had heard that San Antonio is a place of much picturesqueness and pleasing peculiarities, and he expects to enjoy his visit to the Lone Star State. The reporter, after promising to set him right as requested, bid the poet good evening and withdrew. End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Evening Light, San Antonio, 21st of June, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde arrived in the city this morning by the nine o'clock train, and the light was apprised of the distinguished arrival. We dispatched a local to the hotel to greet the aesthetic apostle. He found Mr. Wilde taking the world easy in his room at the Menga. He was dressed in drab velvet jacket, blue tie, white waistcoat, light drab trousers, scarlet stockings and slippers. A table covered with books, a lemonade with a stick in it, and a huge bunch of mammoth cigarettes made up the array that confronted our aesthetic reporter, for Mr. H. Ryder Taylor was the light representative who renewed an old acquaintance with Mr. Wilde. Mr. W. complained of a feeling of lassitude, which he attributed to taking a bath at Galveston. He paid a high compliment to the Galvestonians, and generally complimented the people he'd met with upon their advancement and civilization. He spoke of his devotion to art, and explained the objects of aesthetics being to give a high order of commendation to industry, and would have workmen of intelligence working for the honour of their craft, as well as for his wife. Mr. Wilde branched out upon the general topic of his mission in a very interesting manner of the Mormons. He said he never saw such an unintelligent or ugly race in any part of the States. He was treated courteously by the Mormons. He found nothing about Salt Lake City worthy of mention, except the tabernacle. The theatre was well attended. Children were innumerable, not pretty, but happy. 
he says the Mormons have no idea of art. Mr. Wilde is an Irishman by birth, son of Sir W. Wilde, and born on the 16th of October, 1856, educated at Oxford, and since his graduation has taken a place in the literary circles of England. End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Evening Light, San Antonio, 23rd of June, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. Yesterday, Mr. Oscar Wilde drove about the city and suburbs to inspect their art beauties. He was especially pleased with the St. Jose Mission, its very fine door and window, which he considered excelled anything of the kind in America, and he was charmed with the tout ensemble of the whole scene. He met Mr. Grenet, our young painter, who was there sketching, and he spoke in very complimentary terms of his genius and knowledge of that art to which he is so devoted. The Alamo interested Mr. Wilde very much, but he thought it is monstrous that such a noble and historic building should be used as it now is. Mr. Wilde expressed himself well satisfied with the excellence and accuracy of the light report of his lecture on decorative art, which he described as the best published south of Boston, and presented our local with his portrait, autographed as follows, in recognition of his friendship. H. Ryder Taylor, from his friend Oscar Wilde, San Antonio, June 82. He also expressed a very strong opinion of the unprincipled conduct of the times, in maliciously attributing to him words that he had not spoken, nor even conceived, but he was not surprised at this when he found the same paper willfully making a misrepresentation by saying that Mr. Ryder Taylor walked, without invitation, with him to the hotel, whereas both persons, by prearrangement, drove to the Menger Hotel, accompanied by Mr. J. S. Vale, his manager. Mr. Wilde was very grateful for the kindness and courtesy he has received in our city, and looks to its intelligence to bear in mind the lesson he has taught, and as far as practical, act upon them. According to his plan, Mr. Wilde left last night by the 6.30pm train for Houston, where he lectures tonight. Thence he goes to New Orleans, San Francisco, and Japan. He gives return lectures in both the last two named places, lectures and studies art in Japan, and from that place he returns to England. End of section. Louisiana Gleanings, The Lake Charles Echo, 24th of June, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Louisiana Gleanings To a reporter of the City Item, Oscar Wilde said, during the course of an interview, I am ever so much desirous of seeing your Creole women. I understand they are very beautiful. We trust the aesthetic youth's curiosity was gratified. End of section Oscar Wilde, The Daily Picayune, New Orleans, 25th of June, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde Talks of Texas Oscar Wilde Talks of Texas, where he was dubbed a colonel, and fell in love with Galveston and San Antonio. His views on the southern cause, and that of the Irish people. There are in Texas two spots which gave me infinite pleasure. These are Galveston and San Antonio. Galveston, set like a jewel in a crystal sea, was beautiful. Its fine beach, its shady avenues of oleander, and its delightful sea breezes were something to be enjoyed. It was in San Antonio, however, 
that i found more to please me in the beautiful ruins of the old spanish mission churches and convents and in the relics of spanish manners and customs impressed upon the people and the architecture of the city america is so full of youthful vigour and vitality that one sees those relics of a past age in the midst of so much that is new with a positive sensation of surprise and pleasure those old spanish churches with their picturesque remains of tower and dome and their handsome carved stonework standing amid the verdure and sunshine of a texas prairie give me a thrill of strange pleasure these were the words of oscar wilde as he stood by the window of his parlour in the st charles hotel on saturday evening on his return from a brief pilgrimage to the lone star state mr wilde was looking fresh and bright and he expressed the pleasure with which he had viewed the striking and picturesque scenery of the swamps in louisiana and texas the giant cypress trees towering above the dense jungle of undergrowth and tangled vines while long streamers of grey moss waved in the wind from the great branches which the trees thrust forth into the sky attracted the poet's attention while he had much to say of the alligators which sprawled and yawned in the sunshine on the trunks of fallen trees and on the muddy banks of the bayous and the great morasses nothing in the way of animal life however seemed to please the poet and art reformer so much as the young negroes i saw them everywhere he said happy and careless basking in the sunshine or dancing in the shade their half-naked bodies gleaming like bronze and their lithe and active movements reminding one of the lizards that were seen flashing along the banks and trunks of the trees you are in texas long enough to acquire a military title a week is quite sufficient and i have no doubt i would be justified in addressing you as colonel wilde said the reporter oh yes i am a colonel by all the rules and regulations of a texas brevet i was dubbed colonel in galveston and was fully invested with the title by the time i got to houston i shall write home to my friends of this new rank and promotion after some further conversation the reporter spoke of mr wilde's reported intention of visiting hon jefferson davis on the way from new orleans to mobile mr wilde said he had had an intense admiration for the chief of the southern confederacy he had never seen him but had followed his career with much attention his fall after such an able and gallant pleading of his own cause must necessarily arouse sympathy no matter what might be the merits of his plea the head may approve the success of the winners but the heart is sure to be with the fallen the case of the south in the civil war was to my mind much like that of ireland to-day it was a struggle for autonomy self-government for the people i do not wish to see the empire dismembered but only to see the irish people free and ireland still as a willing and integral part of the british empire to dismember a great empire in this age of vast armies and overweening ambition on the part of other nations is to consign the peoples of the broken country to weak and insignificant places in the panorama of nations but people must have freedom and autonomy before they are capable of their greatest result in the cause of progress this is my feeling about the southern people as it is about my own people the irish i look forward to much pleasure in visiting mr jefferson davis the poet had an engagement to go out for the evening and he shortly took his departure with a party of gentlemen as it was reported 
to witness some mysterious and curious ceremonies of the devotees of voodoo which were to inaugurate the recurrence of st john's night june twenty fourth mr wilde will lecture on monday night at spanish fort on the internal decoration of the home and on tuesday will depart for mobile stopping at beauvoir the residence of jefferson davis to spend a day with him end of section oscar wilde the daily picayune new orleans twenty seventh of june eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde lecture at spanish fort on home decorations practical talk from an apparently unpractical man at the close of his lecture a reporter had a few minutes conversation with the poet in which he expressed his desire to return to new orleans where he had so much enjoyed his brief stay he goes this morning to mobile and at the close of his tour in america proposes a visit to japan the art land of the east End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Atlanta Constitution, 5th of July, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, Arrival of the Great Aesthete and His Lecture. An interview with him at the Markham House yesterday, how he appears, what he says of the South and of his American tour, his lecture at Dijai's last night. When Oscar Wilde reached Atlanta yesterday from Macon, he disembarked from the train and stalked with measured tread to the Markham, flanked by his valet. When he entered the arcade of the Markham, he advanced to the radiator and came to a halt. There he posed, one hand sought the spot where his heart was supposed to be, and the other hung by his side. His head was thrown back, his long locks fell over his shoulders, and he gazed upon the frescoing in the ceiling, apparently oblivious of the curious gazes that were directed toward him. His able secretary advanced, and put his autograph upon the register, and then Mr. Wilde was shown to a room on the second floor facing to the west, kept especially for aesthetes. Mr. Wilde had scarcely had time to be dusted by his able valet, before a constitution reporter sent up his card the response was an invitation to the young man to come up at once and accordingly after a very brief lapse of time the constitution was rapping at the door of the room of the great aesthete a deep voice from the inside called come in and the reporter turned the knob and entered the room was rather narrow, and one end opened by two windows upon Lloyd Street. Almost right under the window, the coloured people were yelling and shouting in true Fourth of July style. The spectacle that met the astonished gaze of the reporter was one long to be remembered. In the farther end of the room, seated in a large rocking chair, was the great aesthete his appearance was striking in the extreme so odd he appeared his hair was long and fell about his shoulders it was parted near the middle and was rather stiff and in great abundance his face was large his lips exceedingly so and his nose prominent he would weigh evidently about one hundred and eighty pounds his dress was not the court costume which he wears while on the stage, but it deserves a special mention. His coat was a black velvet jacket. He wore a white waistcoat with grey woollen pantaloons. A monster moonlight green tie surrounded his throat. His socks were exquisite silk, and his shoes dainty gaiters. On a table near him lay a very fine cloth cloak with silk lining, on the bureau lay a large wide-brimmed hat and near it an ivory cane on a table lay a bouquet of sunflowers around the poet lecturer lay scattered several books novels and books of poetry in french the constitution was not long in making known its business mr wilde appeared to be irritated by the yelling outside and rising said oh the patriots the patriots 
let's shut down the window and shut out the noise this is the first fourth of july you ever saw in america yes what do you think of it as you see it now i don't think that anything so fine as the declaration of independence should be celebrated at all if it cannot be celebrated in a very noble manner amongst the most artistic things that any city can do is to celebrate by pageant any great eras in its history why should not the fourth of july pageant in atlanta be as fine as the mardi gras carnival in new orleans indeed a pageant is the most perfect school of art for a people it shows them what otherwise they would not have a chance of seeing noble costumes beautiful colours and sculpturesque grouping it would be quite impossible to overestimate the influence on art that any celebration of the kind would have for in an age like this where there is such a growing feeling for what is merely grotesque and consequently ignoble i think the people need to be reminded of the dignity of pure beauty amongst the many signs in europe of a growing feeling for art perhaps one of the foremost is the revival in so many cities of the beautiful pageants of the past but i am afraid that the only pageants that most american cities have a hope of seeing are the glaring processions of their travelling circuses and i feel that they deserve something very much better you have been to see mr jefferson davis lately tell me something about your visit to him he lives in a very beautiful house by the sea amid lovely trees he impressed me very much as a man of the keenest intellect and a man fairly to be a leader of men on account of a personality that is as simple as it is strong and an enthusiasm that is as fervent as it is faultless we in ireland are fighting for the principle of autonomy against empire for independence against centralization for the principles for which the south fought so it was a matter of immense interest and pleasure to me to meet the leader of such a great cause because although there may be a failure in fact in idea there is no failure possible the principles for which mr davis and the south went to war cannot suffer defeat i had read mr davis's book which is a masterpiece although to us in europe the elaborate detail of military manoeuvre is at times a little burdensome but there are passages in which he dwells on the principles of the southern confederacy that were read by us with the keenest interest and delight it is impossible not to think nobly of a country that has produced patrick henry thomas jefferson george washington and jefferson davis besides its great men i admire in the south the wonderful beauty of its vegetation i have seen no forests in europe more wonderful no flowers more exquisite in perfume or in colour it is worth while to come over here merely to see the magnolia in full blossom it should be the south the home of art in america because it possesses the most perfect surroundings and now that it is recovering from the hideous ruin of the war i have no doubt that all these beautiful arts in whose cause i will spend my youth in pleading will spring up among you the south has produced the best poet of america edgar allan poe and with all its splendid traditions it would be impossible not to believe that she will continue to perfect what she has begun so nobly the very physique of the people in the south is far finer than that in the north and a temperament infinitely more susceptible to the influences of beauty tell me something about your sunflower ideas oh yes i have some here that were sent up to me the reason that we value the sunflower so much is because it is so perfectly adapted for decorative art many flowers will merely be beautiful in colour 
without having a definite form, such as the magnolia, for instance. But this flower is best suited for decoration, because its form is definite and perfect, and of all flowers, perhaps, the sunflower is the one which art has made noblest use of. It appears constantly in the medallic and tapestry of old Europe, and is found all through Eastern art. Besides its beautiful form, the imagination of the world has surrounded it with a halo of beautiful legions as golden as the halo of its own golden rays. I have been very pleased to find, since I came to America, that the people have come to see and to appreciate its wonderful splendour far more than I think they did before, and, indeed, that is one of the noblest uses of art. It takes up some flower which the people have thought common, and shows them how beautiful it is. How do you find art in America? The feeling of art and the admiration of beauty is, I think, more general than I expected. I found a greater appreciation of art in Boston, New York, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Chicago than anywhere else. What do you think after your American tour? With regard to my American tour, I may say that nothing could be more interesting to any young man to have the opportunities that I have, and of studying the civilizations, in many cases very fine, and in many cases very incomplete, of this new world. I have found a greater feeling for art than I expected, but far less knowledge of it, a great feeling for beauty and beautiful things, but a very vague idea about how a nation could acquire them. The real question that I have found in America, standing in the way of its right artistic development, is that the ordinary handicrafts are not held in their proper honour. So many young men whom I have met in railway cars and elsewhere, young men of a great deal of brightness of intellect, being contented to select as a profession the occupation of clerks in stores and the like, which in many cases means so little more than a form of salaried idleness, and on seeing how much finer it would be for them to select a profession in which they could use their hands and really do useful and good work. When will you return to Europe? I shall not be in Europe for a year, after my tour through the South, I shall go to Canada, where I have to deliver ten more lectures. I will then return to California, a part of America which I admire enormously. We'll go from there to Japan. In Japan I intend to study the method and the education of their ordinary artisans, and to try and understand how it is that every ordinary Japanese workman has got this delicacy of hand, this feeling of beauty, and this perfectly masterful power of design, which are characteristics of their work. I am a wanderer by nature, and I hardly know when I will be in Europe. I will sail for Japan about the 15th of August. End of section Oscar Wilde on Cloaks, The Atlanta Constitution, 6th of July, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde on Cloaks Yesterday morning was as cool as September, and as Oscar Wilde boarded the Georgia Railroad train, he was enveloped in his aesthetic cloth cloak, with its figured silk lining. He also wore his broad-brimmed white hat, and as he pulled it closer down over his ears, he remarked, One of the things that I liked most in the West was the broad-brimmed hats, and cloaks, too. The cloak is the most perfect form of drapery ever invented. It never can be ungraceful. I hope, in time, to see it far more generally worn than at present. Mr. Wilde lectured in Augusta last night. End of section.
Oscar Dea, Oscar Dea, News and Courier, Charleston, 8th of July, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Dea, Oscar Dea, the original of Bunthorn appears in Charleston. Mr. Wilde's advent at the Charleston Hotel, waiting at the ladies' entrance, the gathering crowd, the aesthetic escapes by the elevator rarely has time to take a bath and brush his long hair and mix his tod when a reporter calls an amusing interview the arrival of the apostle of modern aestheticism was an event which would have been marked by something of a demonstration but for the fact that very few people knew at what hour the apostle would reach the city a few moments after one o'clock yesterday an open carriage stopped in front of the ladies' entrance to the Charleston Hotel. From this emerged first a small but good-looking American citizen, a little off-colour, then a dapper little red-whiskered man, and finally two hundred pounds avoir du poids of aesthetic human flesh and bones, done up in a mouse-coloured velveteen shooting jacket and salt-and-pepper small clothes, the head was ornamented with long ambrosial locks of very dark hair, and capped with a broad helm, dim-coloured slouch hat, something after the style of Buffalo Bill or Texas Jack. "'That's him!' cried Inglis, the barber, who had come out to see the sight, and there was a rush of the few persons who were loafing about the hotel in the direction of the show, while the storefronts in the immediate vicinity were speedily adorned with idle salesmen and drummers. The door of the ladies' entrance being locked, the two hundred pounds of aestheticism, word illegible, about on the doorstops, grim and dusty and uncomfortable, but looking all the same like a magnified photograph of, word illegible, Dunham in the role of Bunthorn. There was no mistaking his identity, the face, form, figure, attitude, and movement of the man brought Bunthorn forcefully to mind, and caused the spectators to look at once for the twenty lovesick maidens who invariably accompany that aesthetical hero. The reporter who had been sent to describe the event caught himself whistling the refrain which has of late become so popular. Oscar dear, Oscar dear, how utterly, flutterly utter you are! Oscar dear, Oscar dear, I think you are awfully wild. Ta-ta! The door being at length opened, Mr. Wilde was ushered in by an army of waiters, while his manager went around to the main entrance, followed by the crowd, and wrote upon the hotel register, Oscar Wilde and Servant of Ireland. The apostle was then hurried into the elevator, and was anon comfortably put away in room three. The interview. An hour or two afterward, the reporter sent up his card and was ushered into the awful presence of the founder of aestheticism, the apostle of decorative art, the only genuine Oscar Wilde. The off-coloured valet de chambre of Ireland stood sentry at the outer door. To his knock came in sweet accents the answer to, Come! and the reporter entered the room now rendered famous. The great aesthete was lolling upon a sofa, his ambrosial locks parted in the middle, resting upon a pillow, and his feet, ornamented with red-striped socks and sharp-pointed shoes, occupying the other end of the sofa. Mr. Wilde wore the same mouse-coloured velveteen shooting jacket which he wore on entering the hotel, and the same pepper-and-salt small clothes, but his person showed evidence of a bath, and the minor details of his costume were more attractively arranged. The ferocious Buffalo Bill slouch hat had been laid aside. From his collar there hung the ends of a salmon-coloured silk neck handkerchief, while a pale violet-coloured kerchief peeped out from the breast pocket of his coat. In front of the sofa upon which he lolled was a cane-bottomed chair, upon which stood a large tumbler filled with a liquid of some kind, and out of which protruded the end of two straws, 
which ever and anon were conveyed to the lips of the apostle sundry pieces of lemon in the tumbler suggested lemonade but the colour of the word illegible a bright yellow suggested sunflower seed tea a few moments later a gentle aroma of rum floated through the air and at that moment the reporter found himself in the hands of the great aesthete who inquired very sweetly and solicitously after his reportorial health at the same time requesting him to be seated then the business of the interview began the apostle resumed his lolling attitude on the sofa and gave himself up languidly to the task of answering the questions that were put to him mr wilde looks like an enlarged and magnified la da da young man and speaks with a don't you know yorp of the day yes he said it was a very dusty journey don't you know but the country is fine a beautiful wooded country all the way from augusta here art in the south you've seen a good deal of the southern people what do you think of their capacity for aesthetic culture well you see one can travel through a country and see so very few of the people it's awful when one realises how few people one knows in the world but upon the whole i'd rather travel through a country rapidly i like the southern people although you have let the northern people get ahead of you in art i think you are more adapted to the cultivation of art i mean decorative art you are of a warmer temperament and of a more imaginative turn of mind don't you know i should think you would turn your attention more to art you have magnificent forests beautiful flowers what you want is more diversity i saw in your paper to-day that two carloads of furniture had been bought for an infirmary here and brought all the way from chicago now why shouldn't you make that furniture here in charleston the aim of our school is to educate the people into the love of the beautiful and to apply it to practical use in the manufacture of useful articles the lily and the sunflower let me ask if you won't think the question trifling why is it that you are always pictured as posed with a sunflower or drooping over a lily certainly i'll explain with a smile and a change of posture when the few of us young men got together to organise this movement we selected the lily and the sunflower for several reasons as emblems of aestheticism in the first place the outlines of these flowers are distinct and easily reproduced for wallpapering and other proper uses now there's your beautiful and fragrant southern magnolia nothing could be more beautiful or more fragrant ah but you can't draw or paint the magnolia its outlines are not distinct don't you see and then the lily has always been associated with art in italy and the sunflower with reverence and worship in the east in japan the worship of the lily is the foundation of religion its emblem the pure white flower springing from a bed of word illegible the sunflower too is the emblem of the sun worshippers the sunflower as you know grows wild in this land and the people of charleston white and black are afflicted with the craze i saw a number of coloured women on the fourth of july parading the streets with huge sunflowers in their dresses and hats do you think this is owing to the love of the beautiful who can say to live one's life is to love the beautiful i think the people are awakening to a sense of the beautiful as you say you have lived all your life among sunflowers and never until now noticed anything beautiful in them that is the mission of true art to make us pause and look at a thing a second time at atlanta all the girls that passed the hotel wore sunflowers 
and at mobile an enterprising little boy made twenty-five dollars selling sunflowers to the people who came to my lecture that boy will be a congressman yet who knows it was a fortunate and harmless speculation for him i wish all other speculations were as harmless and as innocent this apropos of nothing it is printed in the newspapers that you're engaged to and will marry a young lady of boston it would interest the ladies of charleston and the south to hear whether this is true or not ah with a smile that you know is one of those things which must always remain a vast mystery but if a man is engaged to be married he shouldn't come to the south this with an air which suggested taffy a gentleman who was in the room here suggested that the fair sex of boston were hard to beat for beauty to which the aesthetic apostle replied that that was true but the women of the south were upon the whole much more beautiful than any that he had seen in this country their colour and features he said were richer and more regular and at this point the manager entered to bring an invitation to the apostle to visit the charleston club and the reporter seized the opportunity to take his leave and bow himself from the too awfully awful presence of the mighty aesthete end of section newport gossip the sunday herald boston twenty third of july eighteen eighty two this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newport Gossip Mr. Oscar Wilde left Newport for New York after giving a little dinner party at Hartman's, the cuisine of which found much favour with him. He was introduced to its delightful mysteries by that well-informed bon vivant, his Uncle Sam Ward, I told you in the edition of Wednesday evening last of the entertainment given in his honour on Monday by Chaplain Hayward on board the United States war vessel Minnesota, but had not space to dilate upon the lightsome play of humour which marked the young seat in the catboat that bore him and his companions to the shore at the close of the dinner. Oscar was in a frolicsome mood. A fog was falling, and the air was damp and chilly. Remarking that the texture of his white pongy silk coat was not suited to the atmosphere, I regret to say that the lecturer on the decorative arts was forced to wrap himself up in one of the stuffed cushions covered with homely checked gingham. He did this laughingly at the suggestion of the skipper of the Zippo, who was disposed to be friendly. Mr. Wilde thought that, instead of eating down below decks, we should have dined up in the shrouds somewhere, stationed upon one of those convenient platforms to which delicacies should have been hauled up by ropes. Guns should have been fired. Bring me guns. A court-martial ought to have been held, and William, all in the downs, should have parted from Susan, all in the dumps. Men who would not converse should be confined in the cockpit. In moments of ennui, we would bombard the casino, and, if perchance we sunk a boat full of journalists, par hazard, what reason for regret? Thus Oscar rattled on. Custom cannot stale his infinite variety. From this frothy badinage, he passed as swiftly to the consideration of the relative merits of the famous novelists, Alphonse Daudet and Emile Zola. Needless to say, he prefers the former, so superior in imaginative power to the gross writer who has aimed to substitute a purely scientific basis for the only true one in art beauty. Mr. Wilde does not admire the nervous, sensual family whose mixed career pervades Zola's works, but he recognises the power with which they are drawn. He prefers Pot Boule, one inexcusable chapter accepted, to Nana, for which there is no excuse. Daudet wins his undivided allegiance. He found Jack stupid, but Numa Rumastan, 
Le Nabab, and more particularly, Le Roi in Exil, delighted him. He thought Henry James Jr.'s critique on Alphonse Daudet in a recent number of the Atlantic Monthly rather weak and unsatisfying. Returning to Zola, a little-known novel of his in the earlier days of his career pleased Mr. Wilde's sense of beauty. You may remember it, the story of the boy and girl who elope after an episode of a wall and well that divide, a la Cupid and Psyche, their respective homes. One incident, that of the boy becoming angry and throwing a stone into the well which has been accustomed to mirror the faces of the lovers who have never met save as reflected in its surface, particularly pleases the poet Esthete. When the waters are thus troubled, the boy has a sudden fear that he will never see his fair neighbour's face again. However, they elope, and the tragic ending shows the young girl killed by a stray shell from a battlefield, and dying with the mute reproach of virginity in her eyes. Oscar is now reading everything he can find about Japan. With our octavo standard ones he is scarcely satisfied, and Chaplin Hayward has recommended him a capital French volume, Le Japan de nos jours and has told him he ought not to fail to see the Japanese returning home laden with camellias at a certain season of the year. Mr. Wilde thinks that Japanese young women will at least be decorative. Among other subjects he spoke of music and painting. He is always sorry when Alma Tadema, who too is decorative, attempts to paint any but purely lay figures, his men and women being mere accessories, and not human beings. He regards Madame Patty, to skip to lyric art, as a charming music box, and recalls with regret the spectacle of four thousand persons assembled at Cincinnati and listening to her singing of Home Sweet Home, a sweet ballad which ought to be reserved for the drawing-room. Mr. Wilde thinks that the lower classes in London care more for a higher order of music than the corresponding classes of Americans. In London, they are not to be caught with cheap patriotic claptrap. He prefers Nielsen to Patty, both as singer and actress, and instances her Margarita in Mephistophele as a noble achievement. You may not be surprised to learn that he apostrophizes her throat as a marble pillar. On the whole, to return to Newport from the aesthetic clouds, Mr. Wilde was very well received. He won the respect of most of those who had been prejudiced against him, thanks to a lecture more practical than purely theoretical, and in society he was a sufficient success to make his stay here agreeable. He is certainly, with all the affectations that have become second nature, a brilliant conversationalist and a most interesting individuality. As an example of his peculiarities, the following will serve. "'What will you have to drink?' asked a friend in the casino restaurant. "'Oh, some of your American drinks, full of gorgeous colouring. "'Do you mean gin fizz?' queried a sprightly foreigner in his delightful patois. No, he did not mean gin fizz, and no one could think what he did mean. At last the young lion tossed his mane impetuously and gave it a name. Well, a sherry cobbler, then. When it was brought, the comment was irresistible that there wasn't much gorgeous colouring in it. The poet regarded the amber-brown fluid pensively, shook up the ice, and said, Oh, I don't know, I don't know. A very good tone. End of section. Oscar Wilde, Brooklyn Union, 29th of July, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, who arrived in New York this morning from Long Branch, 
told a reporter that he dined with general grant last evening and was going to peekskill tonight to spend sunday with mr beecher end of section utica morning herald and daily gazette first of august eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde says he intends to visit saratoga august tenth and will lecture there then i shall go to richfield springs and probably lecture there as to my movements after that i am unable now to speak i intend to go to japan End of section. pursuing a venus the chicago daily tribune twelfth of august eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain pursuing a venus oscar wilde's story of the discovery of mrs langtry from town there are but two purely greek things now in europe says mr wilde one is the venus of milos the other mrs langtry the effect of mrs langtry's beauty is he estimates that of extreme delicacy produced by really strong lines the mouth is large the jaw is heavily outlined and yet as the pantheon while in reality a large building gives the impression of being a more delicate structure than it really is so the jersey lily's face conveys an idea of softness and grace infinitely charming no photograph can do her justice he holds for her complexion is like ivory stained with rose even millet has been comparatively unsuccessful with her portrait he can paint children and men but not a beautiful woman mr wilde considers mrs langtry the most charming of companions there is no other woman in the world with whom he would rather go to look at a picture or see a play or give a new book to it is remarkable however that she herself is entirely untouched by the feeling she inspires she is beautiful and virgin as a fountain and as cold it is a great treat to hear mr wilde describe how he and a friend an artist presumably mr frank miles discovered mrs langtry several years ago when he was still at oxford one night at the lyceum theatre oscar and his friend saw a beautiful unknown seated with a gentleman in a box they asked everyone in the house whom they knew and all the officials the name of this divinity but no one could tell them when the play was over they waited to see her get into the carriage and then rushed along the strand in a state of enthusiasm only possible in young men and artists they told everybody that they had discovered the venus of milos there in london in the flesh but no one could enlighten them concerning the incognita and mr wilde returned to oxford leaving his friend in town to prosecute the search one day he received a telegram come at once i have found the venus of milos he sought an audience with the university powers whom he much distressed by a fable as to pressing family matters in london and gaining permission took the first train to town and a hansom to chelsea entering his friend's studio he found mrs langtry there sitting for her portrait at that time she knew so few people in london that they might have been counted on her fingers but mr wilde and his friend told nations she was beautiful and interested in particular the late duchess of westminster and it was at grosvenor house that the now celebrated beauty jersey lily made what was virtually her social debut mr wilde regrets almost that mrs langtry should have decided to come to the united states to act before she is apt to be something more than merely a beautiful woman and an indifferent actress he believes that she has the making of an accomplished artist and in time will prove herself 
since she has that effectual substitute for genius, ambition. It was not singular that she should have made one of the best debuts on record, for her training as a professional beauty had been of great service to her. It was nothing new to her to know that a whole theatre full of people were fixing their lorgnettes upon her face. People who are used to being stared at are obliged to cultivate the quality of unconsciousness of self, and Mrs. Langtry had taken a long course of lessons wherever she went. Among her fine qualities is, says Mr. Wilde, a voice as musical as Sarah Bernhardt's. She possesses, moreover, rare powers of mimicry. He would like to see her play Rosalind, for she is the only woman of his acquaintance who would be apt to look like a boy in the doublet and hose, the contours of her uncorseted figure giving her advantages in this respect. At all events, he regrets that she does not create an entirely new part in which she will run no danger of comparison with anyone else, since popular criticism consists so largely of comparison. End of section. Sizing Us Up, The Sunday Herald, Boston, 20th of August, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sizing Us Up, Oscar Wilde's Opinions of America and Americans, some harsh but justifiable criticism. The poet five times in love here. From our special correspondent. Richfield Springs, New York, August 17th, 1882. I have intercepted the laureate of art and unconventionality here on his way to New York. He has grown more unconventional and conspicuous in his dress since I first met him, and the crude notions of America, which then possessed him, have been crystallised into positive opinions. He is some months older, too, and these have been eventful months to him. He says he has enjoyed every day of his lecture tour, and I have no doubt of it, for he has gained five pounds since he landed in January, and now turns the scale at a hundred and eighty-five. Yesterday it was so cool here that gentlemen wore overcoats and ladies' shawls, but the profit of beauty radiated on the piazza of the spring house in a rather too short pair of white duck pantaloons, beside which his costumes consisted of a grey scotch cutaway, well worn, a broad, soft brown hat, a long, sailor-knotted terracotta necktie over a broken cornered collar, low shoes, black socks, and white kid gloves. Nobody else in town wore any garments like unto one of these, so he was much besieged and bestared at. Yes, he said, responsive to my salutation and inquiries, I am raking in the shekels, if that is what you call it in American. I have had large audiences, have made considerable money, have had tremendous experiences of various kinds, and now I am going home. To write a book about it? Yes, certainly. I do not now think of any other Englishman who has seen America so thoroughly as I have. I have seen the splendid South in its glory, and have eaten of its savoury hoe-cake, have partaken of New England's pie and pancakes, have witnessed the wonderful growth of the Northwest, have seen the sun rise and set on your great midland ocean of grass and flowers, have camped with the miners of the Pacific Slope, and taken pot luck with the Mormons, and now I am going home. About American women? Certainly. I have not found among them very much of the highest order of beauty, an astonishing amount of prettiness, daintiness, intelligence, vivacity, personal attractiveness, but of classic beauty, not a great deal. In Europe there are only two Greek things, the Venus of Milo and Mrs. Langtry, 
and mrs langtry has the advantage of having arms and movements do i think she is the most handsome woman in the world i hesitate to say so now i said so to ruskin when i first saw her and he answered that utterance is a form of blasphemy you might as well say of a particular flower that it is the finest flower in the world and the world so full of flowers supremely beautiful the beauty of many of the prettiest american women seems to me so perishable it is the beauty of youth of life fading to-morrow but the highest form of beauty is perennial i shall write sonnets to mrs langtry when she is ninety-five that is a natural enough question of yours how does mr langtry take it he takes it philosophically perhaps he feels somehow that he is an intruder because no little boy i don't want to buy one of your sunflowers run away now and sell them to somebody else heavens the idea of picking that gorgeous flower the sunflower ought never to be picked it is splendid on the stem but preposterous in a vase or a girl's corsage that is quite like marrying a beautiful woman i have fallen into the habit of thinking that the husbands of beautiful women belong in the criminal classes they have committed sacrilege and robbery in attempting to monopolise what belongs to all mankind they are fit candidates for the penitentiary what if somebody should lock up the air and sunshine when i had first spoken to mr wilde he sat alone on the porch reading tennyson's poems which he usually carries around under his arm there was nobody near him and few seemed to notice him but now it was noised about that oscar wilde had come that this flashing object on the piazza was he and already fifty women girls and children were gathered around as if he were a wild choctaw or a polar bear or a man from the moon and groups of handsomely dressed ladies stood and gazed at him at a distance of six or eight feet evidently catching all they could of the conversation that was conducted in a low tone the most striking thing i have noticed he repeated dropping his voice another note or two and laughing is the curiosity of your people they have reduced staring to a fine art i have seen an exhibition of ill-breeding and impudence that amounts to positive barbarism i do not let it trouble me for i cultivate indifference to all such vulgarity the philosophy of life is never to be annoyed i am satisfied now that there is no affliction on earth that a man of serene temper cannot get used to in six weeks oh yes of course i have met thousands of refined and well-bred people who would be incapable of any discourtesy but these are in a great and surprising minority i cannot help thinking that good breeding is commoner in england when gladstone or any other well-known englishman appears in public he is kindly let alone neither stared at nor followed even there though there was a furore over mrs langtry and when i took her to the grosvenor gallery once she escaped from the mob with great difficulty but the people who are thus intrusive and impudent are the lower class of our people while here they seem to include the middle and nearly the upper class for instance in saratoga last week i stopped at the states and congress hall two of the best hotels which one would suppose would be patronised by cultured people while talking with judge brady there was a great crowd came around us mostly women and finding it a bore to be thus stared at i moved on into the office there they came flocking after us 
i went to the billiard-room but found no refuge there the women rushed there ladies in silks and crepes and laces with diamonds in their ears bringing their daughters with them to balk the pursuit utterly i fled to the bar-room will you believe me that they came there in ten minutes fifty or one hundred of them filling up the place almost it seemed to me a most painful and dreadful thing the bold-faced staring and half-audible comment it seemed much worse than the conduct of abandoned women why didn't i say what'll you have ladies Ah, oh, it wouldn't have done any good and all the country would have said i had insulted the ladies at saratoga there they came with a rush and there before and among them were the horse racers and gamblers of saratoga smoking drinking and talking aloud was it not a horror i was stupefied and said to myself what land is this i have come to yes as you say i do not travel under normal conditions i do not see the same average of people that others see an atmosphere of curiosity and impertinence seems to be created wherever i walk wretched me i who please for gentleness and kindliness and gracious courtesy am doomed to be the destroyer of courtesy every day and hour i who preach the importance of good manners am the very attila of good manners a group of children were looking up into his face saying here he is that's oscar wilde etc one of them stumbled over his patent leathers and another a boy of eight or ten came up boldly put a hand on the white linen thigh of the guest and said in a high rasping nasal voice give me your card if you please not now i am busy said mr wilde by and by perhaps there's a specimen american child he continued the children here are unrestrained savages i never saw handsomer children than these little americans but they are left uncivilized to grow up hoydens and blackguards such juvenile impudence exists nowhere else in the world only occasionally do i see your children pay any respect to their elders even to their parents it seems to me dreadful their audacity seems to me almost depravity it cannot help harming the rising generation yet i love children they are living flowers i think of adopting one or two when i marry that boston lady don't speak of it she is a charming lady but no such thing as marriage was ever thought of by either of us it was unspeakably cruel to set such a story afloat and cable it across the sea as they did your newspapers have been reasonably good to me but i don't like wholly they are splendid and wonderful news gatherers but they overdo it they invade every home like the goths intrude on personal rights and make private reserve impossible reverence i fear is dead in america i do not mean religious reverence that i would care less about i mean a true respect for personal liberty and dignity marry dear me no i never shall marry till i find the one lady beautiful in person and soul who will let me go into raptures over all the other lovely women who when i come home and wildly say my dear i have seen the most beautiful and charming creature in the world would encourage me and sympathize with my passion and bring my slippers and tea and say now come and tell me all about this lovely creature and you must go and see her again right away 
right away oh yes i have learned nearly all your americanisms now and have even adopted some of your most expressive slang for slang is the reservoir and fountain of language well as i was saying i have been madly in love five times since i've been here in san francisco in new orleans in kalamazoo and twice in new england and i don't know what would have become of me if my agent hadn't dragged me along much as i'd heard of the progress and rapid growth of this country it is quite startling to me and somewhat alarming too for it is plain that the amenities of life and the sweet graces which alone make existence worth having are being forgotten and despised in the rush for riches i wonder what this country especially the west will be in twenty or thirty years from now edwin booth oh yes i have seen him often and enjoyed his acting highly of course i gave a little breakfast party to him before leaving england the prince of wales was there and i wondered what he would say to mr booth as i knew he had not been to see him play and that as he is so fond of the drama the actor felt the seeming neglect shortly the prince said i would like to know mr booth so i brought mr booth over and presented him in the conversation the prince said i have not yet been to see you mr booth for my friends said your support was very bad and i felt it would be unfortunate to see you for the first time when you were poorly supported it seemed to me a most graceful speech how came i to be such a devotee of beauty i will shorten a long story coming into life and finding myself born into a world where most of the things about me were ugly and uncouth it seemed a tragedy and i wept all through boyhood at my wretched lot when i was sixteen my father sent me to florence on entering that lovely city my load of misery dropped off beauty surrounded me i recognised in it the land from which i had long been in exile then i found that art was the panacea for all ills and the love of art the secret of happiness recalled i was sent to college at the beautiful city of oxford and there i met ruskin and in him saw the man i so long sought he is possessed by the true spirit of art a coterie of us there surrounded ourselves with beautiful things as far as practicable a friend was admiring a set of blue china in my room one day when i playfully remarked that i wished i could live up to the level of it next sunday the dean preached to us on modern heathenism and quoted my remark in all seriousness as a very dreadful utterance to be the subject of a sermon by a dean made me noted at once and then punch caricatured me and gilbert and sullivan gave me the finishing touch in their grotesque and funny opera my present mission as you call it is to urge the introduction of beauty into the things of common life no i am not going home i am now going to japan where i shall spend the autumn that is a great and wonderful country the home of art the absurdity of our speaking of a people as heathen who can teach us in every form of beauty i shall return here again on my way to england mr wilde lectured here on monday night to a large house he wore his black velvet costume ruffled shirt front and lace cuffs to-day he has gone to the catskills thence to long branch and exit End of section.